Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me welcome all of you to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting of October the 24th, 2023. As we begin this morning, uh, we have, uh, we're going to have uh, an, in an invocation um, uh, by a um, pastor that has been invited by Commissioner Moore, and um, we're going to give her just a few moments. I understand that she's on the way in. Uh, but as we move forward today, after uh, we have the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, we will have our Communications Division Manager, Dr. Jeff Williamson, who will be reading uh, several different proclamations this morning. The first proclamation will be recognizing a Head Start Month. Uh, the second will be Italian Heritage Month. The third, Red Ribbon Week. And then the Week of the Family. And I had the opportunity this morning, um, before we started our meeting, to have a little bit of a ceremony with uh, representatives from the week of the family who are here. Um, we recognize the grandparent uh, of the year and the Paula, Senator Paula Hawkins uh, nominee and uh, award recipient. Uh, you will be hearing more about that in just a few moments. Uh, in that I don't see uh, Commissioner Moore at this point, uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge that Pastor uh, Gerard Moss, is, is Pastor Moss here yet? Okay. Okay, I don't see Pastor Moss. Uh, so with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to... Uh, Ask Dr. Williamson uh, if he would come forward and uh, pinch hit and provide the invocation this morning. And after uh, Dr. Williamson uh, uh, comes forward to have a, a brief uh, 
invocation, uh, I will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance at that time. All right, Dr. Williamson, if you don't mind, sir. Let's stand, please. And let us pray. Our God and our Father, we are so thankful for this another wonderful day of life that you have given to each and every one of us. The Bible says that before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting unto everlasting, thou art God. We thank you for this auspicious occasion for our mayor, for our commissioners, for these who have joined us today. May the things that we do and the things that we say be pleasing in thy sight. And when we leave here, may significant work have been done for the citizens of Orange County. And may your name be glorified when all is said and done. Forgive us of all of our sins. This is our prayer that everyone say together, Amen. 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 Unto our great nation, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And good morning, everyone. We will begin with our proclamations. And our first proclamation is for Head Start Awareness Month. Head Start Awareness Month. And the proclamation reads, whereas in 1969, Orange County government was designated as the official grantee for the Head Start program by the U.S. Health and Human Services Administration for Children and Families. And whereas since its inception, parents, friends, community partners, and volunteers have generously given support and help to advocate for Orange County Head Start, which has allowed the program to serve over 1,500 students annually through 83 classrooms on 23 sites throughout our community. And whereas Orange County Head Start, our premier early learning model, provides comprehensive services to children and support to their families with a curriculum that is research-based and aligned with the Florida Department of Early Learning Standards for children between the ages of three and five. And whereas all young children deserve a high quality early learning education, which prepares them for grade school and equips them with the tools, skills, and knowledge needed to succeed. And whereas children who receive quality early learning opportunities are more likely to graduate from high school and have higher earning potential leading to stronger and more sustainable communities. And whereas Orange County Head Start fully supports and adheres to the federal regulations to educate, train, and employ Head Start parents with 26% of employees being past Head Start parents. And whereas Orange County Head Start is an award-winning program and over the last four years has won awards on the state, regional, and national levels, including the prestigious Edward Ziegler Award for Innovation, the R.B. Puckett Award twice, as well as the Corporate Award and Parent of the Year Award two years in a row. Now, therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim October 2023 as Head Start Awareness Month in Orange County, Florida, and recognize the Orange County Head Start Division staff for their positive impact on the lives of young children done and ordered this 24th day of October 2023, signed by the mayor, and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and delivering a few brief comments is Sonia Hill. Come on up, Ms. Hill. She is the Director of Orange County Head Start. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Chambers guests. I would like to thank you for the proclamation. Head Start National Awareness Month is October, so it's so fitting. But I brought some friends with me today to say thank you. Friends, can you join me up front, please? And our friends today are visiting us from Callahan Head Start.
and Mayor Demings. Bonjour. 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 Scouty Commissioner. Passing some. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for good work. Did y'all hear that? Yeah. No. Yeah. Thank you for your good work. Thank you for your work. Now here's ours. Here's ours. Here is ours. They have a gift for you all that they made. Again, Mayor, Commissioners, Board guests, thank you for October be recognizing as Head Start Awareness Month. And thank you on behalf of Orange County Head Start, the 1,536 children and 1,481 families we serve throughout Orange County. Thank you. Let's give our head start. Thank you. Both another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. That's coming from me. Thank you, Sonia. Appreciate it. Ms. Hill, Ms. Hill, would you please come back and uh, receive the proclamation? <laughs> uh, we got that little part. Jared, if you want to grab the photo real quick. And Ben Thomas, our director.
Hang on one second, Commissioner. Commissioner uh, Scott's got to join. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Our next proclamation is for Italian Heritage Month. And the proclamation reads, Whereas over 26 million Americans of Italian descent residing in the United States make up America's seventh largest ethnic group, and whereas Italian heritage is deeply embedded in the history of the United States, and Italian Americans have made remarkable contributions to the country's development, including the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the creation of the United States Constitution. And whereas in 1989, the President of the United States and Congress designated the month of October as Italian American Heritage and Culture Month to honor the achievements and contributions of Italian immigrants and their descendants living in the United States. And whereas with more than 1.7 million Florida citizens of Italian heritage, the Florida Senate recognized October as Italian and Italian American Heritage Month in Florida in 2014. And whereas Orange County is proud to have a vibrant Italian American, Italian American community and recognizes the many achievements in the areas of science, technology, film, music, art, fashion, sports, the military, education, and other professional fields. Now, therefore, Jerry O. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim the month of October 2023 as Italian Heritage Month in Orange County, Florida, done and ordered this 24th day of October 2023, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and bringing a few brief comments is the Honorary Council of Italy, uh, Antonietta Brancaccio. Ms. Brancaccio, please come forward. Buongiorno. <laughs> this is going to be the new good morning in Orange County. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that in a world where conflict is taking over, this proclamation is evidence of unity and democracy. A big round of applause to this administration and Mayor Demings, which I want to thank personally. The Italian community is growing fast in this county and is not just uh, proved by the more and more exquisite restaurants opening in the area, <laughs> but by the, the businesses and talented people moving up here. Uh, during Coverings 2023, which is the most important trade convention here in Orange County and in the country, we had approximately 114 Italian companies importing stones and ceramics in the country, uh, featured as the third country in the United States for stones and ceramics. Um, in 2024, Colonel uh, Villadei will lead the um, space um, AX mission, um, international space, taking over from our uh, space station here in North, North Far uh, from us. And um, we have more and more students coming to the county, 600 students at UCF, more than languages, approximately 700 residents in the county, 48,000 visitors every year, thousands of uh, students for the exchange programs and leadership in soccer and golf. I would like to thank these Italians for making the contribution. But most of all, I'd like to thank this country to allow us to succeed. Thank you.
Before you go, are there any others of Italian descent that would like to be part of this photo? Anybody else? Roseanne Harrington? I know you're of Italian descent. So you want to jump into the photo? Anybody else of Italian descent? Come on up and come in the photo if you don't mind, please. I'm sure there are others. Family, family, friends. <laughs> You don't have Italian descent. There you go. Fantastic. We want you all in the photograph. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Our next proclamation is for Red Ribbon Week. Red Ribbon Week. And the proclamation reads... Whereas National Red Ribbon Campaign is the oldest and largest drug prevention campaign celebrating 38 years as a public awareness program designated to unite and mobilize entire communities to live drug free. And whereas October 23rd through the 31st of 2023 is designated as Red Ribbon Week and will be celebrated in every community across the nation to increase awareness about the negative effects of alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and the non-medical use of prescription drugs and other illicit drugs. And whereas it is imperative that the visible, unified efforts by community members continue to be practiced in order to prevent drug abuse. And whereas businesses, government, parents, law enforcement, the media, medical institutions, schools, senior citizens, senior centers, service organizations, and faith-based institutions and youth will demonstrate their commitment to a healthy, drug-free lifestyle by wearing and displaying red ribbons and promoting drug prevention and awareness during this week-long celebration. Now, therefore, Jerry L. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him, as a Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim the week of October 23rd through October 31, 2023, as Red Ribbon Week in Orange County, Florida, and encourage all county employees and residents to be kind to your mind, live drug-free, and participate in drug awareness and education activities, making a visible statement that we are strongly committed to a drug-free community. Done and ordered this 24th day of October 2023, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and delivering a few brief comments and has some presentations is Dr. Tom Hall, who is the manager of the Orange County Drug-Free Office. Dr. Hall. Good morning, Mayor Demings, Commissioners, Mr. Brooks, and Comptroller Diamond. Um, it's my pleasure to be here this morning as we recognize Red Ribbon Week in Orange County. Red Ribbon is the longest going um, prevention program in the country. And so the coalition has a long history, uh, about 24 years of supporting Red Ribbon Week. And so um, this year, we want to recognize those people in the community who are our partners. And not only our uh, coalition members, but members from um, the, the armed services, members from uh, the school board, and members from the community at large. So I'd like to start out by recognizing six schools that received a $500 uh, scholarship to sponsor Red Ribbon Week activities, not only during this week, but throughout the school year. So those schools are North, uh, North Lake Park Elementary School, Principal A Emily Archie, Killarney Elementary School, um, Principal Mark Wachowski, and Maria Aguilar, Windy Ridge K-8, through Principal Dr. Karina Chanu, and Ms. Michelle Camp, Memorial Middle School, Principal Eddie Foster, also Kimberly Powell, 
Heather Rodriguez, and Minna Baldwin. Lakeview Middle School attendees, Omar, uh, um, Amelia Donrush, and then Acceleration East High School, and that's student representative uh, Stephanie Stange. So if you could join us for a picture. I'd like to uh, recognize the young Marines, uh, the Devil Dogs. They've also been uh, engaged with our community for several years. This year, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Sergeant uh, Spiegler. She joins us today as the 2022 Young Marine of the Year at the unit battalion level for the 1st Florida Regiment of Young Marines. She's also the 2022 recipient of the Presidential Volunteer Service Award. And why don't we have her and uh, her mother uh, join us as well uh, for a picture with the mayor. Lastly, I'd like to recognize all of our coalition members. This is a 24-7, 365 day out of the year um, enterprise, and it couldn't be done without all of the volunteers, many of whom are here today. And so, first of all, I'd like for those people on the committee to stand to be recognized for your, your hard work. Okay, I guess they're standing. And then I'd like to get a group picture with all of our volunteers, our coalition members, and our staff. And last, I want to recognize Carol Burkett. She started all of this, and um, she's still with us, and, and we're thankful for her advocacy.
And our final proclamation is for Week of the Family. Week of the Family. And the proclamation reads, Whereas the multitude of families found throughout the region has a vast array of different backgrounds and experiences, making it an essential part of the cultural and social fabric of our community. And whereas Orange County recognizes strong families are at the center of strong communities and operate best when open communication, unity, and unwavering support exists. And whereas everyone has a role to play in a family's success and happiness, including neighborhood organizations, churches, businesses, nonprofit agencies, policymakers, and our families. And whereas this year's Week of the Family theme, Why Families, provides an opportunity for all of us to explore the importance and impact of families on communities and how these bonds make us stronger and will more in a more compassionate society. And whereas during the week of November 4th through November 11, 2023, Orange County residents are encouraged to recognize the importance of spending time together and strengthening the relationships that matter most. Now, therefore, Jerry O. Demings, by virtue of the authority vested in him as Orange County Mayor, does hereby proclaim the week of November 4th through November 11 as week of the family in Orange County, Florida, done and ordered this 24th day of October 2023, signed by the mayor and all six members of the Board of County Commissioners. Receiving the proclamation and delivering a few brief comments is Melanie Williams uh, for Week of, the, Week of the Family Foundation co-chairperson. Ms. Williams. Good morning, and thank you, Mayor Demons, Commissioners, Comptroller, thank you so much, guests, wonderful staff, and supporters. Um, this proclamation here this morning is very important to us because this is where we got our start. 20 years ago, Mayor Richard Crotty uh, started this organization, and we're pleased to be able to continue that legacy these past 20 years. We're here to strengthen families, to encourage one another. No matter what your family looked like, we're here to support. We Throughout the week of the family, usually in November, we have a slew of activities. We're recently renewing our commitment, getting together to put things together. So we do have a contest, a video contest that's coming up, and um, we'll give you more information on that. But like us on Facebook, <laughs> follow us, and just realize that we're all here <clears throat> because we have families, and we want to support all families. Thank you so much. All right, as you can see, we have a very vibrant, inclusive community here. So thanks to all of those who came in this morning to participate and to receive the various uh, recognitions and proclamations. But we are going to move forward at this time on our agenda. Uh, the next item on the agenda this morning is the public comment period of time. I'd like to invite comments from members of the public regarding topics of interest or concern that are within this board's authority. However, there are certain matters which are not appropriate for public discussion during this public uh, comment period. These matters include pending procurement or land use issues or concerns that should properly be brought to another board. Uh, also, we will, of course, solicit public input 
during each public hearing scheduled for this afternoon. Uh, at this time, Mr. Sorensen, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard? Mayor, we have nine speaker cards. All right, we'll begin. All right, I will uh, call each of you in groups of three. If, when I call your name, if you could line up. Um, so it'll be Cynthia Harris, Chris Matheson, and Desmond Mead. The first speaker being Cynthia Harris. You'll have two minutes. Again, Cynthia Harris. Okay. And then Chris Matheson. And then Desmond Mead. You'll each have two minutes if you could start with your name and address. Good morning. Cynthia Harris, 12 Shannon Avenue, Orlando 32811. Sexual predators, they are allowed to roam free. Some of them are in jail and some of them are under the radar. Unfortunately, Joseph Berry will not be doing jail time. Uh, yesterday, Joseph Berry is released under conditional release. As early as today, he will be residing in District 2. This is Joseph Berry. He preys on black women and children in our community. He is now a registered sexual offender who has been charged 19 times. He has attacked old women in Dollar General stores in broad daylight, attempting to rape them. He has chased children in parks attempting to molest them and assault them. I just wanted to make sure that you are aware that this is going to be our new neighbor as early as today. He's currently in the jail right now as we speak, but yesterday he was released. It's not fair to us, and I know that you can't change any laws. He's going to be at Home Sweet Homes, which is 5312 Hyde Park Avenue in District 2. He's going to be roaming free and lurking. He won't be on medication because once they give him the medication when he leaves the jail, he's free to be uncompliant. I'm afraid for my safety. He's attacked two of my neighbor's grandchildren, and it could be your child that's next. I just wanted to put it on record that this person is coming to our community as early as today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Harris, uh, for your comments and uh, duly noted. Uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker is Chris Matheson. You'll have two minutes. You can start with your name and address. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a hand out. Okay, give them to the clerk. You can go ahead and begin. Okay, so um, in your handouts, you'll see. Um, that Sir, if you could start with your name and address. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Matheson, 3501 South Westmoreland Drive, um, Orlando, Florida. So, as I spoke with um, you a couple weeks ago, I'm concerned about the safety of the children getting to and from Pine Lock Elementary School, and the majority of the children have to cross OBT. So, if you look at the third page in your handout, um, I put reconstructing a neighborhood requires connective tissue, in this case, infrastructure. The intersections are stitches holding the fabric together. The stronger the stitches, the stronger the connection. So number one, the next, that's what I talked about last time. I do have um, submissions with Public Works. They're working on that. And then number two is what I'd like to talk to you about today. That's 
on the, the west side of OBT where the majority of the students are coming to Pine Lake Elementary School and they have to cross OBT which is the most dangerous road probably in the entire country definitely in Florida from FDOT is, has told me it's the most dangerous road in their district district 5 so these 5 to 10 year old children are putting their lives at risk every day just to cross the school and by the time they get to school after they've crossed it their endorphins their adrenaline spikes so they're not ready to learn so I'm trying to find the, um, the safest passageway for them. I'm, I'm working with FDOT and Commissioner Scott's office and OBT next on the 37th Street intersection. So, and then uh, towards the end, you'll see um, we're spending $5.75 million a year on Pine Luck Elementary School. It's a failing school, um, and 100% of the students are low income. So, you know, I think it's, it, like, I feel responsible to do something about it with the time that I have. And uh, the last sheet that I think is uh, the most um, interesting is on 37th Street. If you open that up to Westmoreland Drive, then that opens up opportunities that are locked off to the kids on the west side of the street, Cayley Park, Grand Avenue Park, and Creative Village, which opens up educational, recreational, social, and job opportunities to these kids. So, um... All right. Well, thank you for your comments and your concern. I know, uh, I look to the county administrator, I know that uh, our public works uh, director has been uh, engaged with Mr. Matheson, uh, and we're looking at some of the uh, potential enhancements for pedestrian safety improvements for the children and working with uh, FDOT and the school district as well and the sheriff's office. So. Great. Yes, thank you so much. much. And I, we would encourage Ms. Madison to continue the conversation with our public works team yes. members. Yes, yes. I, I, I have been continuing conversation with them. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Desmond. Uh, the next three after Desmond is going to be Lori Bradford, Lloyd Woosley, and Bessie Wiley. All right. Mr. Mead, you're recognized at this time. Well, good morning, Mr. Mayor good morning. and Board of County Commissioners. My name is Desmond Mead. I'm the Executive Director of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. I came this morning, I actually have prepared statements, but at the end of the day, I came to make you an offer that you should not refuse. You know, from 2019 to 2022, the city of Orlando had seen a 69% increase in shootings, 55% increase in shootings resulting in injury, and a 48% increase in shootings resulting in death. Florida Rights Restoration Coalition partnered with the city of Orlando in introducing the Community Violence Intervention Program. Since we started in November of last year, it hasn't even been a year yet, but we've been able to reduce shootings by 37%, reduce shootings that resulted in injury by 31%, and reduce homicides by 9%. Now, what does it mean to you? Well, let me tell you. It hits the bottom line. I think Mr. Diamond would appreciate this. Because of our program, the county has, we have saved the county over $16.8 million that would have been spent, taxpayers' dollars that would have been spent were we not to have this program. The frustration, though, that we have uh, was exemplified recently with the shooting of the young lady and a uh, little girl where one of the individuals were killed because of a drive-by from someone that originated from Pine Hills community. While we're having success within the city limits, right, and it is great success that the county is benefiting from, our frustration is, is that, you know, these conflicts don't recognize borders. And if we're not able to institute this program within county, uh, within the parameters of the county, then we're like just trying to plug these holes with our fingers of a dam. And so I'm here this morning to really plead with you all because we have on several occasions uh, made proposals or submitted proposals uh, to this county commission, to the task force, to thank, thank you, Mr. help Mead. fund our program. I'll just ask you to wrap up. <laughs> So, at, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, Mr. Mayor and County Commissioners, what we're saying is that this is a data-driven program that has proven to work not only in the city of Orlando, but across major cities in the United States. And we will ask you to get on board so we can save lives and save taxpayers' dollars. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mead, for your comments. And 
of course, we do have programs in the county that we have uh, instituted. And uh, I think collectively as a community, many of those programs are working uh, to drive down crime. Of course, we uh, had our Citizen Safety Task Force that made various recommendations. And we are engaging with community-based organizations who are working to work with us proactively uh, to reduce crime. And we do have some processes in, here in the county about uh, how we engage, and there will be some windows of opportunity coming up here very soon. Uh, we're uh, in our new fiscal year to start at October 1. And so I would uh, encourage you and our staff to uh, reach out to you so that you know when those windows of opportunities are for us to receive uh, various proposals uh, to engage with us in the process. So it's coming up very soon. Okay. Mr. Mayor, those are great programs, but the distinction is, is that while those programs are geared to driving down crime, this is the only program that specifically I, addresses I understand, shootings. Mr. Me, uh, I'm, we're not here to debate okay. that, but uh, the Florida Restoration of Rights Coalition has the opportunity at that appointed time uh, to submit proposals uh, to, to engage with us. Okay, thank like you very any much. of those other nonprofit organizations. Thank okay. you. All right, thank you. All right, uh, next speaker, please. Next speaker, Lori Bradford. If you could start with your name and address. Hi, I'm Lori Bradford. I live at West Lake Butler Road, Windermere, Florida. Um, I live on Lake Butler. I've been an advocate for the Butler chain for the last 25 years. And um, just want to thank our commissioner, District 1, for later today. There'll be a discussion on two really important issues that we feel we can improve upon. Um, the first is aquatic um, habitat destruction. We have businesses that are advertising to come in and clear cut our shorelines. Um, it, it, it can, it, they, they bring in white sand. The entire shoreline is void of vegetation. They offer monthly maintenance and um, it, it's all over our chain. I actually called one of the businesses and talked with them at length about what they were doing and tried to inspire them of why we need our uh, shoreline vegetation for filtering and aquatic habitat and erosion and um, didn't get very far. I was told that all of their business was on the Butler chain and it was very lucrative and that people do not want their shoreline vegetation. So. Uh, we need help, and I, I look forward to that discussion later and appreciate uh, that. And um, one more quick thing, uh, the ERC, we'd like to see more uh, representation for the environment instead of self-interest. We've attended uh, meetings where uh, I came to you during when the boat dock ordinance was being revised and two boat dock builders made the motion for approval. Quite a conflict of interest in my opinion. And thankfully, you guys did not vote for what they recommended, which was much larger docks, which we did not need the shading of our lake bottom. And um, we appreciate that didn't go through. But um, I'm just asking for help from you guys today in solutions to these problems. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Lloyd Woosley. If you could start with your name and address. Good morning, Lloyd Woosley, 24 Pine Street, Windermere, Florida. I'm a retired registered professional environmental engineer, and I, as of last week, I was vice chair of the Butler Chain of Lakes Advisory Board. I want to reinforce what Commissioner uh, Wilson has brought up as important issues, not just for the Butler Chain, but all lakes within Orange County as well as the state of Florida. We're having a situation where property owners are held liable for violations of the county ordinance whenever aquatic habitat is removed illegally, not under permit. You're allowed to clean a corridor out around your dock for navigation purposes, but that doesn't mean you can eradicate the entire shoreline. Contractors are not held liable. In fact, I've talked to the regional biologists with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, and they said we leave all enforcement activities to the county. So the only responsible organization is the county, uh, Orange County and the other county governments to regulate the contractors and penalize the contractors or they're going to continue to do what homeowners want because they tell the homeowner, well, I have a, you have a permit, this is all fine. Secondly, rather I was very surprised to find out the Environmental Protection Commission 
uh, or uh, EPC, uh, is, is, ha has recently just a carte blanche approved all variances. And in investigating who is on the EPC, it's effectively an industrial advocacy group. It includes contractors and consultants that are in the business rather than a representation of the cross-section of the county. So if, 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 if you want to try to improve regulation protection of aquatic resources in, in the county, you need to ensure that the Environmental Protection Commission represents the makeup of the community and has the community interest. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker. Next speaker is going to be Bessie Wiley, and then the last three speakers are going to be um, Antonio, and then Cheryl Rogers, and then Janet Buford Johnson. Good morning. My name is Bessie Wiley. I live on 6007 Fairlawn Drive in Mike Scott's district. Hello, Mike. How are you? Been trying to get a hold of your office because we, the citizens of District 6, is concerned about this Oak Ridge Road project. It has caused more havoc than good, and you could spread the wealth somewhere else. That's $3.5 million you're spending on a project that is well overkilled. I can't get out of my community. You've obsoleted uh, left-hand turns. You're putting uh, three accesses that I once had at my community to down to one access. And now we, as uh, and within my community, can't get, hello, Mike Scott. We can't get out of our community. I'm seeing traffic that I've never seen before. I want your attention. I don't want you to give attention to anybody else, district. I want your attention. We're calling for a community meeting. We want to see you. We want you to drive on Oak Ridge. I ask you to come and drive on Oak Ridge to see how bad it is. We already know it's bad, but it's even worse now. And I thought a project's supposed to make it better. I now am spending an extra $200 a year, 40 hours a week, uh, 40 hours a year extra because of your project. Make it better. We didn't vote on you to make this worse for us. Ms. Wiley, um, some of these projects uh, predate my election. Um, my office was in contact with you, and I've been in contact with the Public Works Department, specifically that project manager, uh, when we were working to resolve your concerns. But it's not something that quick, ha can happen quickly. I apologize it's not moving as fast as you like, but rest assured I am working with our county administration to resolve well, I, your concerns. You know, just to simple say, hey, Ms. Bessie, I, I hear your concerns, I hear your complaint. I want it from you. I, I voted for you, not Michelle. I want to hear it from you. Ms. Okay. Bessie, I hear you. I'm a patient person, but I got to take time out of my day, spend extra money Sorry. to come down here to pay for parking. Now I got to pull out an extra $200 a year out of my, part of my pocketbook to pay for gas uh, just to go down a block to make a left. The reason you didn't hear from me and Michelle is there is because I was not feeling well. So I will spend some well, time with you. I hope you feel better okay? now. You look good up no, here. I'm back now. <laughs> you look real good, and I hope to hear from you soon. But, okay. Uh, we, I'm on My it, okay? My time is almost up. Thank you, punk. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wiley, uh, for your comments. We're going to move to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is going to be Antonio. I can't pronounce the last name. Uh, Antonio. No, Antonio. Uh, so then uh, Cheryl Rogers. Good morning. Cheryl Rogers, 824 Main Street, Windermere, Florida. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'm giving comment related to the lakeshore enforcement that Lloyd and Lori both spoke eloquently about. Um, I just wanted to make my two cents heard. While homeowners should continue to be fined for their role and their accountability in the illegal lakeshore activity, it's the businesses that most need to be penalized. Not just through a fine, but by forcing them to restore to the previous condition and, and importantly, to actually be forced to maintain that restored aquatic habitat. Because if they just replant it and then it dies, it does nothing. By the way, that's what the right to clean water proposes, is that restoration. Because until it costs more to do the wrong thing than it does to do the right thing, there are always going to be bad actor businesses that are going to continue to take advantage. So thank you, and I agree about the EPC should, actually they should be excluded from having 
um, industry members. I think it should be only community, and if there's a conflict of interest, it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Do we have other speakers? Mayor, the last speaker, Janet Buford Johnson, stated she did not want to speak, so that concludes our presentations. Okay. Uh, well, uh, th uh, thank you all for uh, participating during the public comment period of time. We uh, do appreciate getting feedback from our residents. Uh, we're going to move forward on our agenda now to the consent agenda item, and this item will be presented by the county administrator, Mr. Byron Brooks. Thank you, Mayor Demings. There are three items pull, uh, that we requesting to be pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, the first item is C2. It's regarding Fusion Fest funding agreement. That item uh, was being pulled at request of Commissioner Uribe and will be discussed uh, following the uh, action on the consent agenda prior to the discussion agenda. The second item uh, requesting to be pulled is item D1. It's regarding an agreement with the school board of Orange County. And that matter will be considered concurrently uh, with public hearing D5 this afternoon. And the third item is G6. It's a resolution regarding animal services. And that item is being pulled to be considered concurrently with the matter that is the subject of public hearing I-11 this afternoon. So, again, three items, C2 being pulled for discussion this morning, and items D1 and G6 will be uh, considered this afternoon concurrent with public hearings on the respective matters. And with that, Mayor, staff presents the remainder of the consent agenda for board consideration. Okay, and uh, with that, um, with the exception of the items noted by the county administrator that are being pulled uh, for either discussion uh, this morning or that will be part of this afternoon's agenda, is there a motion for approval? Move to adopt, Scott. Second, Gomez. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Scott, second by Commissioner Gomez Cordero. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. Okay, the, the director reflect that the motion passes. Five to one, um, the motion does pass. And the Commissioner uh, Wilson voted uh, no on the consent agenda. Uh, with that, um, we will now take up the item that was uh, pulled, uh, the first item pulled, which is a C2. And this is regarding the, um, the Fusion Fest. Uh, I know that there are some questions there regarding this item. Uh, Commissioner Uribe requested in a timely manner to pull this item for discussion, and so we'll have discussion this morning. I do uh, note that Mr. Terry Olson is in the audience, yes. and um, uh, Commissioner, uh, we will lead off with you, and then we'll ask Mr. Olson to perhaps respond to any questions or comments that uh, are, are derived from the discussion this morning. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have brought this issue up quite a few times, um, and it's, it's too bad that Commissioner Bonilla is out ill, but a major issue that I have with Fusion Fest, while I think this is a phenomenal event where we get to celebrate our cultures, I have repeatedly received concerns from the community and the lack of engagement because it's held in downtown, requires you to park in a garage, it's in front of the DPAC Center, and this is primarily funded by Orange County with TDT dollars. And I have asked, and I've, I've continued to say it, I think now four years, and Terry's aware of it, where I keep saying I really want to find a place where it's inclusive, where people can park, where you don't have to pay to parking, where we're inclusive to the community surrounding that downtown area, where we can be supportive. We have lots of great unincorporated Orange County property um, I've even suggested, you know, let's look at the convention center. Let's look at a different park area. And I haven't really seen, and I've also asked to help in this, but I really think that we have to make an effort to make sure this event is easy to get to, free for people to come, not have to pay $10 to park, not have to find parking, not have to find a way to come down to downtown Orlando. But, um, and I, I received an email from Mr. Olson saying, well, 
the city of Orlando will pull back some of their funding if we don't do it in the city of Orlando. That's shameful. The fact that the city will threaten to pull back funding if we don't do it in their city limits is shameful. And there are plenty of great organizations from Duke Energy, from OUC, from other organizations that I'm sure that if we approach to step up would, um, would look to help us as opposed to saying the city saying, well, if it's not in the city of Orlando, we're not giving our money. Um, we've never come and said, well, we're not going to fund this if it's not in unincorporated Orange County. Also, I've had the pleasure of um, speaking with, like, the Dr. Phillips Center, and it is tight when it gets there. We just need to have, we honestly need to take this up and look for places where people can come and park for free, can bring their families, can feel that they are included and joined while we still honor the art. But lastly, something that had really kind of taken me over was I was attending an event at the DPAC Center where the city of Orlando was presenting all great things that happened in the city of Orlando, and they took Fusion Fest as part of their events. And I think this is a phenomenal event. The first year I was elected, I walked with a flag from my heritage and was so excited. I just want this to be easier to get to. I just want it to be open to more of our community. I just want more residents to come. And then while we sit here and talk, if we did it also somewhere along the convention center, somewhere along that area where there's plenty of parking for free, uh, Mr. Tester said if we have this event out there, there will be no charge for parking. There's plenty of space. We'll have people who are visiting Central Florida get to come and actually support and join and celebrate with us. I mean, the opportunities are enormous. But to have it on a corner block in downtown Orlando, expect people to come downtown. Downtown is not the easiest place to get to. Anybody who goes to the Amway or City Lions game or anything at Camping World knows it is rough to get in, rough to get out. It is expensive. We don't have train on the weekends. We don't have an easy way to get here. And we really, I encourage my residents, I'm not saying my way is the only way, but we really should look at finding a way to make this easier for our communities to come and enjoy and rejoice and be a part of this phenomenal event that was started years ago. So I would, I would love to hear some feedback because of Sunshine. That's why I brought it here because, like I said, I, I'm a little bit of a broken record saying I want to see this out more and accessible more, but until it came up on the consent agendas, really can I, I can have a discussion. But. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Uribe, um, I, I may agree with you on some of what you said, some of it maybe not so much. Um, I do think that... Uh, the county should look at the opportunity to perhaps move the Fusion Fest around within the community. I don't know that I agree that downtown is necessarily a bad location. Uh, it has been successful over the years, uh, but there may be a time now where we can consider it, but wherever uh, it is located, it should be uh, accessible uh, to our citizens and uh, as an investment in the cultural arts uh, within our community, we want to try to make it uh, as least expensive as possible for our residents to encourage participation. And um, I, I don't, don't want anyone to perceive that this is kind of a county against the city kind of a thing. I, I, don't, I don't want it to uh, appear that way, and I don't think that's your intention. But I will ask... Uh, Mr. Olson to come forward. I know that um, he and the committee have been exploring uh, some other opportunities, and then uh, commissioners, a couple of commissioners have voiced a desire to, to speak or ask questions, but I think that it's a good time for Mr. Olson to come up and kind of talk to us a little bit about what is being done, um, because I think uh, the committee, they, they hear uh, what you're saying, and uh, um, you know, they're trying to do their best to make it a, a very good event for everyone. So, Mr. Olson. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. Certainly, we are looking at a lot of different locations, um, trying to follow advice from experienced festival producers. Um, so it's not just our intuition about that. We want it to be accessible, and eventually we're going to have to move from the Dr. Phillips Center site if they start construction. And as we grow, last year was nearly 20,000 people there. So um, 
we do have to find another site. Um, there's pluses and minuses about lots of sites, and we just continue to uh, hope we can find one that will have more pluses than minuses. Okay. Um, what are some of the sites that you may be kind of uh, looking at? Okay. There's well, I pulled the... up a list here. Um, and I, I, I want to say about the, the money we get from the city of Orlando is the downtown um, CRA money. So I think they're limited. It's not like a threat. It's just they have money for things that are within their district there. Oh, that, that's great. So we could use iDrive CRA if we go to iDrive to replace it. Fantastic. So uh, there's some opportunities here uh, for us to explore some, some other locations. and uh, But the goal is to make it convenient, too, for our residents to get to and from. Uh, and sometimes uh, central locations are, you know, work well to, to being able to ensure uh, active participation. But uh, it appears that there are number of sites that you have considered. So we, we look forward to, I think, an update there. We do have other questions, so I'm going to... I, uh, let me clarify just one thing, too. It's not TDT money that Orange County uses to fund. It's from the general fund. Okay. And so with that, uh, Commissioner Wilson, you're up first. Um, thank you so much. And I appreciate the conversation, but I think it's something that as somebody who lives in Windermere and goes to Fusion Fest, I would so fundamentally disagree with the concept that getting to the convention center is easier. I think it takes me longer to get off of Sand Lake Road into the convention center than it does <laughs> from my Winter Garden exit into downtown. But the part actually for me that would be more prohibitive of doing it at the convention center or in that high drive area is that there's no residential right now. Now, I know we're working to correct that as a board and to look for opportunities to, to put more uh, workforce housing or residential um, mixes, these mixed use. But right now, there are a number of people, and I know a number of people, who walk to Fusion Fest. Mm -hmm. And so those are those are less people driving anywhere, and those are less people that are having to park anywhere. Um, I also know people that work in some of these offices down here that park at their office and walk over. And so I think that um, though the convention center is is ours. It's I, not just the convention center. I'm looking for any option where yeah, residents can come, not okay. just convention well, center. Well, I was going to say, I think we also need to consider the artists. And this is the other part that I thought was a very informative. Um, when I heard that we were going to be talking about this, I thought, you know what, let me talk to some of my artist friends. And they feel very strongly that that sometimes when they are able to present in a, in a place that is known for its arts, that it helps them with their career. And so being a, um, a kiosk vendor somewhere that is considered more tourist, touristy versus in a arts um, venue that's considered a more local festival, for them feels more prestigious. So that was their feedback that I got. And I just want to make sure I kind of yeah. express the artist's position. And it's, that it's not one way or the other, but I also hear from Hispanic people who don't want to pay $10 to park downtown to come. And they don't it's, want to. It, there's no free parking on I Drive. I mean, it's 24 at the Hilton. Um, the convention center is free. It, it would be free. Yeah. It okay. Free. I was going to say, I've no. I mean, Mark Tester said it will be free. It's our asset. It's ours. Uh, yeah. It's already been confirmed. Okay. Like I said, I think there are. I think that to weigh the the overall who's coming from where, right, and and knowing that there are opportunities to do neighborhood even gatherings that come up to the Fusion Fest, there is no opportunity like that in that, in that. Now in the future, maybe there will be, it would be great, but I just want to kind of make sure that we're being accessible to people who don't have cars and aren't going to be parking at all, that want to walk. Yeah, and access, there's no public transit on the weekend, there's no sun rail, I mean, it's like, there's no train. So we want people who are in Taft and in South, South Orange County to be able to come and not have to wheel it all the way into downtown. Okay. Uh, I think uh, both of your points are uh, well taken. Uh, Commissioner gomez Cadero. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, hi, Terry. Thank you for being here. I follow everything that you all are saying, and I am part of the Art and Culture Advisory Board, and this is something that we, you know, take very um, seriously because, um, like Terry said, last year over 20,000 people came to the to the fest, and that will continue growing because it's amazing, right? It's a very good, like Commissioner said, it's a very good um, event. And and I agree, you know, there are people that, you know, they walk from different places just to get here and so. Uh, but like you said, um, I wanted to know if there were a list of, you know, other venues that we could do, and you, 
you know, you presented it here. And it's true, we, you said it. We have to look for another place because of all the things that are going to happen in, in the city. Well, we're looking into, you know, to put it. I don't think, Commissioner, I, I really know that um, the convention center is like an alternative, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's because since we are talking about, you know, Fusion Fest is like something unique that we can say, oh, this is part of us, you know, downtown or whatever. But um, I don't think convention center, I don't know. Well, but anyway, it, it's like she said, it's not convention center. It could be any other yeah. other place. Yeah. And um, let's see. And we uh -huh. if have other recommendations of places for us to explore. Please let us know because, uh, like I said, we want to get the mm -hmm. festival producer professionals and, and public input about this as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, Commissioner Moore. Terry, that was a perfect segue. I, I mean, they're, they're talking about distance. Obviously, convention center's a long way from district, too. So just to throw in the hopper, the Popka Amphitheater would be a great location to host. So I, I do not have the exp expertise to know if switching locations, you know, every year works out for the festival. But I think what I'm hearing is we just all love your festival and like it to be closer to our citizens. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, good morning, Terry. How are you? Hey, uh, can you tell me uh, who created this list and when was it created? Uh, it was created, uh, our steering committee tossing in names, um, uh, Jay Nail, event producer, tossing in names, um, just anywhere we, we can When get. was it created? Uh, last year. This list right here was created last year? There's new names on it since last year, but yeah. So when was it updated? Um, well, I think the most recent ones on there are from the UCF ones and our steering committee member probably about a month and a half ago um, okay. put those names on there. So I, I do concur with Commissioner Rivet as, as it relates to uh, looking at other opportunities for uh, uh, to move Fusion Fest around so that it is fusion, uh, maybe from district to district. I'm not sure what it would look like, but it certainly is a good idea to, you know, involve all aspects of Orange County knowing that there are different uh, demographics, different cultures across the district, and everyone cannot uh, travel to downtown. And so, you know, maybe creating an, a schedule that rotates and so, hey, we're going to host it in, or, or, or some version thereof, because I know you guys have that signature event that you do but you also have little small events throughout the year. And so being intentional as it relates to uh, engaging the different parts of our community. Um, looking at this list, the reason why I ask these questions is for one, uh, we have a county park with uh, someone who I went to school with and the name is misspelled. Uh, Coates is C-O-A-T-E-S, not T-S, so please get that corrected. The other thing is I'm not sure Magic Mall would be a good site for 20,000 people. That's in my district, and I know that when the Classic and other events come up, they have a challenge just even getting traffic through that area, so I would suggest that that be removed from the list. And the last part is that um, when you bring stuff to us, and this is anything in you, I just I want folks to be more intentional in their engagement and, and, and communication to my, my colleagues. I don't feel like that is always the case, and I don't think it's intentional. I think that... You know, you guys have a lot on your plate, and you're trying to balance all those things, different priorities that are given to you from the county administrator, from the mayor, and from the various community organizations that you work with. But um, I think that just being more intentional and inclusive about the things that are, are happening so that we don't feel by the wayside of sorts. Um, you know, I'm just asking for that, uh, Mayor and uh, Administrator Brooks. And the reason why I say that is, like, since I've taken office, I've seen uh, two what I call historic moments and one personal moment that I would have liked to be included in. And for me, um, just larger, I've seen what happens when um, people are intentional about communi communicating to commissioners, and I've seen when they just send an email to the district box, and that's, that's it. And so those signature things would be the employee service awards, um, the largest fire rescue graduation, and then the breast cancer thing. And so, Terry, this is not specific to you, but just looking at this list, I feel like it was thrown together. That's why I asked. And so just being more intentional uh, when it comes to my colleagues and how you craft Fusion Fest and all the other activities. You do a good job. Just look at opportunities how you can do a better job. But I do appreciate your work, and thank you. Thanks. All right, uh, Terry, um, you know, I don't want you to feel like you're getting beat up here. I know you have a whole list of 
volunteers who you've been working with, uh, I think with 20,000 people in attendance, that says that the, the event has been successful. And so kudos to the group of volunteers and others who have been working to make it a success. But the feedback you're getting this morning is that there is an opportunity here. Uh, work with the group of volunteers and get the citizen input. Uh, th those factors that need to be considered, I think that those are significant factors in order to be able to host this event. Uh, it is going to somewhat limit the viability of some locations within our county to be able to, to host it. We don't want to go backwards, per se, in terms of the participation. Uh, we want to expand it and make it even better than perhaps it has been over time. And so with that, that's going to create some constraints about where it can be located. Uh, but if not the Fusion Fest, I believe that there are still these opportunities in our community to engage uh, with our multicultural and diversities that we have as a community in ways that can fit uh, throughout the county in the various districts. And so sometimes we will have to look at uh, the sites that we have within the co county commission districts uh, to make sure that we are being intentional uh, to kind of look for some spaces, uh, engage, report back with uh, the um, committee meetings, uh, share those meeting dates and times with the commissioners. So if they want to have a staff person there and participate in that process, I think that would be a, a, a worthy uh, opportunity. So, so uh, again, uh, with this item, I see... Uh, Mr. Brooks has uh, pressed his button, and then Commissioner Wilson, Commissioner gomez Cadero, do you have comments on this item? Uh, uh, it, was a, it was a question. I just, I just wanted to make sure that we stayed on track. I know this is coming. Like, it's in a few, you know, so I want to make sure that we're, we're resolving whatever questions there are so that they can continue to plan the best event that we have here in the area, and then knowing that this is down the road, right, because you're... Admittedly, we have to look for these growth options, and we, and we that's but it's down the road. I want to make sure that there's a sense of security in the plans that we've got and the plans that are laid out so that the people who are participating in this have that, that you know, level ground. Yeah, it takes a lot of time to plan these type of events, and I don't want to demotivate those who've been working on it and uh, because they, they've spent a lot of time and effort in making these events successful over time. Uh, Commissioner Gomez Cadero, did you have something? Then I'll go yes, to Mr. Yes, I just Brooks. wanted to say um, to Terry, thank you because you always take our ideas and, you know, we discuss it. But I would suggest to add it in the next agenda um, for our next meeting so that way we can all discuss it and, you know, each other come with. With the advisory council? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Brooks. Uh, I'll seek that clarification Uribe, that we uh, had. Let, let, let me just go to the commissioners first. Commissioner, I Yeah, do, she, and I think that if... Um, I agree. There, it seems like there's just things thrown on this list. I don't know about you, but like the, I've just found out about the Apopka yeah. venue, which is gorgeous. Um, I would love to have a real call conversation about at least District 3 as opportunities. I don't know if other commissioners would want the same, but I think that like Magic Mall, it just seems like there was just things thrown on here. But I mean, a real conversation would be great. Yeah, I, I, I think what he was... He, <laughs> This wasn't a final list. This was, I think, a work in progress. Uh, this was just the advisory group had a meeting and they, he, he got some input. And he just, he's just providing this to you. Uh, yeah, you know, so so don't, don't, don't take it as if this was the only list. This, is, this was a work in progress for them. So, uh, Mr. Brooks, uh, anything else and then we'll move on. Well, I just want to clarify that. Uh, the item on the agenda was for the funding agreement to move forward 2024. Uh, and so the discussion is yes. prospective, I presume. That's what I want to clarify before we, oh, as this item. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, I think that's, that's, that is the understanding. So and with that, because the, we did have a consent item that needed board action, uh, at this point, is there a motion to so approve? Moved, well, Second. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Wilson, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Uh, 
motion is for just this item? Just this item, because we already took up the consent yeah. item. Okay. okay. Uh, so all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Okay, the motion does pass, and it is unanimous. Thank you, Terry. And uh, with that, with the overall consent agenda items, I would be remiss if I didn't also point out some things that was on the consent agenda item. On today's consent agenda there uh, was an approval of a contract to purchase 745.68 acres uh, of environmentally sensitive lands in, in East Orange County. You know, we've been intentional uh, in this regard. This is the largest acquisition of environmentally sensitive land since the board approved the $100 million funding uh, to increase our um, holdings. The preservation of this parcel will add to the existing 300,000 uh, acre publicly owned quarter of conservation areas in Orange, Seminole, Brevard, and Volusia counties. Uh, the property will assist in acquiring a lands identified uh, by the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation, as well as preserving uh, a rapidly disappearing of uh, uh, wet prairie and scrub habitat, habitats uh, within the region. Uh, the parcel will also provide water resource protection within the St. John's River Basin, and some of what we heard today was uh, concern about our various water bodies. Uh, Orange County has pre preserved now 405.1 acres, and the board has approved 24 purchase contracts since approving the $100 million uh, for the preservation of environment, environmentally sensitive lands. So uh, this is being done through our Green Place uh, initiative, and uh, the annual report uh, will be presented early next year. Uh, also included on the consent agenda was an approval of a contract with our utilities department and the Promise Network uh, to provide direct assistance to pay delinquent water bills for low-income families. The low-income household water assistance program is funded through the state's Florida Commerce uh, and is um, Florida Department of Commerce and is a federally funded uh, award by Health and Human Services. Uh, to date, the total program funding is $593,206. And so far, this program has come as a relief to 284 of our most vulnerable families. Uh, we are uh, happy to assist those pan families with uh, this uh, funding. And, and finally, a resolution uh, was approved by the board today in support of the designation of a portion of the Kirkman Road, uh, SR 435 uh, program uh, as Officer Kevin A. Valencia Memorial Highway. Uh, Officer Valencia, Valencia uh, protected the citizens of Orange County and the city of Orlando for more than three years as a member of the Orlando Police Department. Officer Valencia upheld the mission of the Orlando Police Department and, um, of course, he was uh, tragically shot and died of his injuries uh, in the line of duty in March of 2018. And so this Memorial Highway is to honor uh, Officer Valencia. And so that is a note of the items on the agenda today, uh, on, on the consent agenda. Uh, with that, uh, we're now going to move forward to our discussion agenda. And uh, we're going to start with uh, Commissioner Wilson to present a commissioner's report regarding Lakeshore Enforcement and the Environmental Protection Commission. We heard several uh, individuals uh, from the audience this morning who spoke uh, in support of strengthening uh, Lakeshore Enforcement. And so this is, uh, at this time, this is an informational item. Uh, there's not a specific action being requested today of the board uh, with this scheduled agenda item. And with that, uh, Commissioner Wilson, uh, you're recognized at this time. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, so this request actually came um, on the follow-up on the heels of some compounding concerns. Um, when we went through, and I think Commissioner Scott's the only commissioner sitting here today that wasn't here for our fertilizer update, but when we went through that process, there was a lot of investment and time put into the data that really was the basis for a more stringent fertilizer um, code. And it was alarming to me that the EPC, which was supposed to have been, you know, a, um, a body of residents that, or a body of, uh, of volunteers 
that were to help evaluate some of the things going through the environmental protection review came back in favor of an exemption for commercial applicators. And it was the first time really for me that there was a big flag, um, but there have been continued problems, I believe, with their votes not um, coinciding with the data and the science that EPD's own scientists have brought forward. Um, so that is um, part of the, the, the basis for this memo and for the ask that I have today. The other one is that residents in all over District 1, and I'm curious to hear if you all have heard from your residents about this, um, see oftentimes a legal clearing of protective vegetation. And they're, they're very savvy. The residents that are, have seen this try to do the right thing, and they want to call EPD or they do call EPD, and they're unable to get either the enforcement because it's the contractor doing it and there isn't yet a homeowner, so now there's really nobody, so it's a bank and they don't care, or there is a, um, an unwitting, unknowing, probably sometimes brand new resident to the area who has been told by a contractor that they are allowed to do this type of clearing as part of their regular lawn service, and then we wonder why our water bodies, you know, the water quality continues to degrade. And so really the, um, the ask that I have today is twofold. I wanted to find out really from you all, have you heard anything about this type of enforcement in your water bodies? I know that um, Commissioner Ribe has got, we've got a, a chain of lakes. There's been other, I think, enforcement opportunities that we're not sure of what happens. And I want to find out also um, if there's an interest here in revisiting the way that we um, respond to contractors versus homeowners. Um, if you look at the other ways that our, our county divisions protect consumers, this one just doesn't line up, right? If we have an unlicensed contractor working on a house, um, we, we address that. And we address the contractor, and the contractor is held responsible. Um, if we have a tow truck driver that's uh, acting nefariously, we, we respond to that. We have code. Here, we don't have anything that responds to a bad acting contractor. We only respond, um, and the homeowner is, you know, educated. They are, they are penalized. Then, you know, sometimes handheld, back up to compliance. Sometimes nothing happens at all. And so there's just a lot of frustration out there with the ongoing violations and the remediation of those violations. Um, so, sort of framing it that way, I know that you all saw the memo. Let me know if there's questions that you have for me about what I'm hearing from the residents in my area. Sadly, both of the big lake uh, advisory boards in my area, Big Sand Lake and the Butler Chain of Lakes, we have a really hard time even keeping really qualified volunteers on those positions. Mr. Woosley, who spoke today, has devoted an unbelievable amount of his own time and expertise and has been dismissed as... Um, a resident volunteer as opposed to somebody who actually has qualifications as a professional um, because he wasn't a paid consultant, which to me, it, it really contradicts what I think the intent was for something like the EPC or even these advisory boards. So it tells me there's something broken in that system that we're, we can't keep these volunteers that have devoted their time to protecting and making decisions. And both those entities actually even have uh, self-funding and additional um, the Windermere Navigation Board even has additional agency support, and they still are feeling very much like their hands are tied and they're unable to move forward in any of the goals that they have for protecting and restoring parts of the Butler Chain of Lakes. All right, uh, Commissioner, I, what, and you know, of course, I live in District 1. Yes. I've lived there for the last 22 years, and uh, my neighborhood is bounded by Big Sand Lake and Lake Serene. And uh, from from my perspective, uh, while while my neighbors um, don't um, often kind of weigh in on this particular issue, uh, I'm well aware that uh, within District One there are a number of neighborhoods uh, uh, and others who do have concerns. And I believe that from an enforcement perspective, there may be an opportunity uh, to take a look at. Uh, how we constitute the advisory board. Uh, that was one of the things that uh, was brought up here today. And um, 
I believe that's going to require some some research by, by staff to look at best practices. Uh, also, uh, I believe it's going to require staff to uh, do an assessment of what they're hearing uh, from in the way of complaints. And uh, we do have some staff here today. I'd, I'd like to perhaps uh, call on some of them and uh, get their input as well as, as the input of our commissioners. Um, and so we certainly can open it up for uh, conversation or, or feedback from the other commissioners. But uh, I am going to ask um, perhaps uh, our staff from uh, EPD. Um, and we have uh, uh, Tim, Karen, and Renee here today uh, who can probably help fill in the blanks for us about what they're seeing, what they're hearing. Um, and at some point after the conversation today, I believe that it would be appropriate to come back, schedule a perhaps, a, a, perhaps a workshop uh, to talk about what they find from the research and, um, and if there are some particular recommendations for improving what we are currently doing to kind of come forward with offering those recommendations to the board so that uh, collectively the board can uh, make some decisions about uh, what changes need to be made. So uh, let's hear from the commissioners first, and then I'll have staff kind of come up and fill in the blanks. Uh, Commissioner Moore? Uh, sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think the, it, it certainly would be an issue looking at, obviously, with, with uh, staff. I, I had a, a severe issue with the lake in District 2, and uh, we had all the folks together with staff, and they came together very well. It was a hydro issue and actually agreed to tax themselves with a 100% increase to address it. But the one issue that came up that I found there was a sort of a lack of information and perhaps enforcement or ability for staff to, to address was when we started about talking about the shoreline. Because this particular lake um, has beautiful beaches, and, and, and I don't think that anyone does that intentionally thinking they're going to harm a lake. So I'd be interested in looking at, you know, what we can do in terms of the educational piece to help our lake owners do a better job because I can't imagine anybody intentionally would want to destroy a lake that they spent thousands of dollars to purchase property on. So, um, and as far as the, the, the commission, some of those people that are on here are very good people that I would um, trust to make good decisions, but I'd love to hear about how we could have more citizen engagement on that board. So um, I'm open to having a follow-up uh, meeting with this board. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. <clears throat> so, Commissioner Wilson, you're correct. I have the um, Butler chain. No, that's you. I have the Lake Conway chain in my district, and my board is very spicy because they love the lake so much. Um, just going to one of those NAB board meetings is, is always interesting. And I, I do, I, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle, I think I'm with Commissioner Moore. I am concerned um, some of the violations that we have had happen, even on my lake, I'm on Lake Jessamine, has been law enforcement reporting it. So, because the public doesn't always know. So we've actually had our Orange County Sheriff's Office, when they're out doing their water, water control, report things. Um, and I do believe it, it, it kills me when I see people beach a lake. I mean, that is like bringing the sand in and actually destroying what what they have. And and it, I would, but it's a delicate situation because then you've got homeowners that are over eager that are trying to make this beautiful lakefront. But I do. We've actually had a circumstance where a contractor didn't have the proper permits, was clearing out a shoreline, and then unfortunately the resident's the one that got binged. So there's got to be like. I would love, but EPD, they do the best. I mean, my, my NAB board folks are so intentional and really try to work on this. I just don't want it to seem like everything's horrible, but could we find ways to protect our water, to make sure that we're protecting and, and keeping those weeds that are so instrumental? Because right now, when, I, when we have NAB board meetings, the discussion is how it's growing in the water, how do we get through? You know, there's so many levels of this. It's not just like black and white, but... But, yeah, I, I would like to have a further discussion and probably have more, and can more I engagement you, on that. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? So part of what we've noticed out in, on the west side, the, the contractors that do the lakeshore clearing, if you will, they're just very bold, and they're not, they do not go through the permitting process for lakeshore clearing. It's not, we're not talking about invasives. We're talking about whatever's there for beach. 
And so they, they are, to some extent, a little bit predatory. They put the signs out in front of your neighborhood. Somebody moves in. They, it drives by, and it says, you know, create your beachfront. The picture that I actually put in your handout, mm -hmm. this was from their website because they so proudly were like, look, we can clear out all of this vegetation for you. But these are all protected things. And so I think, you know, knowing that right now the code, the way it's written, doesn't allow EPD to enforce through the contractor, all we have is education, right? So I do think that they try to do the education piece, but oftentimes by the time we get there, it's happened. It's done, right? We've torn out now 20 years worth of um, potential filtering shoreline plantings. And so it's really hard for the, these um, NAV boards and, and advisory boards that are trying to work on quality to ever get there when they can't wrap their hands around how to even force your basic shoreline p protections. And yeah. we just, there's no teeth in it right now when it comes to the contractors. And we, every other, I think, avenue we have where there's a nefarious acting contractor, there's the, the department has some teeth. And I just am not sure, and, we, and I you know, want to hear from EPD on this, but I think you know, it ends up also pitting neighbor versus neighbor. And this happened in my neighborhood where you know, the person who reported really wanted to do the right thing. And because there was no actual enforcement, they, they, you know, the, the, the offending homeowner um, got a notice. They were um, told they needed to get back into compliance, but the contractor was never addressed. And so now these two actors believe it's each other. And so to me, it, it puts us in a really bad position that neighbors versus neighbors where it's, you know, if, it wouldn't be the case if it was a home contractor. If you knew about an unlicensed home Correct. contractor working on your neighbor's home Piano and you reported it. that, our code supports you in reporting that and making sure the enforcement part of this then is turned over to the, the county and, and the enforcement body within the department. So you know, just aligning ourselves with that and being able to enforce what's in the code um, because those shoreline plantings are protected. So, so I, Commissioner Wilson, you asked for yep. some input from oh, the board, and you kind of no, jump back in. So let, let's, no, if, 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 if we can, if we, if, if we can just allow the other, other commissioners yeah, I mean, to I, I would be open in. to that because it's one case where law enforcement actually did it. The home resident got pinged, and they didn't know. That's it. So I, I would be open to seeing, giving some teeth behind EPD and the county to be able to do something. All right, uh, Commissioner gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. That's why I wanted to ask if any of these um, property owners have been fined, you know, for what they have done. They have? Okay. They're the ones right now that are considered in violation, not the contractor. Oh. Well, and you don't, in, many, in some cases, you don't really know whether the contractor is carrying out what they believe to be the wishes of the homeowner or, or who's really at fault there. But I think that. The, that requires some type of investigation. Uh, at, at this point, Ken, let's, let's have staff come up at this point because this is the space that they work within on a day-to-day -day basis, and let, let's ask them to kind of fill in the blanks for us and let us not fill in the blanks ourselves. So I want to get accurate information. All right. Good, mor good morning, All right. Mayor, Commissioners, Renee morning. Parker, EPD. We have prepared, prepared a few slides to facilitate discussion and probably fill in some gaps or holes. We'll have Tim Hull first present to you about Lakeshore Protection Permitting and a little bit about our enforcement process. And then the next follow-up slides will be about the EPC Commission makeup and their roles and responsibilities. All right. Mr. Hull. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm going to just give you an a overview of our uh, Lakeshore Vegetation Ordinance Enforcement Program uh, to give you a little bit of background. Uh, so the Lakeshore Protection Regulations are found in Chapter 15, Article 7. Uh, as we heard mention of this morning, there is a vegetation-free access corridor that is allowed, which has to be either 30 feet or 20 percent of the total shoreline length, whichever is greater. And you don't need a permit to do that. Um, that does not include any of the shoreline wetlands above the normal high water elevation of, that defines the limits of the lake. So. If there's a conservation easement of wetlands above that normal high water elevation, the LSP permit um, does, doesn't apply to that. We have a different kind of permit if people want to um, work in that area. Um, 
the LSP permits is required to remove any vegetation outside that access corridor. However, it authorizes removal of only nuisance and invasive exotic vegetation. Replanting of beneficial native plants is required to meet an 80% aerial coverage uh, requirement. And then um, just so you know the kind of volume, we, we do have a very robust enforcement program and EPD responds to and addresses 100 to 125 lakeshore protection violation cases per year, which represents approximately 35% of our caseload of a total of 300 plus general natural resource environmental violation cases per year. Uh, so how does the process work when somebody sees a clearing going on out there? Uh, EPD responds via complaints, and that can be done via phone call or email. The complaints entered into our enforcement system database, and a preliminary inspector goes out, conduct a site inspection, uh, verify that what was reported is actually out there, take some initial pictures. Uh, that's, that's just, uh, that may not be a, a lakeshore wetland type specialist, it's just somebody to go and document site conditions really. However, then the complaint is verified um, through our EPNC enforcement team who reviews those photos. They look at aerial uh, maps and aerial photos. They look up uh, the site in our database and see if there's any permitting history to uh, get an idea of this. It, is there an actual violation here? Sometimes the LSP permit is being implemented and people notice that and call in uh, to complain, but it, it may be an authorized activity that is not yet uh, reached the replanting phase. Um, so once that, in, that, that review is, is finished, uh, we send letters. Sometimes it's a notice of noncompliance, uh, which is oftentimes somebody has a permit, but maybe they didn't replant. And so we're reminding them, hey, you have a permit. It requires replanting. Um, that's more of a you know, warning letter to com come into compliance with the conditions of your permit. Um, but sometimes if there's no permit on file, um, we just go straight to a notice of violation, uh, and that depends on the extent of environmental harm, any uh, previous compliance history, and prior knowledge of county codes. Um, we, we send the NONC or the NOV letters um, to the property owner because of the way the code enforcement process works. It's not necessarily that our hands are tied uh, by something in the code. It's just that if, you, if we need to put a lien on the property because they won't come into compliance, the way to do that is through the parcel, um, and so obviously through the property owner. Um, so the project manager or case manager works with the property owner and their contractor oftentimes um, very closely to bring the property back into compliance. Um, if they're unwilling to bring it into compliance, we do schedule it for the Orange County Special Magistrate and we obtain an order um, which can include a fine and um, a lien, as I mentioned. So uh, we've talked about education uh, and outreach this morning. So what, what are we doing um, to try and educate people? We're developing a, a new web page called Living Lakeshores um, that's going to um, talk all about the benefits of having a uh, planted shoreline and the habitat that that can provide. Uh, there is annual training done for the patrols on Lake Butler, Conway, and Lake Jessamine Marine Patrol um, to uh, educate the officers about identifying potential uh, environmental violations. We do a quarterly mailing of um, this fantastic guide called the Lakefront Homeowner's Guide. Um, it's uh, dozens of, of full color pages um, showing homeowners the, the benefits of having that uh, lushly planted shoreline, talks about the kinds of plants they can add, talks about our lakeshore protection uh, permit and our lakeshore regulations. And uh, we, we get a mailing list every quarter of all new uh, residents that have bought lakefront property. So maybe they come from somewhere and they don't know anything about what they can do down there at the lakefront. We catch them every quarter and send them, send them this guide informing them what they can do. Uh, also, that, uh, that guide, we have a hyperlink in every permit, and not just lakeshore permit, but every wetland impact permit or um, wetland determination permit, every seawall permit. 
Every permit that we send out related to natural resources has a hyperlink uh, to that guide, and we also provide it in those non-compliance letters that I mentioned. Additionally, we offer um, once a year uh, LSP contractor training class, and this is um, a virtual is how we've done it in the past. Uh, we send out an invite, uh, calendar invite to attend the class. We conduct this virtual training, which is over 100 slides. Uh, and at the end, they can um, get onto our list of preferred contractors. Uh, secondly, the LSP application was updated last year. Uh, it previously just required that a homeowner sign, basically just saying, I understand I'm applying for a permit. But now we added a section that outlines the, the requirements and limitations of the permit. So we just expanded um, the application so that they can see a little understand a little bit more and sign that they do understand the regulations. And then lastly, the notices of violation and other letters can be addressed to both the contractor and property owner so that the contractor is also aware of the problem. Uh, some things that we have uh, completed in working on this. In August, we sent an educational letter about our code requirements to all the contractors that are known to provide lakeshore clearing services. So. We searched our database for all of the LSP um, permit uh, contractors that pulled a permit and sent them this educational letter reminding them of the regulations. Uh, um, this month, earlier this month, we um, completed a postcard that we sent out to all lakefront homeowners, um, again, telling them about the benefits of a vegetated shoreline and the code requirements. And then earlier this year, uh, we modified the enforcement letter process to uh, send a copy of the notices of violation to the contractor. Uh, so that concludes the section on lake shores, and I think Renee Parker is going to come back up uh, at your pleasure, Mayor, and she can talk about the Environmental Protection Commission. Yeah, I think that's been part of the, the conversation at this point is the advisory uh, commission and, and the work and the makeup. So, uh, if Ms. Parker, if you don't mind coming up and just uh, talking about um, what we're doing with that at this point. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, currently, um, the Environmental Protection Commission was created by a special act under the Florida legislature. Um, under Chapter 67-1830, House Bill 1031, and it's been in effective uh, since May 19th in 1984. Currently, our Environmental Protection Commission is made up of a seven-member advisory board, which is established under our current Chapter 15-30. Our MMRB makes a re recommendation for those applicants seeking to serve on our board uh, for approval of those members. They're appointed by you, um, the board. And the composition, I, I highlighted these things in yellow so you can kind of understand the, the seven-member makeup. Um, is there, we have a representative who's a professional engineer, a representative for agricultural interests. We have two representatives of private businesses or municipalities, a representative of a recognized environmental or conservation organization, a representative who is an environmental specialist, and then a citizen representative, representative of the interests and points of view of the general public. And make sure. Miles, thank you. Um, here are the duties of the uh, Environmental Protection Commission. I highlighted uh, things in yellow to call your attention to those. They uh, recommend revisions and amendments for rules and regulation. They provide for the effective and continuing protection of the environmental quality of our air, water, and land in the county. They provide for recommendations for the appropriate fees for the services rendered by the county. They also hold public hearings on any appeals of staff decisions regarding environmental permits and submit their recommendation on those applications to the Board of County Commissioners. And then they also make recommendations regarding the improvements to the natural resources and environmental issues. Miles, if you could, thank you. Currently, here are the seven members that are serving on the EPC membership and their representation role that they're serving. And then we did provide a, a column for their employment information. Many of these do have businesses that engage in board activities regarding our code and then uh, present to you recommendations for approval. 
And that concludes our, our information. Okay. Um, and, you know, part of what we heard this morning was um, some interest in maybe expanding uh, the members to include additional, I'm going to say, um, citizens who are not uh, representatives of professional types of categories, but they're uh, average citizens. And so certainly we can do some research on what that might look like and uh, at whenever we bring this back before the board for a work session, uh, you can report back on what you find out uh, about that. And uh, I think we should get some feedback from the advisory commission that is uh, working at this point. Perhaps in one of they meet their meetings, they can give some feedback about what they think about the membership and the size of the group uh, and if there are any um, implications, uh, unintended consequences if it is expanded uh, by whatever that number may be. And uh, then that can be part of that, that future board discussion. Okay. And anything else from the staff side at this point? Okay. If not, uh, we have commissioners who uh, have uh, Express a desire to speak, uh, ask questions. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Bonilla. No, thank you. Um, I was paying attention on YouTube. <laughs> Just to, I was watching. Um, what really interests me about this discussion is not only the lakes and the contractors who are doing that work, but overall contractors that people hire. Um, I see a lot of issues with residents. Um, for instance, I'll give like an, an example, like an air conditioning unit. I don't know if a lot of people know that one, if you replace your whole air conditioning unit, you're supposed to get a permit with the county, um, which, you know, I'm sure not too many people know because you think a permit is for something outside of your building, not something that's inside, but you do. And so if you're going shopping around for um, someone to repair your air conditioning unit, you're going to look at the prices, right? And they're all going to give you these different quotes. You're going to go with the best one, the best one with the best reviews and stuff like that. So you pick that one. They come. They change your air conditioning unit out, and, you know, you're all done. Then you find out you're supposed to get a permit. They never pulled the permit because you check. Well, they charge you the same price as anybody else would have charged you. Was that price supposed to also include the price of the permit that they didn't get? Did they then pocket that money? So... You know, but now you're in trouble for it, not the contractor. And so this is an issue that is not just for these lakes, but it's also for many other things. And I don't think it's fair that the residents who are hiring these contractors are the ones that are being fined and held responsible when they don't know. But the contractors do know. They know that they're supposed to get permits for these things, and they're not being held accountable. They're scamming, basically, these residents. And the residents are the ones footing the bill for it after they had paid them to do the work and pull the permits and do everything they're supposed to be doing. So I definitely want to expand this conversation into more than just these lakes, you know, the work that these contractors are doing on the lakes to contractors in general, and why aren't they being held responsible for not doing the work the way they're supposed to be doing and, and know, how, know that they're supposed to be doing it a certain way, and they're not educating the residents and they're scamming them. So I think our residents need to be protected. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I think that um, it might be prudent to, to do two things. One, look at um, how, the, how we can educate the contractor and or homeowner in the process. I know sometimes uh, homeowners or property owners will rely on the contractor's judgment, and so – creating a, a, I don't know if it's attestation, attestation, attestation form or some type of uh, mechanism that kind of protects the homeowner so that if there is an issue that falls back on the contractor because they have certified, hey, we've educated the homeowner, whatever that may be, I just don't know what that looks like. I'm curious, the makeup of this board, uh, how long are the terms that they serve? They serve for two years. And so in those two years, are they able to renew? Do they have term limits or can somebody come up? 
Cheryl, or, okay. Georgiana Holmes from the County Attorney's Office. Morning, they can be Georgiana. reappointed. Thank you. Say again? They can be reappointed by MMRB. That, that would come to, to, the, to this board on so consent agenda. So they can agenda. be reappointed by MMRB, and they can serve without term limit um, on this board. Do we know how long these individuals have served? Uh, I don't know the current makeup of the board now. Yeah, you said reappointed the, the by the years. Board of County Commissioners. Reappointed by the Board of County not, Commissioners. Not. They go through the MMRB process. So but, I mean, in essence, we recommend, uh, we, we usually adopt, more often than not, the recommendations from the MMRB. It's not like we have any direct involvement um, in terms of those applications other than telling someone to apply. Um, um, actually, before that appointment, uh, uh, for if it comes from the respective commission district, you're notified. Yeah, yeah if it comes and from the district. But, I mean, I don't right have way. a lot the, of leaks. They, these individuals are appointed by the Board of County Commissioners. But I'm saying the process by which the, the vetting process. But that's where the MMRB through um, Cheryl Gillespie's office, they reach out to you. They right. ask you. Um, they tell you uh, who's serving. They tell you to make up. They ask you uh, if you have someone else that you want to serve in that process. Do you want to reappoint the, the person that was appointed before? Mayor. And Mayor. that's that's where you are engaged in that process. Mayor, can I respond really quickly for EPC? Because it. I, I think the issue isn't necessarily the term limits. I think the issue has been the way we define a conflict of interest is whether or not the individual voting has a personal gain, right, putting money in their own pocket. Um, there's not a requirement to state a conflict of interest if it's your industry, right? I, I'm a dock builder. I'm a, I don't know, whatever, fertilizer applicant, whatever it is. If it's not a contract through me, then I am not in conflict of interest, even though I know my entire industry will benefit from this vote. And like I said, I think the, the first alarms were raised when it was really contradictory to what staff reports and Dr. Katz's reports were. And then you look at the makeup. I think this can be resolved, not necessarily by, I mean, I don't, we can talk about term limits, that's what we want to talk about, but I think it can be resolved by making sure there's a diversity of interests on the board, right? Right now, by design, they are people who are industry representatives. And so not having a, enough of our actual lakefront residents who are qualified as somebody who's seen this or, you know, Florida Native Plant Society or a, some kind of a balance, right? Because I understand that when my first swing at trying to resolve this, I heard from, I heard from staff and administration, well, we kind of want some people who, who understand the mechanics of making a dock mm -hmm. to sit there to look at these plants, right? They, we kind of want some technical expertise. But there is no balance between the, that type of industry representative and their interest, financial interest, and the interests of the shoreline. Okay. And that's, I think, where we're missing. Thank you, Commissioner and Mayor, for the clarification. I have no further comments. Okay. Uh, and just, just as a reminder to commissioners, we do have three other discussion agenda items this morning. So just trying to help us manage the time, these presentations. This event, this, this um agenda item we're not looking to resolve everything today this is this needs to come back we need to have uh, some research done and bring it back and then we can get further down the road so i don't want you to feel like we got to come up with all the answers today and make uh, make this work now was, we, we're not there yet uh commissioner uribe yeah i um with staff i think we absolutely need to find a way to be enforceful um it you know, a lot of residents, like I mentioned earlier, do not know that there is a process. I, I do want to, first I want to say, though, when you, when you guys mail information to, the par, to Lakefront, it's great information to us, us who read it as homeowners on there. But when you've got someone particularly moving in, you've got people who aren't getting this mail, they do trust a contractor. And the contractor basically is to say, oh, well, I got paid, I'm done, that's on you, and it's absolutely wrong. I think we absolutely need to go after... Um, the contractors and need to give you guys the teeth and the ability to do that because it is not, I'm sorry, I don't feel that it's good enough on code enforcement because what happens is even to get into compliance, a lot of them don't even know what to do to get in compliance. So they have to, you know, re reestablish, put some more down, you know, those kind of things. And, and I think that can get pretty tricky. And, and I would actually challenge the county because anybody who watches any investigative report for people getting their, um, 
you know, getting, um, what is it, their ventilations clean to getting AC repairs to getting solar. We're constantly seeing residents in Orange County who do not know and are being stuck holding the bill, and the only option is to go to the, to the Better Business Bureau. And I would love to see the county have more teeth and more ability to really get the contractor because it's time. And, okay. and this is a perfect example of when we need to go after and back you guys up to get that done. Okay. Commissioner gomez Cadero. Thank you, Mayor. My question is for the staff, and it's very quick. Is there any um, chemical treatment or chemical being used when these beach um, fronts are being bailed or reconstruct? Do anybody know? Yes, they do. They do? They, well, the reports I get from my residents. Oh, and Commissioner we <laughs> Wilson. Let, me, uh, let, let the staff respond if you don't mind, and that uh, way we can, we, can, we can stay on task. Yeah. Okay. That's, a, that's a great question, Commissioner, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, er, uh, herbicide designed for use in, in waterways is a permissible way to uh, treat nuisance exotic plants or clear an access corridor. They do have to follow the um, label directions, uh, and FDAX is the regulatory uh, agency that, that, that regulates herbicide application. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And uh, final comments, Commissioner Wilson, and then we got to um, move on. I just on. want to make sure that we're kind of walking out of here clear because I know that there's been a level of frustration. Um, it sounds like there's consensus that we definitely need to look at opportunities because I think right now just sending a notice to the contractor and letting them move on and take more money in and continue to act, uh, there's consensus that we're going to do something to address that and bring it back for a work session. Yes. Okay. And then for EPC, I know that the MMRB did bring this up and they were willing to address adding. Do we need to bring that portion back? Because if we can act sooner rather than later about getting more appointees to EPC to balance that, that I think would be a better use of our time. Um, but I want to make sure that I understand how MMRB evaluated my memo. And uh, we'll go to the county administrator. Um, Actually, I was going to ask Cheryl, so the MMRB has made a recommendation. I think that recommendation then comes to the Board of County Commissioners. Well, the recommendation is oh, uh, Cheryl, if you're going to speak, go to the mic, please. Um, the, the composition of the EPC is embedded in the Orange County Code. It's part of the chapter that is, in, is part of that. So in order for the, it to be changed, it would have to have a public hearing. Okay. It, it's part of the ordinance itself. So it should come back as part of all so of the So can we change. skip the work session on that and come back to look at an ordinance that updates that, knowing that that, is, that can be bifurcated from the issue of enforcement? I, I don't know if we have consensus on, on doing that, but uh, I think staff still needs to do some, some research and best practices that's out there. Uh, if that makes sense. No. So there's two issues, right? So I understand we need more information on how we can operate a better enforcement arm when it comes to these contractors and for the shoreline clearing. Right? That's an issue that I understand a work session is needed for. If there has been a presentation about the sort of narrow scope that we've had from EPC and the MRRB has already recommended the potential addition. Why wouldn't we just be able to bring back a public hearing to update the makeup of EPC? Good. What I'll just note is typically your process has been, your, your practice, I'll put it that way, has been to do a work session before a public hearing, before an ordinance is brought forward so that the ordinances board, again, your practice more so than actual uh, uh, requirements has been to see in a work session, see the changes to the ordinance before it's, uh, it's advertised and then the public hearing is scheduled. That's been a typical practice uh, of this board. Which I, I would always agree with because I think the process is important except for that this really operated to be a little bit like a work session. We had information from EPD and uh, we had... I don't agree with that, Commissioner Wilson. Okay. I think this is just a conversation of, of, of you know, this was a commissioner's report. Okay. Okay. We're, we're not okay. where you are trying to get to, in my opinion. I think 
We should follow the processes, the steps to ensure that we have adequate notice given to the public so they can come in, give their input. Well, no, that's uh, a public hearing, absolutely. And, no, I, and, I agree with that, just adding. But even to get to the point where we are moving forward with the public hearing, okay. I, I think we do have to be intentional about being inclusive, or not to rush it. Uh, without adequate deliberation. Uh, I think the county attorney's office... With all due respect, my memo came out. I literally wrote e e EPD on this in January. So it took me long this long to get here, which well, means that coming back, this could be three, four years from now. Uh, it's not going to be that long. But, but, Commissioner, as you well know, there's a lot coming before our board. and uh, There is, just adding layers it, it, for no good reason. It's just, but that's the process. That's what we have historically done. So I think we follow our processes. We don't make this stuff up, uh, you know, as we go. Let's just follow our established processes. It's there in place to keep us uh, informed and keep the public informed. And then we do our due diligence. I'm committed to transparency and informing the public. Those are different issues, okay. right? All right. So okay. I, listen, <laughs> I mean, don't, we're, don't we're debating to something at this point that doesn't need to be debated. Yeah. But at, at this point, uh, I will entrust the uh, county administrator to kind of look at the schedule, uh, working into the, uh, what we need to do. You've heard the feedback at this point, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. With that, uh, thank you all. We're going to move forward so we can, can get through uh, the remainder of the discussion agenda this morning. Uh, so with, with that, we're going to move forward at this time. Uh, I'm the county administrator. Uh, we're going to have Mr. Olson come forward regarding the cultural uh, affairs advisory council's funding recommendations uh, for FY 2024. And with that, Mr. Olson, you're recognized. Good morning. Um, hopefully good news for you today with this uh, report. But uh, a reminder, the Arts and Culture Affairs Advisory Council mission of our office is to elevate Central Florida's arts and culture to that befitting a world-class community. We've got a great uh, advisory council, as um, Commissioner Gomez Cordero mentioned. She serves on that now. But we have a number of people who um, take it very seriously to look at how we can meet our mission and also stay within the guidelines of the tourist development tax resolutions uh, that the state has passed and which is the major funding. Um, we do a number of funding programs, both from General Fund and TDT. Today I'll be talking about the cultural tourism, which I always come at this time of year with the specific recommendations, and a new supplemental program that we've piloted this year that I want to tell you about. Um, things have grown since 2002 when we first started this. We funded four groups with half a million dollars. This year we are recommending 40 applications, which is six more than we've ever had, and uh, it's a little over $4 million total. Most of that is the cultural tourism funding, and then 162566 is but this collaborative supplement that I will tell you about. How we come to the recommendations, the groups that apply for the cultural tourism funding uh, are reviewed by the Cultural Tourism Review Panel, which is basically our Arts and Culture Advisory Council, uh, minus the commissioner who will get to vote on a couple other times. It goes to the full advisory council and then comes to you uh, today. And there are a number of points that are considered in that as a hundred score, but we look at the identity, quality, the tourism, and the implementation to come up with the list of who is eligible and uh, the ranking to make sure we've got enough money to fund them all. The collaborative supplement is very similar. There is a collaborative supplement review panel that is composed of members of our sustainability committee and our DEI committee. And they look at basically four applications this year. Again, this is the first year pilot program. They looked at collaborations. Our large organizations that are receiving cultural tourism funding have shown that they're eligible for the tourist development tax. A lot of our smaller emerging and minority-led organizations can't meet those requirements. But we've set this program up so that if they do a significant collaboration, so it's not just hiring somebody, 
to say I've got somebody and I'll check off the list, but there's a collaboration happening with a partner from an underserved community and the point of their collaboration is to motivate action related to sustainability, either environmental, social, economic, then they qualify for this um, supplemental funding. So um, of these 40 groups, uh, you'll notice there's, I've highlighted the ones that are new, and um, I'm not going to go through each one individually, but uh, you have that in front of you, all the, the list of them. And <clears throat> there's 11 collaborative, uh, 16 collaborative members in 11 collaborations, and those on the left are the organizations, the smaller groups that are going to be part of this supplemental funding. And this total represents uh, an economic impact of almost $95 million. The return on our investment is $24 for every dollar we're investing in these projects. The projected attendance at the things that are being proposed is uh, w almost $1.8 million. Uh, almost half a million of those will be tourists. And certainly with this, our arts groups gain in awareness for Orange County as a cultural destination and regional national and international media. There were 41 applications, 40 are being brought forward today, and 16 collaborators. Um, so 56 total organizations uh, getting funding today. Six of them are brand new to this process. We've not funded six of the large ones, more of the small ones. Uh, 11 of the organizations are led by people of color. Seven of the organizations have missions specifically related to African-American, Hispanic, or Asian culture. Um, and the project's budgets, the ones that they're spending, in addition to our funds, uh, is a little over $43 million. Again, our investment, just a little over $4 million. And I hope you all will be able to attend on November 8th when we... Um, do big checks uh, presentations to those 40 organizations. So on behalf of all these organizations that are listed here, um, we uh, request the approval of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Council's funding recommendations for the cultural tourism for 2024. Um, and Terry, uh, thank you uh, for the presentation. I do receive quite a bit of feedback from um, a multitude of our uh, cultural organizations throughout the county, uh, appreciative of the additional funding. Uh, as you indicated, um, this is the greatest amount of funding that uh, has ever been uh, committed to this effort. And so we are moving the needle. Um, is it perfect? Probably not. Uh, could we allocate more money? We'll see, um, but we do have a finite amount of money that we're dealing with, um, but we do want to engage as uh, many um, diverse components of our community as we possibly can, so this is a, a wonderful start, in my opinion. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. Just a big thank you. I mean, to look at that list, that slide, I think we, over here we both kind of had a gasp because there was such a great diversity of um, organizations that are getting the funding on behalf of uh, Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. Thank you on behalf of the Garden Theater. Thank you, but also thank you for, um, you know, I, seeing of course the refunding for something so important this year as the Holocaust Center. So, it, it, like the the expanse of that support, and it's so important right now. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Uribe. Um, yeah, Terry, if you could kind of tell me, I mean. 19.5% are led by people of color. Why do you think it's so low, and what can we do to increase that? Time. Um, that's a much larger percentage than it has been. And so education and time. Developing um, our emerging groups takes time. This is one of the steps we're taking. In that collaboration, we're looking for both the smaller groups and the larger groups to learn from each other. So um, it's kind of a mentorship. So you're saying like this is the highest it's been. So what was it last year? Do you remember? I don't. Is Trudy here? She might. Trudy, do you remember? 
you remember if, what the percentage if, of um, if we can just get that to the commission yeah because sure. okay. I, I I would love to um, be engaged in that conversation to see how I mean when you think of how diverse Orange County is but yet it's only 19 percent when it comes to the arts it's very it's very disheartening you know so I'd, I'd love to see how we can help them okay all right, Commissioner Bonilla. Thank you. Um, so when I was on the board, I initiated the equity, the diversity, and inclusion, and we got some work. I could see some of the results of that. Um, could you give just a quick update on what some of the actions have been and what do you see coming up? Well, the one thing we did to get this going, and it was a very short time period, actually. As I said, it's a pilot, and I hope we will do more for next year. But we held a a meet, meet and match. We reached out to every community that we could think of to say, come and meet some of the groups that are probably going to get um, cultural tourism funding so we could set those collaborations up. It was only a few months ago. So now that we're planning... For next year, uh, I think we're going to have even more significant collaborations and be able to engage uh, more. The, the arts groups are going to be able to engage more together. Um, we're, I, I would say all the plans for the future aren't um, set yet, but both the Sustainability Committee and the DEI Committee have met and are working on plans to increase this. I think this pilot was successful and would like to uh, develop it more. And what have you seen from these efforts are your challenges? The challenge, I think, always of developing new organizations is getting the information to the people and having people that are able to respond. It is one thing to every once in a while get with, together with some of your friends and develop a cultural dance. It's another thing to be able to develop an organization that has the structure and capacity to apply and to handle the public's money uh, through grants like this. So it's, it's education and, and reaching out, getting Commissioner Uribe and all of you to um, help us reach people that we might not know of. Okay. Yeah, definitely I know of a lot of minority arts organizations out there. So... I guess we can help you communicate with them and reach out to them. That's something that I guess we, on our part we could do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and uh, with that, um, Commissioner Gomez Cadero uh, represents the board uh, and, and working with this group, so I'm going to go to her for a potential motion. Okay, thank you. Um, motion to approve of the Arts and Cultures Affairs Advisory Council funding recommendation of Arts and Cultures Affairs grant to cultural tourism for fiscal year 2024. Second more. The seconder is uh, Commissioner Moore. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda, and this is... Um, we're going to get an update regarding uh, the legislative priorities. Uh, Ms. Kelly Teague, oh, there she is, okay, is going to be uh, presenting this item. And with that, Ms. Teague, you're recognized. Good afternoon, Mayor, Comptroller Diamond, uh, members of the Board of County Commission. It is great to see you today. As my presentation loads, I want to say it's that time again. It's time to go back to Tallahassee. As you know, we have staggered sessions. So our last session concluded um, in May, and now we're heading all the way back um, to start uh, this session in January. And um, if last session is any indication, I'm sure it will be a very calm exercise in logic and um, great reasoning, so we should be excited. I'm going to go through our legislative priorities um, as they were developed by staff. And Kelly, and it, uh, there is um, a special session that has been announced, right? Correct, and Mayor. I'm going to include that in the timeline, so you'll hear a okay. little bit more about that in just a moment. Yep. Lots of fun coming up. All right, I want to just start generally and talk about the legislative team. This is the group of individuals that works to put the legislative priorities together that are being presented to you today. 
Um, we obviously look to identify proposals that impact the county's provision of services to its citizens. Um, we obviously want to inform decision makers up in Tallahassee of the positive and negative impacts of qu consequences of their proposed legislation. And they w we also want to advocate for fair, reasonable, and balanced resolution of current and future challenges. I also wanted to pause because Mark Jeffries is here with me today. He is our boots on the ground in Tallahassee, does a great job working with our legislators day in and day out during session. And so we will proceed. This is gonna be the outline of the presentation today. I'd like to start with the legislative overview. This is an opportunity for us to recalibrate and remember who um, are the players that we're working with here in Tallahassee. On the Senate side, uh, this is Senate President Kathleen Pasadomo. She's from District 28, and this is her second year as Senate President, so this will be her last year. And then members of the Orange County Legislative Delegation that serve in the Senate are here on this slide. You can see Senator Broder, Senator Baxley, Senator Thompson, Senator Stewart, and Senator Torres. On the House side, uh, we have House Speaker Paul Renner, District 19, and again, this is um, his second year, and so this will be the conclusion of his speakership. And members of the Orange County delegation that serve within the Florida House are here on this screen. We've got a rather large group, but you will see one missing, um, and that was um, Representative Fred Hawkins, who resigned, and the special election to fill his seat is on November 7th, so we should have that slide filled shortly. Um, I will note that D stands for district, so you can see their respective districts up on the slide. Next, I want to go through our timeline, and as Mayor mentioned, we do have a special session coming up. We believe that's going to be coming up. Mark, is it the 13th, what they're talking about? Oh, he's in conversation. I believe it's going to be the 13th, Mayor, and they're going to be talking about a couple of different issues. Uh, you can see we have two more interim committee weeks in November. We've got our Orange County Legislative Delegation hearing, which is on the 29th of November here in our BCC chambers. We've got two committee weeks in December. Well, they're really up the talk of, of budgets and what we can expect for the coming year. And then regular session convenes on January 9th. Fact legislative day is January 17th. And March 8th, fingers crossed, is the last day of the regular session. All right, so let's talk about our key priorities. Um, there are three items I want to discuss in this category, and I do want to note all three of these have been advanced to the Florida Association of Counties for consideration on its legislative agenda. That will be determined coming up in the next few weeks as the group convenes in the Tampa area to do their legislative conference. So let's start on the water quality side. Um, Commissioner Wilson presented this one at the policy conference. We want to secure legislation to authorize alum treatments. This is one of the tools in our toolkit to deal with um, impaired water bodies. Um, there has been a little bit of a hiccup and these are no longer um, an authorized use in state waters or sovereignty submerged lands. And so we want to take a look at that and um, continue the practice moving forward. On the LIHEAP side, LIHEAP stands for Low Income Energy Assistance Program. Um, this is the budget authority for the state to dispense federal funds. These are federal funds that come through the state but they must have budget authority in order to disperse the funds to local governments. We've run into a challenge and it's likely related to um, the pandemic recovery dollars that also, also came through the same category. Um, and so we wanna make sure we fully execute the budget authority so that we can receive disbursement for LIHEAP and continue our programs without any type of inter interruption or delay moving forward. And lastly, you'll recognize this priority. It came from the TDT working group. This involves the tourist impact tax. Um, we want to support proposed changes to the tourist impact tax to expand the counties that are authorized to pursue the tax and expand authorized uses of the tourist impact tax. Um, this is one of the items that was also, as I mentioned, submitted to the Florida Association of Counties, and so it will be one of the items discussed at the upcoming legislative conference. On the state funding side, we have four items. Two will look very familiar. Mental health services, this involves our Central Receiving Center, a statewide competitive grant program for central receiving centers throughout the state. We also want to encourage um, the Vivitrol program, which is an opioid response uh, strategy that the county uses. And then you'll see two new items, the Accelerated Traffic Safety Program, which is a pedestrian safety project. It's about a seven and a half mile stretch of Clericoa, Clericona Ocoee Road between Apopka Ocoee Road and Orange Blossom Trail Highway 441. Um, this is part of an accelerated traffic safety program to help with pedestrian safety in that area. And another item you'll see is a buffered alum project. Um, this is a project that involves a priority you've already seen, but it does not, it's not restricted currently by state law. 
So we have two small impaired uh, lakes in South Orange County, Lake Bumby and Lake Tyner, both of which drain towards Lake Okeechobee. This would allow us to pursue alum projects in those two water bodies. Now, I suspect we'll spend about 95, possibly 98% of our time on this slide, um, and it really kind of gets to the heart of local governments and how we operate and our importance to our um, citizens. We want to preserve home rule, preserve local government funding sources, maintain existing authority for zoning, permitting, conservation, and expand local authority to address unique issues related to BMAPs and TMDL goals. I will note that fertilizer fits very strongly. I know that was a topic of conversation a few minutes ago um, within this slide, and I expect fertilizer to be a big topic of conversation in Tallahassee this session. On our support and oppose statements, you'll three, see three support statements here, legislation that directly impacts water quality and quantity, land preservation and acquisition. We wanna support sustainability and renewable energy efforts. And we wanna support mitigation efforts to address advanced septic system requirements that are outlined in state law. We also want to support the legislative priorities of our community partners consistent with county efforts. We see those most often with our transportation providers, Lynx, Metroplan, Orlando. Oftentimes they'll identify a more nuanced issue that does indirectly impact Orange County and this gives us the authorization to work on those alongside those partners. We want to oppose preemption, cost shifts, unfunded mandates, and oppose legislation that negatively impacts TDT funding and the governance. And last but not least, I want to pause for this item. This is a slide that represents issues that we have heard discussed or seen in previous sessions that can cause a lot of consternation for the county. So while they may not appear directly on the list that I just described, if they were to appear in a way that was um, harmful to Orange County, they would immediately move to one of our key priorities. And you can see them listed here. These are um, bread and butter issues for county governance. And then I wanted to pause, Mayor, for a discussion, and then my last slide is um, a request that you approve the proposed legislative agenda. All right. Uh, Kelly, uh, in terms of the support or oppose, just talk a little bit to the board about how we uh, come to support or oppose as a historical, uh, I think, um, piece that you can perhaps talk about. Sure, Mayor. Um, we see so many issues in Tallahassee. Some come up in the form of bills that we receive decent notice on because there's a bill filing deadline, but oftentimes they come up in the form of amendments. And as session goes on, the amendments fly pretty quickly and they go to a vote pretty quickly. So when we talk about those support statements, oftentimes we're not in the lead on those priorities. They're the priorities that come up through the process. They're introduced perhaps by the Florida Association of Counties, the Florida League of Cities, and it allows us to really zero in on, for instance, sustainability and renewable energy. That's an item that is of interest to this board, and so if an opportunity presents itself, that's something we would be supportive in the process. And what happens is each year, uh, the board, uh, our board, takes a position on the items that we want to support or oppose, and from uh, as the years move forward or the legislative sessions move forward, uh, some of those same items uh, continue uh, to carry over from one legislative session to the to the other. So that's the starting point that Kelly works with, where we have said these are issues or that uh, is concerning to us that we will support or oppose. So she doesn't re um, make them up uh, each time. So uh, these are uh, issues that we have discussed previously um, with the current board or prior boards that uh, are moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna open it up, uh, Commissioner Moore. Uh, yes, good morning, Kelly. Good um, morning. Quick question, on Live Local Act, have you seen, are you hearing any glitch bills already arriving at the desk or is it too soon? It is too soon. We just haven't, because we really haven't had to deal with too much here yet. Okay. Correct. We haven't heard of anything yet, but that's one of the ones that would definitely fall within our priorities. Um, sometimes it comes up within cost shifts or unfunded mandates. Some of it will involve preemption, as you know, with the Live Local Act. There are a couple items that restrict local governments from doing certain things. So it, it's something that's definitely on our radar. Okay. And then are you still seeing a, a commitment to funding um, septic to sewer water quality projects continuing with this body? It appears so. It appears so. It has been a topic of discussion. I think the challenge, as this board knows, is it is extremely costly. And while there is a commitment to fund at certain levels, um, how much of an impact that provides 
when you really kind of break it down county by county is is less apparent so no that's definitely true um, and, and so uh, what we're hearing well first question I, there had been legislation a couple of years ago to take regulation of the septic tanks from the Department of Health over to FDP, but I'm not really seeing that they are managing the program yet. Do you have any information on that? I have not heard any updates, but let me write that down because that's a great thing that I can follow up on for you. Right, because what we're hearing, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hearing through Orange County Utilities when I say we, that, um, so I'm assuming it's going to be the Department of Health is going to start enforcing the, the statute that if your septic tank fails and, and you're located in the BMAP area that you will have to replace it with a, a more advanced treatment system. And so I have, in, in some ways it's good because I've got two neighborhoods getting ready to vote in January, February to convert to sewer. But on the other hand, I have my lower income folks farther south in the Lockhart and Pine Hills area that I'm, I'm almost terrified of what's going to happen if they're enforcing that. And what we've seen in the past, Kelly, is that we could take a, a, a struggling homeowner and send them over to a grant, right. you know, to have their system replaced from the Department of Health. And so I'm hoping that they're balancing out and going to fund that because that's clearly where we're going to need some additional help when we hit these lower income areas. And as always, appreciate your hard work. I love hearing the weekly uh, reports of what's going on and I've probably been following the legislature for 30 years, and so I know how hard a job you have, and we really appreciate you and Mark. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner gomez Cadero. And thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Kelly, for um, the presentation. I have a simple question. Um, can you explain with an example the unfunded mandates that's in, in slide 16? Sure, sure. We see this come up quite a bit. And sometimes it can be as simple as having more owner's requirements for placing things on our website, um, which seem to make a lot of sense from a transparency standpoint, but the cost to execute those log, large items of information being stored on our website can have financial implications. But we also have um, sovereign immunity increases. That's another great example, and it was one of the monitor items on our sheet. Mm -hmm. um, restriction of water quality tools. I talked about that with that alum issue. So we have different requirements under the BMAP process, mm -hmm. and if our tools are eliminated, that's a cost shift to us. We have to find another way to meet those goals. So they come up in practically every different category um, that we face, and sometimes they're direct cost shifts, and sometimes they're very indirect. I think a great example is the resources of how, how much is necessary to put things on websites, um, you know, at large volumes. Um, it, ha it has implications. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Commissioner. Good morning. Good so, morning. So I had a question, but I just got my answer on the internet, so I will just say uh, The Google thank machine you. helped out. Yes, uh, so I was looking for when the next legislative delegation for Orange County was going to be, and that's November 29th, so I want to say thank you for the work that you and Mark do, um, and keep up the good work. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Commissioner Wilson. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I've got a little scratch my throat. Um, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Kelly. I um, also look forward to all the updates. Mark's uh, legislative updates for me are like, you know, on the days that everything seems to be piling up, I'm like, what's going on out there? It's always it's so informative and helpful. Um, so last session during budget, there was a fertilizer preemption that came through. We made the cut because we were grandfathered in. How do we get in front of those, right? That budget amendment where you don't realize this direction is even coming. How, how, what is a way that we can maybe try to advocate for our, our interests in that process. I will say it has, in recent years, it's always challenging in Tallahassee, at least in the time that I've been going up, which has been quite a bit. Um, I would say in recent years it's become even more challenging. Um, more often we're seeing bills not make it through the process on the Senate side, which used to be, it used to indicate whether the bill was going to be successful in the long term, but at the last second there'll be the House bill will pass, it'll be substituted and taken into the last committee of reference on the Senate side. So you, it, if you ever watch the show Lost, Dead is Dead, um, that is not true in the legislature. Um, it is always a little unclear what is alive and what is dead, and especially in recent years. I think that budget example is a, is a perfect one. Um, I, I do believe that they are frustrated with Orange County, and so I, I think you, you can expect to see more um, efforts involving fertilizer 
um, whether that takes the form of a preemption or more restrictions, um, we shall see. But that was definitely a sign that we yeah. should be very much paying attention to. Well, I mean, and they, they've already preempted for individual DIYers, right? So all we have is the commercial applicators, and it's really, I mean, the, the science is there. And you think about the things that they're funding on the flip side of the coin, which is the septic to sewer. So you would think it would be consistent with the goals across the state. but You would think. You would think. We'll could keep on hammering that drum. We're very proud of you up there. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Uribe. Hi, Kelly. Um, I know we didn't get a chance to connect. It's my fault. But I'm just curious. We, you know, we attend a lot of Florida Association of Counties uh, meetings. And what we see consistently, like what we saw last year, was when they were talking about term limits, a lot of the county commissioners actually hurtled up and worked their their connections in Tallahassee to get that off the table. And I would love to see, and I don't, I don't want to speak on behalf of anyone else, but like I have relationships on both sides, in the mm -hmm. Senate, in the House, both sides of the table, and I really feel that we're kind of missing our mark. And then now with my leadership role on the state transportation, we've already seen a glitch bill already in the works for transportation that we're watching. We have our, our quarterly meeting coming up that's going to be a high discussion because we're preparing for the transportation glitch bill. And, um, and I don't know, and maybe this is something you and I can meet about, but I would be willing, I'm going to be in Tallahassee this year anyways, advocating for transportation with FDOT and so forth because what is interesting is while we're here trying to innovate and transit, what Tallahassee is doing is infrastructure. We're not on the same page at all. So it just, you know, you just wonder how can we leverage that to help us in our, in our under, underfunded infrastructure because that seems like that's a priority at the state level more than, than anything else. And, um, and so just I would love to collaborate better and see how we can be useful. I've, I've gone and successfully helped on transportation, but I haven't done anything to help us. And so I'd, I'd be willing to do that. We would love to put you to work. I know the day the Capitol got canceled just last year, but I really yeah. hope that we'll revisit that mm -hmm. where we kind of each who have, because there's a couple state senators that, um, that I actually have a decent relationship with that I, I would love to help. Um, I also want to echo Commissioner Moore on that septic conversion. Mm -hmm. I am, you know, word out there is that the state is going to make everyone switch from septic to, you know, to sewer and... My Taft community, my Pine Castle community are mm -hmm. terrified. And even though I'm trying to say, you know, even in the grand scheme of this happening, it's such a long process and, and they're expecting you to write a check, you know, it's terrorizing our residents who do depend on um, septic. And so I think just for informational purposes, and I know I want to, you know, the team here at the county, we're, we're looking at areas that we're trying to you know, forthcoming, and we're being very selective in those areas that where we think we can get, like what Commissioner Moore did successful, we can get there. Mm -hmm. But I'm noticing every time I have a community meeting, I get that scare concern from residents. Mm -hmm. So I want to echo mine's more Pine Castle Taft. That's good to know. Thank Not you. necessarily Conway, but that Pine Castle Taft area. And so, um, so yeah, I just, you know, just food for thought on those things. And see how we can utilize and and I'd also like to have a discussion because I know we have partners that represent us mm -hmm. and I'd like a little bit more definition on when that partner that we hire to help us when they go into a meeting because they represent such an array of people how are we defined because I I feel like you know Orange County don't expect much the best you can hope for is that they leave us alone but <laughs> but I'd really like to look at it differently what little can we do or what influence can we have I mean I plan on being here for the legislative day when when we're welcoming them just to hey how are you doing hope to see you in Tallahassee I'm, I'm gonna make a bigger effort to participate because I think that we should not always think you know the sky's falling but maybe there is a pocket for us to be successful and even a little is a lot sure certainly and and fixing sometimes you can't stop the bad bill but you can make it less bad yeah and and those incremental steps I am you know it's hard to say that they're successful, but the absence of them would be really problematic. So it's a really good point. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, I'd like to say that I also have some relationships up there and both sides. And unfortunately, though, when I'm talking to the Republican side and you know, saying, hey, I, we need your help, you know, they, 
they were saying that they had no choice but to follow what leadership wanted from them. So it was a very hard situation. Um, I'm, I'm not giving them an out, though, because, look, Good. everyone could have some courage, right, <laughs> which I told them, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, that's the excuses that definitely I was getting. Um, they did preempt us on the on the Live Local Act for um, not being able to do anything about rents or rent stabilization. We're having an increase in homelessness here in Orange County. The, the point in time count is highest than it's been in the last five years. Um, we're losing shelter space as well. And the, the solutions, air quotes, that they came up with are things that either may never happen or if they do happen, it's going to take many years to happen and to have an impact on, mm-hmm. on rents. And the, the reasons why they're finding a lot of people who are newly homeless is because the rents are going up and they're being evicted. So what is the state doing to help us for short-term solutions for these individuals until their long-term solutions start showing some results? I mean, I think arguably you could say there is a bigger commitment to the Sadowski Affordable Housing Trust Fund, and they've actually kind of segmented it a bit to, you know, really focus on workforce housing and those workforce issues for those. Um, But the overall conversation, we don't see a lot of solutions for the topics that you're discussing. It's, It's a tough conversation to have in Tallahassee. All right, thank you. I know that's not very promising. You know, I just want the people out there to know what's going on yep. and why our hands are tied and why things are getting worse. Yeah, that's true. Too. All right. Um, we do have, um, with the Florida Association of Counties, the legislative uh, conference meeting on November 15th, 16th. Yeah, and I think it concludes uh, on the 17th, early morning hours. And so um, we will be participating in that uh, to have a conversation and set the priorities um, as the counties, uh, colleagues from around the state, uh, see them and to try to, those issues that are important to us, uh, we have to be engaged in the process of um, creating allies amongst the Florida Association of Counties um, because, quite frankly, if uh, we don't have their support in some uh, initiatives that's important to us, uh, then we lose a big a part of our ability to uh, negotiate or advocate. And so um, I encourage uh, you all who can participate in the uh, legislative conference coming up. It will be in Tampa uh, to try to make that um, and and gain some allies along with us uh, to advocate about those things that we believe are important to us. And to Kelly's team, um, yeah, you all uh, will be there. We've got some heavy lifting to do. We'll be paying close attention to any of the issues centered around the tourist impact fee or the tourist development tax or those and those conversations in Tallahassee. Of course, we've had somewhat of a mandate by our tourist development task force to advocate for expanding the tourist development impact fee um, eligible uh, eligibility. Um, we started a conversation uh, with our colleagues at the Florida Association of Counties, and uh, it has been advanced to uh, consideration during the legislative conference. Don't know where. The association is going to land on whether to support, uh, you know, what we have requested. Uh, we did have some support from one other county uh, for what uh, what we are recommending, uh, but I can tell you that uh, it just appeared from the committee meeting that uh, it's probably going to be a heavy lift, uh, but we won't know what we don't know until we go through the process of uh, at least advocating our position and uh, during the legislative conference. So again, if that's important to uh, you, uh, they need to hear from you uh, during the conference. All right, with that, um, Kelly, these are 
the priorities, if um, we can at least uh, have a motion uh, to support this. This so gives staff Uribe. the direction. Second, Scott. Okay. I heard Commissioner Uribe first. Uh, I'm going to go to Commissioner Gomez Cadero uh, on the. <laughs> Well, you know, anyway, I'm going to go to you, Commissioner Gomez Cadero. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. All Thank right. you, Commissioners. Uh, with that, we're going to move forward. Uh, I believe this is the last item before uh, we break for uh, lunch and uh, come back for the afternoon session. Uh, but... Uh, we always look forward to hearing from community and family services and Head Start. Uh, we got a, we have an all star uh, in amongst us, uh, Miss Sonia Hill, in the whole Head Start space across the nation. Uh, she is uh, recognized as one of the preeminent experts uh, in the area of Head Start, and uh, we have a wonderful program here. And I know this is a fan favorite. Uh, for uh, our Board of County Commissioners. So with that, Ms. Hill, uh, you are recognized. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Comptroller, uh, County Administrator, Mr. Newton, and Chamber's guests. I am Sonia Hill, the Division Manager for Orange County Head Start, and I'm here today to present the annual update. My presentation overview will include the purpose, program goals, child outcomes, update to our 2022 challenges, progress on goals of 2022, highlights and accomplishments, a few challenges, and our goals for 2023. Purpose. Not less than once a year, I come before the board to provide an annual update. On a monthly basis, this board do receive Head Start information, but this is uh, so that we could adhere to the federal regulations. And I just love being here as well. <laughs> Our program goals. You can come anytime. <laughs> Our program goals are derived from our community assessment, our self-assessment, and our uh, program data. And this, these program goals are submitted with our five-year grant and are part of our strategic planning. Just a couple of our kiddos doing Guest Readers Month. Our goals include professional development, staff retention, physical health and mental wellness, technology, and families. Goal one, Orange County Head Start will be a learning organization in which staff engages in continuous improvement to reach their potential and improve children and family outcomes. Goal two, staff retention. We will create an environment that supports staff retention and reduce turnover. Goal three, physical health and mental wellness. We will enhance the physical health and mental wellness of staff, children, and families by developing a comprehensive wellness approach. Goal four, technology. We will design and build a technology infrastructure that will provide students, families, and staff with access to resources and education to increase children's achievement of the skills needed to thrive in a globally connected world. And goal five, Families, which was added this program year as a result of information that was uh, provided in our community assessment. It states that Orange County Head Start will identify and partner with community agencies to provide services and resources to increase family well-being and assist families to becoming self-reliant. Child Outcomes. Our child outcomes are derived from the scores from the Galileo assessment system. Uh, the Galileo assessment have 12 domains. Our children are assessed through all, across all 12 domains. However, the data across the five essential domains that align with the Florida Early Learning Outcome Framework is what we what we provide to this board and our other stakeholders. And I'm very happy with the outcome of our children and they have exceeded the benchmarks and they continue to compete at a national level. 
On the screen, you'll see one of our partners, the Orlando Science Center, and it's just the steps in getting ready for some STEM activities in the classroom. It starts on the, uh, circ in, on the carpet in a large group. Then they go into their smaller group times where they're talking about developing and, and what they're doing and uh, hypotheses and uh, just a lot of conversation, and then in the end, they're going to test out their product. So our child outcomes over the next five slides include our social and emotional, our physical health, and as you can see, we have exceeded the benchmarks, language and literacy, a lot of conversation going on in our classrooms, Early math, nature and science, and we are moving back up to that mark. And school readiness. School readiness include skills from all of the domains, but they especially align with what a child must know before going to kindergarten. So it states that 98% of our four-year-olds were ready for kindergarten. So we are extremely proud of the, these scores. Oh, wait a minute. Who's that? Is that, a, is that Superman? <laughs> no, that is Super Reader. And so I want to just uh, recognize Commissioner Scott for participating in Guest Readers Month. The kids thought he was Superman, but then he told them that he was Super Reader, and they're Super Readers too. So we'll so talk about our update to our 2022 challenges. So this slide is a, the slide from my 2022 presentation when I said what challenges we had. Of course, there were more, but these were the three that were most relevant. The great resignation, which most organizations were hit with. Um, we were unable to serve the 1536 due to staff shortage, and we continued to have delayed responses from the Office of Head Start, which... Um, on a regional and national level, which affects funding approval um, and other things of th that nature. So I want to talk about what have we done and how has things looked across the last four years in regards to these three challenges. So staff turnover, this slide is for teachers only. Remember, we have teachers and teacher assistants in our classroom. And as you can see, prior to COVID, our turnover rate was uh, pretty low. Uh, we pride ourselves on being one of the best early childhood programs to work for, but we, like others, were hit by COVID, and you can see it, our turnover rate went up, but we are back uh, to our 12%, and throughout this presentation, you'll hear how did we do that. This is for teacher assistance, pretty much the same. Family service workers, I continue to work with uh, HR to see what the reasons are with this particular position as we are seeing an increase instead of a decrease. However, I think we are only three vacancies in that uh, position as, as of today. However, we continue to work to make sure we're recruiting the best and we're retaining those workers as well. And those are our workers that work directly with our families and they're required to have a batch, at least a bachelor's degree in social work or a related field. Staff retention. So this is us over the last four years. Dropped a bit during COVID, but we are rising. Some of the strategies to stabilize the Head Start workforce from the Office of Head Start included permanently increasing compensation. Office of Head Start strongly encouraged programs to use uh, findings from their wage comparability study to help support their decisions, offer bonuses, short-term pay increases, other financial assistances, and compensate staff during closures. Why is this important? Because in the past, grant funds have not been allowed to be used for financial incentives like our sign-on bonuses and our um, 
sign-on bonuses and the longevity bonuses and things that this board approved that has helped us retain. So I wanted to make sure uh, this board was aware that the Office of Head Start not only encouraged but support the things that you all are voting on in regards to staff retention. Progress on goals of 2022. Now these goals are a little bit different than the goals that I talked about earlier in the slides. Those goals are a part of our strategic planning. These are goals that we sit down as a management team and say, what do we want to work on? So this slide is from last year's presentation, which I said these were going to be some of our goals. We wanted to complete a wage comparability study to ensure our salary, salaries were competitive with Orange County Public School. We wanted to continue aggressive recruitment of staff and students offer more parents the opportunity to receive their child development associate and locate additional space and decrease our classroom enrollment by class size. So these are some of the things that we've done. As you can see, the financial investments that were provided to us um, from the Office of Head Start and the financial investments from this board that has helped us to reduce our turnover and retain our staff. That's extremely important. This is something that was done to reduce turnover and retain staff, and I think to make them very happy as well. Some of our hiring strategies included uh, working with Human Resources to have two hiring events, it was um, publicized on the media, we had about 69 people we interviewed, 53 uh, received offers, and 31 of those made it through our, our process, which we're extremely proud of that process because we know we're getting the best with the county's process that we have. Uh, but since the last time I've been here, we've made 94 contingent offers. Out of the 94, 64 became permanent employees. We still have about 45 vacancies, and 31 um, persons are going through the hiring process. So fingers are crossed. Just some pictures from, we had Hispanic Heritage Month celebrations all across the county. This is from Taft Head Start. This, um, you see the students and teachers. Our teachers dressed as well as our students. So um, the second bullet on the goals where we were going to aggressively recruit students and staff. So this shows you our outreach events um, and how we've gotten out in the community. We are everywhere. Invite us to any of your events. We will come and we will bring Head Start information and recruit children and families because uh, we are knocking on doors, walking neighborhoods, uh, doing media stories, whatever we can to get the word out. This year we had two large events, one in um, Eastern Orange County and West Orange County. Um, over 200 families attended those events. We completed 126 applications on site. That was awesome for us. That was something that we haven't been able to do historically, but with all the technology upgrades around the county, our staff having their own laptops, we can do the applications from anywhere in Orange County. And as you know, this is one of our proud, stable recruitments, our Lynx bus. And so you can see what the recruitment is doing for us. So you can see prior to COVID, then COVID. And as you can see, as of um, September, we ended with 1497. However, we do have enough students on our waiting list to fill our entire 1536. Once those persons get through the hiring process, we will be fully enrolled. And this shows the number of parents by years that have received their child development associate. So we continue to aggressively recruit parents and bring them in our classroom and then uh, support and pay for their education. Highlights and accomplishments. Oh my. Guest Readers Month was big this year, as you can see, some familiar faces in the classrooms that came out to read to the kids. I got to get the others, because I wanted to share that. 
The staff completed the two-year Trauma Smart training, and uh, as a result, uh, staff have seen improvements in their work environment, how they're treated by their peers, and they have it, more opportunities to engage in self-care activities, which is important. We opened two new sites at Lovell and Riverside Elementary. <laughs> yes, Commissioner Moore, in your district. Um, we have a wonderful partnership with Vistar Credit Union, and this year we expanded it to Financial Fitness Fridays for staff. And today we have two of our Vistar partners with us, Mr. Char Charlie Plaza, the Vice President of the Branch in Antelman, and Steve Martin. And every Friday they host financial events for the staff around 3 o'clock via WebEx. I think last week was Roth IRAs and Retirement. Um, the I.S. Hankins and F.A. Johnson Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated placed lending libraries at seven sites, which resulted in over $25,000 in in-kind donations. These books allow students to take them home. They have a bag with supplies and materials. They are able to participate in family engagement activities. And something that we are all Peacock proud of is Mr. Donnellian Brown, our Head Start parent at Callahan Head Start. He was awarded the Florida Head Start Association Father of the Year, and he's with us here if you stand today. And he will be um, going to Cape Coral, Florida tomorrow. And on Friday, he will receive his award from the Florida Head Start Association. And he will compete at the regional level against seven states of fathers. And hope we're crossing our fingers, hoping that he will win. One thing I always like to brag on, Mr. Um, Darnellian is a single parent, and his son had perfect attendance last school year, and I always think that's awesome. We collected in partnership with the Early Learning Coalition of Orange County 10,000 diapers that was donated to the Central Florida Diaper Bank. We had over 865 guest readers in our Head Start classrooms, and we established 15 new contracts, and this will be helpful for goal number five that said that we needed to establish a partnerships to provide more direct services to our families. We celebrate in Head Start, and as you know, we are some of the most creatives. So our end of the year celebration always is a theme. This year it was dressed in a movie theme. Can you guess? Okay, I'll tell you. We have hidden figures down at the bottom. Up at the top, hocus pocus. And at the bottom we have the Pirates of the Caribbean. And these are all Head Start staff. They really go all out for this event. Some of our challenges uh, this year include office space and center space. So we are growing and need more space. Increase in food pricing with Orange County Public Schools. Increase of enrolled children with challenging behaviors and vacancies will continue to be a challenge and because of ratio requirements until we can get all uh, our slots filled. Our goals, and as I said, these are just goals that the management team work on, different from our goals with our five-year plan that you heard earlier. Those goals are goals that's mandated by the Office of Head Start. These are goals that we continue to work on as a management team. We are working to identify center and classroom space. We are excuse me, continue to decrease the number of students per classroom so we can eventually give priority to our three-year-olds and complete the playground rebuilds that was started with the disaster funds money. We want to explore the possibility of applying for the disaster grant with the Office of Head Start for damages caused by Hurricane Ian. We want to increase the number of staff specifically supporting children with varying exceptionalities 
and we would like to partner with OCPS um, schools that high schools that offer early childhood certification to create a workforce pipeline for the future. So if those students are going to stay in the Central Florida area, whether Valencia, UCF, they can come and begin to work in our classrooms as teacher assistants. And so I just want to thank this board for your continued support. Um, as you can see, we've done a lot. We've made a lot of strides. We were hit um, hard by COVID, but just like the Phoenix, we have r risen to the occasion. We continue to be an excellent program, and that is in part because of the support that we get from this board. I've traveled all around to uh, Head Starts and met with different Head Start directors, and they always say, oh, you're the Disney of Head Starts. And I always say, no, my board is very supportive, and we we are the, what we are and who we are because of you. So I want to say thank you for your continued support, and just thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present today. And All right. Well, Commissioner Michael Scott. I got my start in Head Start, and so I'm grateful to the work of Sonia, her team, um, and the support of her leadership and Tracy or Dr. Salem. And uh, the, yeah, I'm having a brain fart here, forgive me. But I just am grateful for the work that you and your team do, and so keep doing what you've been doing. Thank you. And Commissioner Scott right. was a uh, Head Start student in this Head Start program. All right. He did all right. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you trained him well. <laughs> all right. Uh, Commissioner Uribe. Thank you for the information. You know, as someone now who has a first grader, so I've, every year I've progressively talked with you, and one of the things that have come up with a first grader is how important the reading is, yes. right? So not only, you know, being read to, but also those high-frequency words that they start learning yes. and the spelling. Do you guys at all keep track of that? Because I have learned, you know, as a parent who has a one, you know, first grader, how important that data is from pre-K. Because what we start seeing is that they fall behind already. Like when they're when you're getting them ready for kindergarten or pre-K four, were they ready to move on? And so, and I know you guys have to let them go mm -hmm. to the public school system. But do you guys have a relationship with OCPS? Because one of the things that I've learned, especially with boys, is attention spans, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there. It just means the attention span of when they're grading. And I feel like that's so important. So I'm just curious to know, do you guys work with OCPS to provide that data? Or if you have a child who's not prepared or who's a little behind because of the language, issue and things like that. Just curious to know how you guys deal with that. Okay, so a couple of things. Uh, we host a transition conference. So for all of our parents, and we specially uh, target our parents that children have IEPs or any other varying exceptionalities to come, and we teach them how to maneuver the public school system, how to transition their IEP to the kindergarten classroom and beyond. So that's held every year, as well as every OCPS teacher, kindergarten teacher, where our, ch our parents receive a form there to tell us that they've registered and for what school they've registered for. At that point, we send their scores to that school, hopefully to arrive to that kindergarten teacher. We've been making baby steps trying to get a, a number, like that OCPS number, the, uh, the, the 480 number that the students have, mm -hmm. that they could have something that will follow them from Head Start to public school. Um, like I said, we're making big baby steps. It's not always as easy to man maneuver with um, the public school system, but we do as much as we can on our part to provide the parents information. We do two parent conferences, and so the parents get to see where their child land at at the end of the year. They have their scores, so they're able to facilitate that once they get to kindergarten. So if a teacher is saying, oh, he's really, really behind, they can say, well, this is his scores when he left Head Start, so let's try to work together to see what's going on. So we do we do as much as we can, but we don't have any type of tracking number to where we can go back and say, um, 
Maria was in Head Start and now she has this, but the parents do a good job of letting us know it. Most parents communicate with their Head Start teachers forever, and we get a lot of students um, that have exceeded when they get to kindergarten because of how well they've done in Head Start. Yeah, because I think we know you guys create rock stars, and we had the pleasure of meeting some of the children. and. It's not only in their learning capability, but their communication. You know, yes. like these children were communicating eye contact. Those are such key things at such a young age. And it's like you just almost want to make sure. And so, like, my son went pre-K-4. He's with the same. So I get to see pre-K-4, yes. kindergarten. And it would be great because I always worry in the school system when things get so big, the kids get lost. And it's like first grade is, like, really that stepping stone. And, and I just hope we – we can work on that because it's so, so important. But you guys do a great job, and, uh, and I love to see. I've, I've talked to parents that are bilingual, and they're trying because, see, they want their kids to succeed. Yes. And I, I see them, even though they don't understand. It's so funny when I see kids interpreting for the parents, you know, and that's always the best. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank and uh, you. great job. And, you know, I, did, I, think I missed a reading this year, but I did do the diapers. Okay. So, you know, so, and I think it's so important. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And you can come read any time. I like to read. Yeah. Actually, I've been told I need to stop reading to my son, so I have to come read to you guys now. <laughs> Commissioner Wilson. Uh, I was going to say I read mine all the whole way. So we did your take a turn, I take a turn, you take a turn, I take a turn. Um, I could not be any more proud <laughs> of the work that you all do, your team. And I mean, top to bottom, I think some of these slides just made me want to like jump up and yell. If you look at the fact that you literally halved that you, the teacher shortage in a year, um, incredible, because that says a lot about leadership and that says a lot about support for those teachers. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I was a little bit curious about the, it, the difference between the retention rates that you're seeing in the teachers and teacher's aides and that family services component. It seems like you've got some really great pipelines for the teachers and teachers' aides. Is there any opportunity for us to look for a way to support with the pipeline for the family services workers? Honestly, I believe that we got to look at the pay for that position. Okay. Yeah, that, that's not, once we, and we're working with HR to, to do that. I, I can say the compensation team has been extremely supportive of all of my crazy ideas and everything that the staff have wanted to do. Uh, cause we have a relationship with UCF. We have the social workers from the School of Social Work at UCF that intern in our program, but there's so many opportunities out there for social workers now than it was prior to COVID. And so um, we're competing on a larger level. So, But the team here, this Head Start team is amazing. They work really hard. And so I know that we'll be able to fix that too. Well, I mean, look at these metrics, right? Like it's incredible to see, and I think we all knew, and we were all really scared of how long we would see the outcomes in these learning gains be affected by COVID. And to see that jump and how dramatic it is from that 2021 to 2023, you're doing it, right? You're doing it. You're catching us up, which is, is really incredible. I'm not saying there's not still some, you know, yeah. some gaps out there and some gains to be made. But knowing that part of that success has been surrounding not just the child with these educational tools, but also this family, whatever we can do, whatever I can do to help support um, getting that same type of staffing and stability, because it's not crazy ideas. You're doing things yeah. that work, and the proof is, is in the data and the information that you share with us, and I, I turn around and then share it back out and trying to get more kids in my district enrolled and parents involved. So I just thank you so much, and don't ever hesitate to call on us. I want to read, too. Okay, thank you. I love your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Bonilla. Yeah, I'm also a um, Head Start <laughs> graduate, which I, before I turn out, I really have to find that picture <laughs> so I can show you all. Um, I was, I had a question about the recruiting. Are you mentioning about the public service loan forgiveness? Yes. In our financial fitness Fridays, um, that was our first session with uh, public student loan forgiveness. And I know we have two people in this uh Chamber is one that received over eighty thousand dollars worth of forgiveness. She's been with Head Start over twenty-five years, and so that was awesome. So that was our first session that Vice Star and Sandra Ruff held for our staff. So yes, they are doing it, and it is working. Yeah, definitely. 
And yeah, I do suggest everyone go and read. I know like small children could be very intimidating. You never know what they're going to say to you. <laughs> but the children were so well behaved and so smart and so polite. It was really a pleasure. Thank you for reading. I don't know if you saw your picture because you walked I, out, I did. I was um, in the next room over. Right. They have a TV. Thank you for all of your support. Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Thank you. <laughs> I just don't want to, you know, pass by and not say something because everybody say something. I just want to continue doing the reading thing. My center is the east side, so I'm there for you all. Thank you. I talk about you all the time. I, I just did our policy council training, and I tell them all the time that you were a Head Start parent in Puerto Rico and you were on policy council and now you're a commissioner. So I always say, are you going to be a commissioner too? <laughs> so thank you. All right. So Ms. Hill, um, I want, let me ask you a question. Uh, I don't know if it's my imagination or what, but it seems like it's more girls than boys. Uh, you know, when I come in to read, when I was looking this morning, uh, or is it my imagination? Or is it indeed more girls and boys these days than Head Start? I tell you, you could wake me up and ask me any question about Head Start and I can answer it, but I want to be truthful and I'm just going to say I'm not 100% <laughs> sure, but I will find that out because, um, and sometimes the girls are a lot more talkative, and so you're gonna see them. <laughs> you're gonna see them in the class. They're a lot more talkative. What? That's a drop of And they're a lot moment. more. I'm not gonna say bossy, but they're a lot more leaders, and so the <laughs> the staff will um, always bring the girls sometime because they know they're gonna speak up. Okay. And, and girls mature oh. faster. <laughs> You know, I don't know, but I, I have uh, out of my five grandchildren, I have four granddaughters, and so maybe I am disproportionately exposed to it. It just seems like it's more than me. But anyway, uh, great presentation to the whole team of Hair Start. Uh, would those of you who are working the Hair Start arena, would you stand up at this time, including the parents or volunteers? All right. Thank you all so much. Thank you for sticking with our children. Uh, with that, uh, Commissioner and uh, Ms. Hill, that uh, concludes her presentation. That concludes the morning portion of our meeting today. Uh, we will be reconvening at 2 p.m. this afternoon. Thank you all very much.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the Orange County Board of County Commission meeting of October the 24th, 2023. As we begin this afternoon, uh, we're going to start on our regular agenda item with the uh, Board of Zoning Adjustment Recommendations. And I'm going to ask Ms. Jennifer Moreau to come forward to frame that item. And with that, you are recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, on October 5th, the Board of Zoning Adjustment heard 12 cases. Nine were recommended for approval. Two cases, which is VA 2310098 for Waterford Lakes and VA 2309073 Karim, were recommended for denial. One case uh, for Trinity Prep School was continued. That's SE 26, I'm sorry, SE 2306029. The BZA appeal deadline was Friday, October 20th. And one case, uh, VA 2309073 for Karim, was appealed. Uh, it's also my understanding that Commissioner Wilson would like to pull case number VA 2307046 for Robert Haynes. Uh, the Zoning Division will be requesting those cases to be scheduled for a public hearing. And with the exception of the two cases that will be scheduled, we re request that the BZA accept the recommended action and sign. Oh, okay, and with, uh, so moved with that, uh, Second. we'll ask for a, a motion, and I think I'm hearing Commissioner Uribe uh, entering a motion. Is that correct, Commissioner? Yes, yes sir. All right, and uh, second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, the motion passes, and it is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moreau. We're going to move forward then on our agenda to the next uh, item at this time. And this is a petition to vacate. This is item A1 on the agenda for those of you who are following along. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item at this time, and we're going to ask Ms. Uh, Susan Usak uh, to uh, the Deputy Director of uh, Public Works to come forward and frame this item. And with that, uh, is she here? I'm right here. Oh, she's at the end. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> this is a petition to vacate PTV 23-02-006 from Mark Freeman on behalf of Kimberly Freeman. The petitioner requests that Orange County vacate a portion of a 25-foot wide unopened and unapproved rideway known as Lake Street containing a total of approximately 1,491.05 square feet. The rideway lies north of this residential lot located within Ginny Jewel Point subdivision. The property lies north of Ginny Jewel Drive and east of Lake Street. The petitioner wishes to vacate in order to add land to his property. The real estate management, engineering, roads and drainage, transportation planning and environmental protection divisions have no objection to the request. All utility providers have provided letters of no objection to the request. Approval of this request will have no adverse effect on Orange County and staff has no objection to this request. Our All right. There you go. <laughs> Our request action of approval. Our requested action is of approval of PTV 23-02-006 and the parcel is located in District 3. I'm here to answer any questions. All right. Uh, thank you. Is the applicant on this item present? Uh, if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? If not, then we'll just acknowledge that you waived on making any comments. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. With that, then we'll close the public hearing portion. We'll go to the commissioner for the district in question. Commissioner Uribe, would you like to offer a potential motion? Yes, I'd like to file a motion for approval. Second, Scott. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move to the next item that was scheduled on the agenda, item A2. Uh, that item has been canceled for this afternoon, uh, so we will not be opening that item. We'll therefore move to item B3 at this time. We'll open the public hearing on this item. And Mr. Tim Hall is uh, going to frame this item. Uh, our environmental programs administrator is coming forward. Thank you. 
Thank you and good afternoon, Mayor Commissioners. Today I'm presenting shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit application number SADF 2307019 for applicants Michael and Marie Santana. This uh, project is located on the North Shore of Lake Anderson, as you see here on the location map. The property is located at 3562 Emerywood Lane. And here is an aerial photo with the property outlined in yellow. And here are some photos of the existing conditions. It includes a concrete block seawall, as you see there. Uh, EPD were unable to find a permit for this existing wall. Um, it's been there 20 to 30 years, according to aerial photos. Uh, and that was prior to the applicant's purchase of the property in 2003. Since it was constructed so long ago, there's um, no enforcement action um, due to the lack of any kind of permit for this. Here is the site plan that's uh, proposed for the seawall. The applicants are proposing to construct approximately 111 feet of replacement aluminum seawall along the shoreline in order to replace the existing block wall in poor condition. The proposed wall will have a 14-foot return on the northwestern end and a 12-foot return on the southeastern end. Regarding other seawalls on the lake, there is an existing seawall on the parcel immediately to the southeast and several other properties on Lake Anderson. Based on prior board direction, riprap and plantings are normally required for replacement seawalls. However, due to abundance of existing vegetation and the southern half of this wall actually being located in uplands, the potential for negative effects from wave energy is minimal and riprap and plantings are not being required. Here's a cross section of the replacement seawall and some considerations. This project was reviewed in accordance with Chapter 15, Article 6 and the review criteria and conditions of issuance therein. Notification of the public hearing was sent to property owners within 500 feet of the project and EPD has received no objections to the request. Our finding is pursuant to Orange County Code, Chapter 15, Article 6. EPD has evaluated the proposed SADF permit application and required documents and has made a finding that the request is consistent with Section 15218. The action requested is acceptance of the findings and recommendation of the Environmental Protection Division staff and approval of shoreline alteration dredge and fill permit SADF 2307019 for Michael and Marie Santana subject to the conditions listed in the staff report. This is in District 3 and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, is the applicant on this item present? If so, a representative, if you'd like to make any comments, please come to the mic. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Alan Horn. I'm with Fender Marine Construction at 8010 uh, Sunport Drive, Orlando, Florida. And I would like to first um, let, let you know that staff did a really good job working with us trying to get this um, approved. It wasn't the easiest thing, but we did it. And uh, with that, um, it was a long time to get there, but uh, with that, I'd like to just answer any of your questions if you have any. Otherwise, I'd look for your approval. All right. Uh, thank you for your presence. Uh, stand by for a few moments. Uh, are there members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. Okay. Then we're going to close the public hearing. And the district commissioner is Commissioner Uribe. Would you like to uh, make any comments or offer a motion? Good to see you, Commissioner Horn. Um, yes, I'd like to file a motion for approval. Second, more. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is uh, unanimous. Thank, Thank you for you. your presence today. Uh, all right. With that, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda. This is item C4. I'll open the public hearing on this item, and uh, once again, we'll have our zoning division manager, Ms. Jennifer Monroe, come forward and frame this item. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this is for case number ZM2307047. This is an appeal of the zoning manager's determination. The applicant and the appellant in this case is Kurt Artiman, representing North Star. So the subject property is located on Clarcona Ocoee Road. It's actually on the southwest side of Clarcona Ocoee Road and North Powers Drive. It is uh, in the restricted C2, I'm sorry, C1 commercial zoning district and also has a commercial land use uh, designation. The, just to note that the restrictions regarding the C1 zoning designation are specific to access and buffering, and they're applicable only to the parcel to the west of this, which also has the same zoning designation. 
The request before you, as I noted, is an appeal of the zoning manager's determination. This is specifically in regards to the calculation of the minimum distance separation requirement between package stores and religious institutions. Here's a location map. Once again, you can see the property is located on North Powers and Clarcona Okoe Road. Here's a zoning map. You can see that restricted C1 zoning designation. Um, you can also see that the property is surrounded by a combination of agricultural and single-family residential zoning districts. And here's an aerial map showing the subject site outlined in yellow. Um, I've circled in red the religious institution, which is located across Clarcona Okoe Road. You see it's set very far back on the property, probably about three to 400 feet. Um, this is part of the subject of this request. So county code requires liquor stores to be separated from other uses, um, and those uses include other liquor stores. We require a 5,000 foot distance separation between other liquor stores. Uh, we require a 1,000 foot distance separation between schools and, and any um, establishments uh, selling liquor, or, um, and then also religious institutions are required to have a 1,000 foot distance separation. Specifically, uh, county code outlines how those distances are measured, and I've provided the entire code section here. But essentially it says that the distance is measured from a place of business to a religious institution, and it's measured by following the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel along the public thoroughfare from the main entrance of the place of business to the main entrance door of the religious institution. Just to give you some history of this site, um, once again, the property is owned restricted C1. It was rezoned to that in 1991. Uh, it was developed, the site was developed with a retail building with several tenant spaces in 2021. Uh, in July of 21, um, county staff received a request for a distance measurement, which is one of the things that we're, we are tasked to do in order to sign off on an alcohol beverage license application, which is licensed by the state. Um, as part of our distance measurement, um, we determined that the calculation was 843 feet in lieu of the 1,000 foot that's required, and so we denied that distance separation, or we, we essentially indicated that it had failed. Um, after the building, that was when the site was under construction. After the building was almost completely constructed, I think for the most part, all the site work and everything was done, uh, and another request for distance measurement was submitted and um, that one also failed. That was measured at 857 feet. Uh, in March of 23, uh, a request for a zoning manager's determination was submitted um, specifically regarding the distance traveled. Uh, I issued that determination in April of 23, and uh, an appeal of that determination was filed in May of 23, which then subsequently went to the Board of Zoning Adjustment. So here is the um, path that county staff traveled, and this is the, the last path, the second path after the building was constructed, um, where we measured 857 feet. Um, we, we take it from the front door of the business, and then we follow it. And um, it, you'll note here that the um, church's front door, this is a unique site, and that the, the front door of the church is actually in the back side of the church as opposed to the street side of the church. Um, so that's why that measurement goes to the, to the rear of the building there. You'll also note that large grass yard in front of um, the religious institution, which, as I noted, is, is pretty unusual for most sites. Um, here is the applicant's proposed measured path, um, which meets the distance separation uh, or exceeds the distance separation requirement at 1,286 feet based on their measurements. And then here's just a side-by-side -side comparison for your reference. So uh, now I'm going to introduce Matt Pritchett with the county attorney's office, who's going to come up and just give you an overview of the, the county's position and some case law that supports our position. Good afternoon. Um, just to summarize the applicant and county's uh, contentions with respect to this appeal. So the applicant contends that Florida case law establishes private driveways as public thoroughfares, and therefore the church's private driveway should be considered a public thoroughfare in this instance and should be used in the pedestrian path to measure the distance separation. If utilizing that path, the liquor store location would satisfy the 1,000-foot distance separation requirement under county code. 
The county, however, disagrees with applicant and contends that the church's private driveway is not a public thoroughfare. And based on more recent case law, the county contends that, the, that its interpretation of the code and its measured path are correct. Travel should occur along the public thoroughfare until reaching the shortest distance to the main entrance of the church and then should directly follow that shortest route. Based on that interpretation, the liquor store location does not satisfy the 1,000-foot distance separation requirement under county code. Uh, so the first case I'm going to uh, review that supports the county's position here is Jack's Liquors, Inc. versus City of Jacksonville. This is a 1974 case that emphasizes the importance of the intent of the distance separation ordinance. Uh, so in Jack's Liquors, the trial court had initially adopted a longer route a path that required the pedestrian to travel a longer route so they would be walking against traffic in accordance with the recognized rules of the road. That is, the pedestrian would be walking facing the directional flow of vehicular traffic. On appeal, however, the appellate court rejected the trial court's longer route, saying that that, that route could not be classified as ordinary pedestrian travel. And instead, the appellate court in the Jack Slickers case approved a shorter route via a service road, uh, that included using the grassy strips of land along the service road. And in its opinion, the appellate court found that it would not be practicable to require a pedestrian to walk a mile or two out of their way to reach a destination 10 or 100 feet from the point of departure, and specifically noticed that the purpose of the law as to the separation requirement should not be diluted by some walkathon. So here we have an illustration of the routes in the Jack Slickers case. This illustration is taken directly from the case opinion. Uh, both routes begin at the uh, first location, which is that Grove site at the bottom right of the illustration. And so the trial court's route, which is highlighted in red, had the pedestrian traveling west along the South Service Road, north up University Boulevard, and then east along the North Service Road until reaching Jack's Liquors, the second location. However, the appellate court rejected the trial court's longer route and instead adopted the route in blue that had the pedestrian, upon leaving the first location, traveling north along Cesare Boulevard and then west along the North Service Road until reaching the second location. And the shorter route wasn't in accordance with the rules of the road, but a more practical route that utilized grassy strips along the service road where there were no sidewalks. And the appellate court concluded that this was the path of ordinary pedestrian travel. So the second case to support the county's position is ABC Liquors, Inc. versus Skaggs Albertsons. Uh, this is a 1977 case that takes place within Orange County and interprets Orange County code. Uh, this case specifically deals with the 5,000 foot distance separation requirement between alcohol package vendors uh, where such distance shall be measured by following the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel along the public thoroughfare, which is precisely the language that's at issue today. Uh, so in the ABC Liquors case, the zoning director had initially adopted a shorter route. Uh, this shorter route was then overturned by the trial court who adopted a longer route that required the pedestrian to first walk west, then north, and then back east. Uh, the appellate court then overturned the trial court's decision, uh, reasoning that a more logical approach would be more appropriate, and ultimately agreeing with the zoning director's determination on the measured route. And the appellate court in ABC Liquor's case uh, issued the rule that the county relies upon today, which is that the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel should mean that the measuring pedestrian upon leaving the main entrance of the first property follows public thoroughfares all the way to the shortest route from the public thoroughfare to the main entrance of the second property, from which point the pedestrian should directly follow that shortest route. And in its opinion, the appellate court and ABC Liquors noted that to require the pedestrian to first go westerly to get east when he can go northerly and easterly to get east is making him walk too far. So here we have an illustration of the routes in the ABC Liquors case. Um, this is again taken from the case opinion. So both routes begin at the Skaggs Albertsons property on the left side of the illustration. 
the uh, trial court adopted the route that's highlighted in red, which, uh, as you can see, requires the pedestrian uh, to first travel west to get to Kirkman Road, then travel north along Kirkman Road, and then back east along West Colonial Drive until ultimately reaching ABC Liquors, the second location. The appellate court, however, rejected this longer route, um, stating that it would be illogical to go west first and then north to ultimately go back east. And instead, the appellate court adopted the blue path initially calculated by the zoning director. So here, the county applied the rule from the ABC Liquors case to this case as the basis for its measured path. The aerial photos below show the shortest route along public thoroughfares from one main entrance to the other. And as you can see in the below photos, the pedestrian upon leaving the entrance of the liquor store travels north and east to get to the public thoroughfare, which is here, Clark Honeokoe Road. Uh, the pedestrian crosses the Clark Honeokoe Road and reaches the start of the shortest route to the main entrance of the second location here, the church, from which point the pedestrian directly follows that shortest route to the main entrance of the church. On the other hand, uh, the county contends that it would be illogical and impractical to utilize applicants' proposed path here, which has the pedestrian continuing east along Clarkona Coe Road, then heading north along the church's unimproved uh, gravel driveway and then back west to ultimately reach the main location of the uh, church. And I believe as uh, zoning director will emphasize the uh, church's private driveway here, the county does not consider a public thoroughfare uh, as that term is used under county code. All right, thank you. Somebody need to take that. <laughs> All right, just as a reminder, everybody <laughs> else, if you have uh, electronic devices, please put them on silence or turn them off. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just go over uh, a few more things here. So here's, uh, I'm just going to show you some photographs. This is essentially the front door of the proposed liquor store. And I'd like to note, you can see the signage is already up. There's nothing that says that you can't put signage up on a vacant business or that, it ha you know. So th that signage was up, has been up for, I believe, at least a year off the top of my head here. Um, but just so you're aware, it's not actually in there. It's a vacant space in there right now. Um, you can see there's a couple other tenants in this, in this building. But we essentially start at the front door of the liquor store. In this photo, you'd be heading left down the sidewalk. And then we cross the, the property. There is a crosswalk across, across Clare Kona, Ocoee Road, and there's also a traffic light there. So that is where staff crossed. You can see as you're going um, forward here that um, you know, there is a slight incline adjacent to the sidewalk uh, to go up onto that property, but I would define it as a slight inco incline going up onto that yard. Um, it is, once you get up on that, that grass yard, it's a fairly stable surface. I've myself have walked, walked it, um, as has Matt actually, in addition to several other staff members. This is the uh, driveway um, that the applicant contends um, should be the path to go up. Um, I would call this a semi-improved driveway. It looks like it might have some gravel, maybe have been, you know, had some gravel, maybe some asphalt fines at Millings or something at some point in time, but it, it is clearly a very unstable surface. Um, and so that's just looking north. And then this is basically kind of standing out in front of the church, looking back towards Clarecona Coe Road, showing both staff's path and then the applicant's proposed path, and then the liquor store is over to the right. This is, um, once you go up the, the driveway or cut, cut across that grass yard, you get to the, the church. This is to the left side of the church. You can see there's a sidewalk that runs, you know, along the left side. The, there is, the driveway further continues around to the left of the sidewalk, left side of that red dumpster there. And then as you wrap around on that sidewalk, this is the actual front door of the church. So staff recommended that the board uphold the zoning manager's determination uh, that the 857 feet is the correctly measured distance uh, between the two properties as identified in county code. 
Uh, we received one correspondence in favor of this request prior to the BZA and 47 correspondence in opposition to the request. Uh, 25 of those are actually unmapped. Uh, at the BZA hearing, the BZA concluded that the 857 feet is the correctly measured distance between the applicant's property and the subject religious institution, and um, the applicant subsequently appealed that recommendation, which is why we're here today. So the action requested before you today is to either deny the applicant's appeal and uphold the zoning manager's determination or grant the applicant's appeal and overturn the zoning manager's determination. And I'm available for questions if you have any. All right, thank you. Is the applicant uh, present? All right, I do uh, see Mr. Otterman coming forward. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Kurt Arden with the Fishback Dominic Law Firm, 1947 Lee Road, uh, Winter Park, Florida, 32789. What I first handed out to you is a PowerPoint I'm going to show you. I also gave to uh, the county clerk um, and the court reporter that, uh, that PowerPoint as well. I gave to the clerk and to the uh, court reporter the staff report that's in your packet, but because portions of it were illegible, I gave them a copy of that actual report. It was contained in the BZA uh, report. Um, this is not a comprehensive plan change. This is not a rezoning. It's not a variance. It's not a waiver. It's not a special exception. Uh, it's one issue, and that issue is that phrase that Jennifer read to you. Uh, and that phrase is critical, and it's actually been the subject of a lot of litigation. Your, your lawyer talked about some of those cases, and I'm going to talk about those cases because we think we agree with every one of the holdings in those cases. It's how your county attorney has applied it and how your zoning manager has applied it we think is, is wrong. Uh, this case is about the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel along a public thoroughfare and what that means. Um, county staff and the BZA have gone to highly unusual interpretation of the county code and they have twisted what this phrase means in order to deny this project, uh, deny this property owner, the property owner's right to use the property for what, what is allowed by the comp plan, future land use map, uh, and the zoning, by right. Um, I do have, where's my clicker here? Gotcha, thank you. There's the property. Uh, it was purchased in 2019. Uh, retail center, uh, you can see the uses there. The building was constructed in 2021. Two corrections from what was presented to you by staff in addition to the interpretation of the cases. Um, the, the request that we presented, our measurement, was modified during the BZA uh, to be consistent with what the zoning manager's walk was, except for the one piece of that travel across the open grassy field. We'll talk about that in just a second. That's the, the standard that Jennifer read to you. County staff, we think, made a mistake. Uh, this measurement uh, is the county's measurement. You've just seen that. That's the store. We're going to walk, if I would, just kind of like Jennifer did, but in a little more detail. That shows you at the far end of that, the, the package store. The sidewalk, you can see, is it coming towards you? This is walking along the sidewalk towards... Clarkona Okoe Road. We're approaching Clarkona Okoe in the sidewalk on this side. We get right to that roadway, take a right to go down 
the sidewalk as the code and the, the law require. We get down to the crosswalk. We start crossing the crosswalk towards the church. You can see the church in the distance behind the power pole and electric station. And when you get close, you can see that, that slight incline that Jennifer mentioned. We think it's not a slight incline. It's an embankment. And we think it's four to five to six feet high at certain points. Um, at this point, we think is where the county's measuring pedestrian, the person that walks these and measures these distances, made a mistake. Um, they went straight across that in an as the crow flies distant. They just went from point A at this location, which was proper up to this point, straight across an open field, up the embankment, through a potted field uh, to, to the church sidewalk. So that was the improper portion of it. And I'll show you a little more detail in a, in a second. The problem here is your county code does not define what that phrase, the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel along a public thoroughfare, means. It doesn't do it. And it's not just our county. It's a lot of cities and counties across the state that do not define uh, in any greater uh, detail than what just the language says. Uh, but the county's measuring pedestrian ignored those obstructions, um, and this is what you'll see in the field. It's hard to see, but there's also a swale in that field. There's also uh, divots and potholes. You can see a young row of trees that was, cons uh, that was planted. The county, yeah, the definition of a pedestrian, what is a pedestrian? Although the county code does not have one, it's according to the statutory definitions. Any person afoot and by custom is understood to include a, a person in a wheelchair, on skates, or on a skateboard, um, as well as a person on a foot-powered scooter. We got a, a civil engineer of Morris Engineering. He issued the, the attached letter, and he actually determined in, in his letter that this was, in fact, I'll, I'd like to read that to you. An open, unimproved field is not an acceptable pedestrian access. That's, that's again, where the, the point where the county measuring pedestrian, the zoning manager, and the BZA aired when they went from this point straight across the field through, the, through this area up to the church uh, sidewalk. So this is the measurement we think is accurate, is the appropriate, and required by law. You can see we agree down south of, below the clark kona Road there, that we have the same measurement and same distance using the sidewalks that the county did. We have the same measurement, same distance going across clark kona Road. Where the purple dot is on the north side of clark kona Road is where the, where the county, we think, aired. You can see the embankment right there in front of, if you follow the county's uh, distance and route, you have to climb up that embankment. Clearly wheelchairs and walkers and people that are challenged would have a much diff more difficult time, if at all, to be able to make that. The proper measurement would to take a right, just like we did, just like the county did on the south side, along the sidewalk. And this is that walk. So we're walking now along Clarkonia Okoe Road after we have crossed it, coming down to the church's driveway. Uh, we get to the driveway. That's the driveway up to the church that, that is utilized by the church. So the, the, the civil engineer of Morris Engineering also made the following determination. Granted, he's not a planner and he's not a commissioner, but he is an engineer and he deals with these types of uh, things a lot. He says, also, according to Orange County Codes, the pedestrian access points shall be located at the earliest point of off-site pedestrian walkway contact, the closest point on the property that meets the, this requirement and serves as pedestrian access Access is the driveway from the church to the public sidewalk along Clarkona Okoe Road. He cites to um, he cites to uh, portions of, of the code. 
Um, Orange County actually provides for improved walkways for pedestrians. Does not contemplate open grass fields through swales or up and down embankments as sidewalks, sidewalks or access ways. So it's curious. The county uh, zoning department and BZA found that that was an appropriate way to measure or go. Uh, also, county code says that pedestrian walkways shall be constructed of concrete, stamped or textured concrete or asphalt. Other material may be approved by the development engineering manager, but bricks and pavers shall not be used within the five-foot minimum pedestrian walkway on any public right-of-way. Here's where we agree. You can see the two circled areas of the measurement. Here's where we disagree, and we think the county's measuring distance was wrong. This is the correct measurement according to the code as interpreted by the case law. So the case law. Um, first case law, Albrecht, the court upheld that the measurement must be along improved walkway or driveway. That's, and your county attorney agrees with that, even when the main entrance is closer to the public road. So you look here, that's the subject location. You see the little flange up to the north of the, the block building there? That walkway is an improved walkway, and they used that because it was the walkway improved. The actual store is closer to the uh, Fletcher uh, Drive to the south, but they used the, where the improvement was. Uh, Skaggs, and Skaggs Albertson, very familiar with that case, as we represented ABC and joined with the county in opposing Skaggs Albertson's interpretation. We agree with the Florida Supreme Court ruling here. Um, what does it mean, ordinary pedestrian travel along the public thoroughfare from main entrance to main entrance? Here, the county attorney fails to note that in this case, the store had a parking lot on the north and east side of the store. Therefore, it was proper to measure at the closest point where that parking lot was. So I've highlighted the ABC store to the, on the right and the east, and on the west, that's the Skaggs Alperton store at the intersection of Kirkman and Highway 50. So the proper measurement would be as soon as you hit the improved part of the Skaggs Albertson, the parking lot there, because it was all a parking lot. It was not a designated pathway. So that is a proper measurement and is completely consistent with our understanding and ruling in, the, uh, in this case. Uh, the Brentwood case, I think this is pretty important and is pretty, pretty much on point for the following reasons. Um, this, is, this case is just like the case here today. The Brentwood case involves the route of ordinary pedestrian travel and it measuring, measuring as the crow flies across private property and streets is not allowed. So I'm going to show you four slides. The first four are what the beverage, uh, I'm sorry, what the church building, you see the lower right is the church, upper left there is the package store. So the church argued against, uh, against the package store because it was too close, they said. Well, this is what the church argued. You, the, the, the yellow line there shows it cutting across private property and then as the crow flies, a diagonal across the north-south street down by the, down by the church. That was improper, the court held. This next case, or the next scenario, the next route is as the crow flies from the front entrance of the package store across down to the front entrance of the church. The court said that was inappropriate, across private property and across rights of way. The, the, the next measurement that the church argued was, well, you could just go east over to the roadway, south down to, to the... Oh, uh, do a diagonal cut across over to the church. That was improper because there was no improved access on, on the package store property. You had to go to the west where it was improved. And finally, they, the, the church argued, oh, we'll just take this route, pretty much what the, what the package store and the beverage commission said was appropriate, until you get to the very lower right, and then they cut it a diagonal across the road to get to the, to get to the front entrance of the church. The court said that was wrong because you can't just cut across at a diagonal on the street. This is what the court approved, an only approved route after five different scenarios, which is completely consistent with what we pr provided here. Um, they cite to Jack Schlicker saying it's permissible because the shortest pedestrian travel is used using grassy strips. That's the only case where, uh, where they say grassy strips were okay, and the only reason it is okay there is because there was no other improved pathway, no sidewalk, no path, nothing. So the only way to measure between, uh, between the two points and the two main entrances there is you had to walk on a grassy strip. So only when there's nothing else 
available. When there's no improvement, must you use, the, uh, or are you allowed to use a grassy strip? Cases across the country support it. Um, and, and I think um, across the state of Florida are all consistent with us. The staff in BZA have twisted and manipulated the definition of what constitutes ordinary pedestrian travel. It means to exclude people in wheelchairs that use walkers or adult tricycles and those on bicycles, people with vertigo and other ordinary people. Please correct the erroneous decision below which excludes people to a decision now which is legal and inclusive for the benefit of all citizens in this area, not just those of us fortunate enough to have to, uh, not to have to use wheelchairs or walkers or adult tricycles or bicycles and to fairly and properly apply the county code consistent with the law and not twist the code, we respectfully request that you deny the BZA's recommendation, uphold the zoning man which upheld the zoning manager's determination and determined the distance between the main entrance of the package store and the main entrance of the church exceeds 1,000 uh, feet. I'd like to reserve my remaining time for a rebuttal. Thank you. All right. You've got about a minute and 28 seconds left then. Uh, with that, um, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Yes, Mayor. I have uh, 40 speaker cards. How many? 40. Four, Four zero. zero? Four zero. Okay. All right. So uh, what we'll, we'll ask you all to do is, I don't know that it's necessary for us to hear all 40, but if there's a way for you to... Uh, perhaps yield your time to a speaker who may speak uh, consistently with the position that you hold, uh, then we can move through this process uh, much more efficiently. Um, so what that would mean is, again, those of you who uh, are here, let's say if you support the zoning manager's decision to deny uh, the, um, the distance requirement, meaning that it's, it's too short. If you're on that side uh, of the, uh, the decision, then I'm asking you to perhaps yield some of your time to that group. If uh, you believe that the zoning manager has erred and uh, the applicant's position that the distance should be a greater distance if you're on that side, if you're willing to yield your time to someone who can speak, uh, we get to the same, we will understand how many people yielded their time and we're going to essentially say the same thing uh, on both sides of, of the coin here. So that makes sense to you. Uh, so uh, let's see if we can try to figure this out to move forward because we do have a, a lot on the agenda this afternoon. So uh, I'm going to do something I don't normally do, but those of you who uh, believe that it should be denied by a show of hand, would you just kind of show me uh, the hands? Okay. Okay, out of the 40. The, and by, when I say deny, that means that you would deny, you would say it's, it's too short of a distance from the church to move forward with the, the application. Okay, you, meaning you would not want the liquor store present. Okay, all right. Now, just put your all's hands down. Those of you who uh, believe that the liquor sh store should be granted the opportunity uh, to open up because it meets the distance requirements. Let's see your hands. Okay. So clearly that's a much smaller group. So by because I asked you to show the hands, you understand kind of now the dilemma that we have. Since so many of you are in opposition, if you can yield your time you can have an appropriate per person speak on your behalf. We all kind of know where we are. If you uh, are in the opposite corner, this is your choice, but you too can uh, choose to uh, have someone speak on your time. And what will happen is uh, we would ask um, our timekeeper to try to uh, understand who's been given what time and uh, then we can move through this process much more efficiently. Uh, 
if that makes sense to all of you. I'm just trying to manage all of our time here this afternoon. Mayor, all right. Mayor, so, if I might just uh, make a suggestion, I noticed that the pastor is here, and I see the president of the Pine Hills Community Council, and so maybe if those who are wanting to speak could yield their time to one or the other, because I mean, I'm sure you guys have other things you want to do unless you want to sit through 80 minutes of public comment just in opposition and probably another 40 minutes of, in favor. Um, that might be an option for folk yielding to okay. the president of Pine Hills Council or the pastor of the church. So, so um, I will, it's a suggestion. We're not directing you to do uh, any of uh, what has been suggested. They're just suggestions to you to, to move forward. So uh, if... Uh, we can take a moment, kind of take a deep breath here, and uh, figure out which side you're lining up on. Uh, then we can move through in an orderly manner. Okay. All right. So uh, of those who would be opposed, uh, how many of you are willing to yield your time to a spokesperson? Okay. Raise your hands. Okay. All right. So... Those in support, how many of you are willing to, uh, by say support, that means the opening of the liquor store, uh, how many of you are willing to yield some time? Okay. We have a few who are willing to yield time who are in support. Uh, so let's see if we can't figure that out. All right, so first up, Mayor, is uh, Pastor Sims, and I have uh, four others that were, are, have already yielded their time to Pastor Sims. So I'm going to call out your name just so I can keep track of the cards of those that are yielding their time. First one is John Hadley. Can you raise your hand? Are you here? Mr. Hadley? Here. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, Tan Tooks. Thank you. Uh, Athea Robinson. Thank you. Uh, Linda Chisholm. Thank you. And then Mr. Moore um, said he was going to yield his time to the pastor as well. Okay. So that means, um, Pastor, you'll have seven minutes total. Okay. Is there anyone else willing to will yield their time to the pastor? Okay. Uh, if you can just say your name uh, very quickly. Gerald Jackson. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone else yielding their time to the pastor? Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay, I think I st there is one hand. What is your name? Mary Ann Stewart. Okay, Mary Ann Stewart the to the okay. pastor. Okay, is there anyone else? Okay, there's another hand going up yielding time to the pastor. What is your name, please? Okay. And Josephine and Mahoney. Okay. Okay, and there's another hand going up. Uh, there's someone yielding time to. Did you say Vicky Vargo? Okay. There's someone yielding time to Vicky Vargo. Miss Vargo, are you in 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 the audience? Okay, she's in the back. Okay. And. Uh, your, your name, sir? James Okay, and now do we have anyone yielding time uh, to anyone who's, I'm not sure which side Ms. Vargo is on, but Ms. Vargo, uh, were you pro or con in this case? She said, she said she's supporting the staff and BZA decision. Okay. All right. So I'm going to put her in the opposition category. Uh, okay. So, okay. The position that Mr. Arderman was espousing, uh, how many people are here for that position? 
that was in support of the liquor store. I'm going to put it like that. Okay. How many people, again, are willing to yield any time to that group? Okay. So we have a couple of people who will raise a hand. You're willing to yield your time to whom? To Mr. Arderman. So Mr. Arderman has two people who are willing to yield their time. If you filled out a card, would you just say your name so that we can kind of keep track of that? May, Mayor, may I just ask Mr. Arderman if the gentlemen sitting next to him are part of the applicant? applicant appellant's team if so that his time is 50 minutes includes you know the, the whole okay. team if the, okay then, then then that would not be additional time because then they would be part of the the applicant's team uh, do we have others willing to yield time okay so with that then let's start with the pastor okay. so I have uh, Total of nine folks dedicating their time to the pastor. He'll have a total of 11 minutes. All right, Pastor. If you will go to the microphone here, we just ask you to state your name and address for the record. And, uh, Pastor, because of the yielding of time, you know, it appears you have 11 minutes. Doesn't mean you. <laughs> It should take all 11 minutes. You can. Uh, but we're not going to let you go over the 11 minutes, okay? <laughs> all, right. all right, Pastor. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Demings, and to the Board of County Commissioners. Um, and it would be my intent not to need all 11 minutes, but we'll, we shall see. Um, you, you know, Remember your name and uh, the address. Yes, my name is Pastor Landis D. Sims. Uh, 6225 Clara Corner Corey Road uh, is the address of Fellowship Baptist Church. Um, and I stand here today not only as the pastor, but also as a member and a leader in our okay, community. Okay, now, Joe, you can start the clock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor. You can start the clock. Now, all right, Pastor. Okay. Um, listen, what I want to say at a minimum is threefold. Uh, I heard our brother, uh, Brother Ar Arderman, um, give an argument uh, regarding the path. I believe that the county has professionals who are subject matter experts on this matter. I believe that they have measured on more than one occasion. The church is less than a thousand feet from a house of worship. I've had the privilege of speaking with the owner. So has my father. And in those meetings, we reasonably agreed with some of the premises I'm going to outline for you today. That church has been in that place on that 14 and a half acres some 30 years. I'm a business owner myself, and I'm pro-business. I want to support our brothers and sisters who want to open up businesses in the community that will have a positive effect in the community, that it will be about economic development. This business does not pose any economic development benefit. It will not create jobs. It will not create jobs at a livable wage. It will not do anything. It would take, the, it would take withdrawals from the community and make no positive deposits. Not only that, as a business person, you have to do your due diligence. They knew the church was there. You describe it as going up a six-foot embankment. That sounds majestic, but that's not the case. It is a slight incline, as the county has pointed out. Now, when you did your due diligence, you made a decision to try to open up your liquor store there anyway. To me, while I love you, my brother and sister, that is the height of arrogance to do so. And they're doing so knowing and in knowledge that they could get their way. Now again, I believe that if we're going to make any consideration, if we're going to deviate against a county uh, law or ordinance or requirement, we should do so in cases and matters that will benefit the community. The people in the Pine Hills community are here, and 40 of them signed up to speak. That lets you know that overwhelmingly 
that this community does not want this liquor store. And you know what? I don't want to just give an emotional argument or an argument that's just based on my feelings and my emotions. But those of you who want stats and statistics, I want you to know that the CDC says that approximately 88,000 people in America die every year because of alcohol abuse. As if that stat and statistic or that death toll is not enough to sway you, a study published in the Journal, in the journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs, they say that communities with a proliferation of liquor stores in the community have higher rates of crime. We have at least, and I may get this number wrong, but at least a minimum of 15 liquor stores in Pine Hills right now today. There's no shortage of spaces and places for somebody who wants to get something to drink, they can go get it. It doesn't have to be a thousand feet outside of our church door. The second thing is, no, let me see. Pine Hills already has 30 liquor stores, perhaps, and maybe this owner owns about 15 liquor stores already. Okay, so, Pastor, I have to interrupt you just for a yes, moment. Sir. To maintain the decorum, yes, sir. only the speaker can speak. Uh, the others in the audience, while you're sitting in the audience, you cannot make noise, you cannot clap, uh, so that is your warning. Otherwise... Uh, after being warned, we will have the deputy sheriffs escort you out. We want you to be present, so we want you to follow the rules to, so that we maintain the quorum through this process. Thank you very much. Pastor. Yes, and please govern ourselves accordingly. We do not want that. Just smile. Furthermore, you got six minutes left here. <laughs> I think I could go on and on about all the stats and statistics that support our argument. I think that I've given an argument regarding economic development, supposed economic empowerment, and that this doesn't suit that case. But let's just talk about the purpose and why we have statutes such as this protecting. The church is a hospital. Everybody who comes in, in tennis is sick, have something we all are dealing with is a place where we'll go to find solace, and that is sacred. I believe the county, and I have an expectation that the county will uphold the statutes and the ordinance that we have to protect the sanctity of places that are houses of worship, that we won't have crime running rampant outside the church's doors. Pine Hills is a wonderful community, and we want the same respect that other more affluent communities might have in situations and circumstances such as this. The last thing that I want is for people to exit after worshiping, and the first thing they see is something that speaks to their weakness. The first thing that they see is something that speaks to things that somebody is struggling with. We have this policy in place for a reason, and it is disrespectful, and I do take it, and I am offended slightly by it, because it seems like the height of arrogance that you would seek to get around those statues, especially because it's a house of worship. Now again, and I'm going to really make y'all happy because I don't think I'm going to use all my time, but I want to make sure that you understand what I am saying. I look forward to partnering with this business owner. The business owner has a laundromat there. The business owner does have a vape shop there. You don't see me arguing against that. People have a right to choose. I'm not trying to put a chilling effect on his, business, on his ability to do business in the community. It has to be the right type of business. It has to be keeping with the, in keeping with the county statutes and ordinance, and this is not that case. Now, we can have an argument about the, the negative impact of such things, but I want you to hear me. I'm just asking us to do what is right. Dr. King says that injustice anywhere is an enemy to justice everywhere. I want your people, your constituents to walk out of this, out of this hall, out of, out, of this, out of this meeting in this space, in this place with you, feeling good about those elected officials that they put in office and support the people. And it's not a matter of whether you're, what your faith background is, whatever you believe, wherever you worship. My argument is that we want to protect that space and place for you. Now, listen, God bless you. I'm done. 
I'm yielding four minutes back to whoever needs it. All right. Thank you, Pastor, so much. All right. And with that, we're going to move to uh, the next uh, set of speakers. I'm going to go to, um, I believe it was Ms. Vargo. Uh, the applicant will go last. Uh, and before I go to the applicant, I'll check and see if there are uh, any others that wanted to speak. Uh, Ms. Vargo. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Vicki Vargo, 3800 Wingfoot Court, Orlando, Florida, 32808. I'm here today to support staff and the Board of Zoning and Adjustment. Staff are recognized as experts in their field. They know how to measure distances in these cases, and they have made their decision based on substantial, competent evidence. Staff did not just look at a paper. Staff actually walked the site as an ordinary person then she determined that an ordinary person could more easily walk from the crosswalk at the street to the church by a straight line over a grassy knoll than a steep path further down the street, which ser serves as a steep driveway made of slippery, unsafe materials of loose gravel and small patches of asphalt here and there. People in wheelchairs, skateboards, with walkers cannot use that driveway. Staff made the determination that the applicant's path was no more stable than their own path over a grassy knoll. It is not a stable surface. Staff testified that she felt uncomfortable walking on the loose materials as she tried to walk down the the applicant has not produced any testimony or evidence that would overcome the substantial, competent legal test to overturn the BZA decision. I'm asking you to please deny the appeal. Due to the extraordinary number of liquor stores in the Pine Hills area, I'm asking you to also place a moratorium on liquor stores in the zip codes of 32808 and 32818 until the county can establish an overlay district prohibiting and reducing the number of liquor stores in these two zip codes. All right, thank you, Ms. Vargo. Um, and now, uh, Ms. Fatma Hall, you're coming forward. I think someone yielded time to you. And uh, Ms. Fatma Hall, just remember name and address as you come forward. And let's see how many people do we have who have yielded time to her. We, I see one, two, three. Um. Okay, so if you didn't fill out a card, if you have, uh, we, we're going to trust you today. Uh, so she's got three people that I see who are yielding time to her. Okay, and there's a couple more back here. Four or five. Hi. Um, yeah, if you can uh, say your names, please. Dennis Hall. Dennis Hall? Natalie Bell. Natalie Bell. And the names from the back. And Hill Mitchell. And I saw a couple of hands up on this side. What were the names? Can you hear that? I didn't catch that. Okay, thing. I'm not sure. Uh, Miss Singh. Okay, Miss Singh, and and was there someone else? Got it, Joe. Christian and then Diaz. we have Mr. Diaz, right? Okay, ma'am. And then we. It's a total of six, six folks. Okay. So, Ms. Hall, six people, a couple with her time. Okay. Ms. Hall, you have eight minutes. Am I going to get the same speech, Mayor? I don't have to take all eight <laughs> minutes. <laughs> good afternoon, Mayor Demons. Good afternoon, Board of County Commissioners. 
My name is Sandra Fatme Hall. I reside at 7267 Hiawassee Oak Drive. I stand before you this afternoon as the president of the Pine Hills Community Council. That's the advocacy group for over 81,000 residents of Pine Hills. We are here for year number three, and we're here to make it very clear to everyone that's yielded their time to me to deny the applicant's appeal and uphold the zoning manager's determination. I don't know if you all were listening, but some of the words that I heard today, and I've been here all three years, but today I heard twist the code, proper measurement, they were wrong, county errored, and on and on and on. I'm actually appalled because as you've heard, um, the pastor say that the individuals that did the measurement or work for Orange County are presumed experts. So this is not the Bible where you get to interpret it however you feel like on any given day that it suits you that way. This is the shortest distance and you've heard it over and over again. You've seen videos, you've seen pictures. We in the Pine Hills community are very adamant that the county has done their job. Prior to opening, it was 843 feet. After opening, the measurement, which you've seen up here so many times, 857 feet. That is what it is. Um, the Orlando Sentinel has reported on the most dangerous neighborhoods in Orange County. And they talk about the effects of liquor stores and establishments that sell alcohol in African-American communities. The conclusions are that an abundance of establishments that sell spirits in the concentrated areas promotes criminal behavior from petty theft to homicides. It can't be any more clear that although it's a business, you have to meet the distance requirement. That's why we're all here today. The distance requirement is not met. It's not that you can't open that particular business in front of a church, but it does not meet the distance requirement. No more liquor stores in our communities. That would be number 15. I think we have enough in a less than 10 mile radius. And everyone that has spoken to me, whether by phone or text, has made it very clear that they want it to be understood that we're advocating on behalf of this community, not just some things, everything for this community that makes us a better place to live, work, and play. So I think it's very important as we speak to Mayor Demins today and the Board of County Commissioners that it's clear I'm representing 81,000 plus people. Have they all called? No. But that's what I stand here representing in front of you today. And we do not, under any circumstances, support this appeal. We want it to be denied, and that would benefit our entire community. So thank you for your time. Hope we have helped to make a difference, and keep those words in mind. Orange County, I think you're doing a good job. Let's not fail us today. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fatman Hall. Fatman Hall. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Carwise. Good afternoon. And I'm, I am a 30-year homeowner and resident at Carolina's Estate. I live at 6843 Rubens Court, Orlando. And hopefully before the um, session is over, there, there's a video that we have prepared. And to my understanding, um, he doesn't have it. But I'll describe in my talking what the video is about. Um, thank you for the opportunity to stand before you today. And I agree that the zoning manager and staff are presumed to be experts as well. Um, there's maps and code of um, ordinances that the county uh, uses to govern the distance between alcohol package stores and religious institutions. The required distance between the two establishments is 1,000 feet, as we know. And per the Orange County Zoning Department, the shortest distance from the liquor store is 857 feet. As a tax-paying citizen, of Orange County, I choose to accept the zoning director and their department's approved measurement standards and their governing policies and procedures. I feel confident that they know how to measure and it is their responsibility and we trust them as residents and we believe that they're capable and competent every day. 
So what makes today's challenge different? Why do we not trust them today? The expert staff made a decision based on the competent substantial evidence by visiting the church site and walking the shortest route by grass that an ordinary person would walk. Well, I'm an ordinary person. I'm 62 years old. And I'm considered moderate and in good health. Fellowship Baptist Church has been my voting precinct for many years. To get to my voting precinct, I walk. When I walk, I take the shortest distance in the grass. And I have a video to prove it. And not only do I have a video to prove it, but some of my other colleagues that are my age and older can also demonstrate it. I didn't need the zoning committee or anyone else to tell me what the shortest distance was, the quickest or the safest. I've never All walked right. the entrance or the entrance, Thank the exit you very to much. enter the, the Fellowship Baptist Church. Let me you, make one exception. You have run, run out of Someone time. Someone yielded their time to me. Well, wait a minute. We didn't capture that. Who, who, who yielded time to you? Okay. We didn't capture name, that. <laughs> okay. Can I get your name, sir? Frederick White. Okay. You're yielding your time, Mr. White? Okay. All right. So do we have anybody else yielding time to her? Okay. So you got about a minute left. Okay, I'm going. All right. Um, I was saying that I never walked the in entrance or the exit except for to, to prepare for this. And out of pure curiosity, I walked and I timed it across the grass that I take versus the proposal that Mr. A. Kirk Ardeman of North Store is proposing. I conducted my own um, survey, and I went from the liquor store. I actually started timing once I crossed the street, and it only took me two minutes and 14 seconds across the, the grass, which is what I walk, versus going the entrance that he used, and it took five minutes and 17 seconds. I stand before you today to say since the zoning county department are presumed experts, and I believe them, and the residents that I, I represent and I live with and near, we're in agreement with the zoning board's measurement of 857 feet. Thank you. All right. You got it right in under the wire now. All right. Next speaker. So I'm just double checking. Do you, did anyone yield time to you? No. Okay. So okay. you have two minutes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Gina Abel Barnes. I reside at 6530 Whirlaway Circle, Orlando 32818. I am a proud resident and small business owner in the Pine Hills clock, community. Joe. <laughs> Sorry, man. Keep going. Pine Hills is a diverse, vibrant, and proud community. As a small business owner and a resident, I am an advocate for positive and helpful economic growth for the community. The distance is a concern, and that's why we're here today. And I agree with upholding the zoning manager's determination that the distance is too short for this establishment. The main concern is the type of business that's being opened here in our community. We need businesses that will uplift and benefit our community, such as medical offices, services for our children, for our youth, as well as services that can provide community resources. This community, regardless of the distance from the church, from any other businesses, does not need this type of business. I agree with the county to uphold the zoning manager's determination that the distance is too short for this type of establishment to be opened. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to move to the next speaker, please. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Dallas. Um, I live at uh, 5626 North Powers Drive. I'm more, more than sure, I don't have to, have to ask, but I'm more than sure you probably see me out picking up trash. I'm on a, on a bicycle, sometimes a scooter or whatever. And I can just tell you this. Everything that I've heard today is, I mean, from, every, from everybody else in the community, I agree with. But I can also say this. For nine years, me and my family, my, my wife and my daughter, we've, We've done exactly what was said 
we've actually gone to the church. That's where we vote at. There's, we've actually been to church there a few times. And actually, we go across uh, uh, Claricona Coy, and we go, go across the grassy knoll. Now, just, just to be fair, I walked the other route before, and I, I happened to go over there by myself, and it is quite dangerous. It's a lot of potholes, and it's millage. It's, it, it's like asphalt that's been ground up, and it's almost like you're walking on, on, on skates. I mean, so it's very slippery. But the distance, again, is what we're talking about. We're not here to try to do anything other than we're talking about the facts. Laws are in place for a reason. Speed limits are in place for a reason. And when you break them, then there's, there's consequences. Well, with this, we don't have to worry about that because if everybody does what they're supposed to do, they're going to go strictly by what's written and what the laws are. And I just want to say that we're all trying to make our area the very best place that we can make it. And I see everybody out here pulling in the same direction. I can just say this. If you can give me one, one reason that would be a good idea to put a liquor store there, then I, I would change my mind. But I can tell you right now, you can't. So let's go against this thing. We don't want it. And let's just do the right thing and get this thing done so we don't have to keep coming back and forth. But because if we have to keep coming back and forth, I guarantee you every single one of us will keep coming back. Have a good day. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Remember to give us your name and address for the record. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Althea Sabani. I reside at 6455 Long Breeze Road. I live in the subdivision that faces that liquor store sign. Um, I've been there 24 years. Um, I love my community. Uh, as, far, as far as with the zoning, the church next door has been a blessing. We've had meetings at that church. We, I've walked up that same grass to go to the church, to the front of the church. And um, that pavement, uh, forgive me, uh, Pastor, it's a little rough and you can't get a, a wheelchair um, or any, uh, anything else up that the driveway. I've driven up that driveway also. Um, as a resident, I mean, um, the liquor store, our children, I raised two sons in that neighborhood. Our children, the first thing they see when they come out to that bus stop is a liquor. And I just, I just don't understand how many liquor stores we need. Three blocks down, the Walmart, the Walmart market has liquor. And it's just it's disrespectful, the fight that this... Uh, this business person is trying to uphold, and all the residents speak up against it. Um, 24 years, hard work, I put in my home, and at the chance of him opening up a liquor store, he makes money, and he pulls money out of my pocket. How fair is that for me? I mean, I work hard, and I've raised my sons over there, and like I said, it's just, I, I, it's not something that we want in the neighborhood. And I uphold uh, the, the zoning manager. They know what they're talking about. Like I said, I take that route my sons have walked that route back when they were younger to go play basketball right there on the church property. Um, we want good things in our community. We don't want these um, liquor stores and other things. Uh, so that's all I really have to say as far as that. Uh, thank you very much for your presence this afternoon. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Mayor, staff. My name is Marjorie Hutto. I live in the subdivision across the street, 5616 Long Lake Hills. I'm not going to be redundant on what everybody stated. It just seems to me that we're getting into words. Mr. Hardeman, you stated that the open field is not a pedestrian access. When the code is rewritten, that should be added then, not now. That's something that when the county, when the code is rewritten, that verbiage should be added then, not now. Everybody have a nice day. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor and board members, I am Cheryl Soriano and I reside in the Carolina States Subdivision, 26, I mean 6612 Aladdin Drive. Um, I spoke with Mr. Salim and his relatives or co-partners several months ago, back in April, and we talked about the liquor store. 
And I told him that at that moment, I was representing <coughs> residents around the area. And when we talked about it, the entire group voted unanimously that we did not want a liquor store in our neighborhood. I even suggested other types of businesses that could be operated out of that facility. And I asked them to please take that under consideration. No, you won't make $10,000 a day that you would make in the sale of liquor, but you would benefit the community, whether it be a hardware store, whether it be an ice cream store, whether it be a you know, medical facility, something that would benefit our community, we would have no problems with. But when you think in terms of our children getting off of a school bus right in front of the liquor store, when you think in terms of other businesses around us, we're trying to uphold our community and make it stronger, not weaker. And the more stores that, of liquor that we have in our area is not benefiting our community. So my question is, Mr. Salim, what part of no don't you understand? You have been denied three times already, and here we are today, and you are questioning the zoning board's measurements. Those measurements stand, and I stand behind them. Therefore, I'm asking that the board accept the measurements and that they will deny the recommendation of that plaintiff. All right, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Just remember your name and address for the record. Good afternoon, uh, Dexter Watts, uh, 683 Rembrandt Drive. Um, I agree with staff's uh, Come measurements. Come closer to that microphone. Um, there. <laughs> I agree with staff's uh, measurements and recommendations uh, about the distance. Um, I feel that it would be going down a slippery slope to allow the applicant to go through so much, so many um, mathematical gymnastics to get the distance greater than that 1,000 feet. And that concludes my comment. All right, and thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Cara Blanco, 6016 Montel Court, 32810. For once, I'm in agreement with the county's assessment of distance unlike its determination in the noise ordinance, I had to. So there's a term in urban planning called desired path, which essentially means that no matter the hardscape in place, a pedestrian, an ordinary pedestrian travel, will take the shortest, most practical route when the destination is clearly in sight, that liquor store. In neuroscience, this normal behavior is called wayfinding or cognitive mapping, and that's calculating that shortest route. I'm short but I can clearly see the liquor store and the crosswalk from the sidewalk on the west side of the church. As an ordinary pedestrian, I am not walking down that janky, busted driveway, no offense to Pastor Stems, that adds more time to my jaunt to the liquor store. As an ordinary pedestrian, I will walk through that church's well-maintained grass with a gradual, gentle, downward slope to the liquor store, a route which aligns with the zoning manager's assessment. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Good afternoon, everyone, Good mayor, afternoon. Uh, commissioners, I, uh, uh, people in attendance. I represent Name 20 and address for the record. Uh, 6422 <laughs> Bay of Mine Lane, Orlando, 32810. I represent 24 years of uh, residency, and it's, uh, Baymont is right behind where that proposal that we're saying no to is trying to go to. I listen to representatives of the liquor store, uh, and I mean, the county did their job, and I know the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But I listen to the representatives just redirect. I was like, how far are they going to go? We can go a few miles if we go that way longer. We can just do all that. But the bottom line is that we're saying no. And they spoke for, <clears throat> the county spoke for the county, the representatives of the liquor store spoke for them. 
I speak for the residents. I speak for the residents. They're trying to force something on the residents, taxpaying residents, that they're saying no to. So they keep trying to force it. They're saying no, no, no. And you guys are here, out of respect, to hear what we're saying. We're staring in here with all we have, saying no again. I know you guys want to represent the liquor store, but maybe in your neighborhood. I don't know. But we, as residents of that place, are saying no. No. You're not going to get business from us anyhow. We don't want it there. So we say no. Thank you. Depending right. on you guys. Uh, thank you for your comments. All right. So before I go to uh, Mr. Arderman and the applicant, are there others in the audience who want to speak who support the zoning manager's decision? I would ask you to come forward now if, if you want to speak. Okay. I see a hand that is... Okay. Okay. So do we have anyone in the audience who is supporting the applicant uh, to allow the liquor store to uh, open in the a place that has been uh, identified. Uh, Mayor, Mr. Acosta, did you want to? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, Ms. Mr. Uh, Otto Acosta. Acosta. And there was, I think, another hand up back that we're going to call them. Mr. Acosta. Okay. Carl Minion? Yes, sir. Okay, I have your card as well. Welcome to go over. Yes, sir, Mr. Acosta, Ooh. if you would give your name and address for the record, and then you can give the rest of your testimony. No, here's, here's three. Good afternoon. My name is Ara Acosta. I live in Willow Hill. It's about off uh, Hayawasi. I lived there for 87, 80, since 1987. Um, I know most of my neighbors because since... 1987. Now, every time we have an occasion uh, among the tenants, among the neighbors, we have to then go to the next liquor store, which happened to be in Apapka. In Apapka, the next liquor store to our neighborhood, or the other one is right west in 50. Now, you know that the traffic is not easy. Now, that creates for us a, a hard time. If we want to have a, a drink, we should have a drink. Okay? And now, since uh, I live there, I talk to all my neighbors, and we all agree that we need a liquor store because it's close to us, and the other one is in a pop car. That's the only thing I have to say. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Acosta. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Just as a re reminder, name and address for the record, please. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Carl Minion. I live at 5518 Heber Drive in Claricona. I'm here because I live in the area. I will shop at him. He's a small business and a zones commercial, which is rare for that side of town. I heard a lot of talk about Pine Hills. I live in Claricona. Apopka's right across the, of the uh, Hiawassee. Up the road is Ocoee. Also, Lockhart's not far away either. More people drink than don't drink. And I don't want to shake your world, but not everyone who drinks is an alcoholic. I enjoy some of the nice things in life, and, and my means and wine is one of them. I do like a nice wine, I, and I see uh, people out there that are sharply dressed. You appreciate some of the nicer things in life, too. I, I, I applaud you. That's a great feeling. As far as I lived here a long time, and a lot of people say they have, too, I have not seen in any other many uh, photos of the property, a footpath 
going up to the church. Uh, I wouldn't walk that hill. It's sandy. I'm not saying I couldn't, but I'd rather walk. Okay, Deacon, it's on you. Please fix your driveway. Uh, I, I, I would rather walk that than walk up and risk twisting my ankle in deep sand up, up more than an incline. It's a hill. So uh, I'm in favor of the uh, variance. Uh, I thank you for your time. All right. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presence. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Okay. If there are no other speakers, I'm going to go back to Mr. Arteman. Uh, Mr. Arteman had a balance of time, I uh, believe it was a minute and 28 seconds, or somewhere in that range. All right, Mr. Arteman. Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, a lot of folks, a lot of passion. Um, what, you, what you heard was they don't like the use. They don't want a package store. Your county code allows it. These folks bought their property in 2019. That was allowed. The only issue here is, is what the county code says and what that means. So, so it's important to protect everybody's rights. The issue of use was long ago dealt with and disposed of. To use an interpretation of the county code now to, to achieve what the folks, a lot of the folks here today said, that would compromise the private property rights, the county code, and our, our Florida and federal constitution is not appropriate. I understand the feelings, but these, these folks invested a lot of money in doing this, and they believed that this property and the zoning allowed that. Um, 5,000 feet is this package <laughs> store separation. That's about a mile, so there's no package store within that distance. Uh, the staff and BZA making a unique and extraordinary interpretation, not based on the codes, but to get around the code. Uh, clearly, the county's route across the field is not acceptable from an engineering standpoint. You had that a letter. It's also not ADA compliant by any stretch. F finally, um, in interpreting the ordinary pedestrian travel staff and one of the BZA members during the BZA hearing stated they did not think physically challenged pedestrians such as folks in walkers, wheelchairs, or others with difficulties, including vertigo, right. so should Mr. be considered Arden, in determining I'm the shortest route. This, I'm going to ask inclusive. you to wrap up. <laughs> That's excluding. Thank you. All right. All right. So let me just double check. Um, we'll make sure that those who wanted to be heard had the opportunity to be heard. Um, if you wanted to be heard and you have not been heard, this will be the last opportunity today for this item. Um, I don't see anyone. So uh, we are going to close the public hearing portion at this time. And... Uh, We'll go to uh, our commissioners for any questions or comments. Commissioner Scott, you may have pushed your button early, and I didn't clear it out, but I uh, just want to double check. Wow, first. Okay. Um, <clears throat> someone made a comment about there being a, a liquor store. I know there's a neighborhood Walmart there, so it's a, s a separate liquor store about a mile up the road, which would be about three minutes drive. Okay. Um, Mr. Arteman, can you come back to the podium? <coughs> yes, sir. Um, can you describe your definition of um, pedestrian traffic as described in, you said Florida, Florida statute or county code? Which were Well, that's the problem. It's not, there's no definition of the ordinary uh, pedestrian travel in the county code. So that's why we went to the cases. Your county attorney um, went to the, to the cases. And, and the cases say that when there is an improved path, whether it's an improved sidewalk, an improved parking lot, an improved uh, walkway, that is to be used in making that measurement, not a grassy field. The only case that your county attorney and I found with respect to using grass was the one case where there was only, only grass on either side between the two locations along the road. There were no sidewalks. If there had been a sidewalk in that case along either of those roads, the court would have said, you got to take that. In this case, there is an improved path, an improved driveway. 
Granted, the church may not have kept it up to, up to what it may be required to by code, but that's what's improved. That's what's used. That's the driveway. That's the only improved portion of the church property that allows for the, the law to say that's where you go. You don't cut across the field. You don't go up the embankment or down the embankment. You don't go through the divots. The county doesn't contemplate that. I'm not aware of anything in the code that says, yeah, you, you can use a grassy field as a pedestrian walkway. A field, you know, for playing ball that's kept that way, it's one thing. This is a way to, to measure how pedestrians, including those that are challenged with issues, because they're people too, and they're ordinary. It's, it's, and, and to be inclusive, you've got to say, is that the proper way to go? The answer is no. All right. Thank you, Mr. Arden. County Attorney, if you could uh, chime in on what he's... Your definition, um, as you already stated, just restated in your response to what he just said. Um, well, um, I, as I previously stated in my presentation, the county takes its rule from the uh, ABC Liquors case, uh, which does say that the route of ordinary pedestrian travel along public thoroughfare should mean that the measuring pedestrian, when leaving the first entrance, travels public thoroughfares until reaching the shortest route from the main entrance of the second location. And then the traveling pedestrian should thereafter follow that shortest route. And um, as um, emphasized by the uh, zoning manager, the county does not consider the churches. Um, we believe it to be unimproved uh, driveway to be a public thoroughfare as that term is used under county code. Thanks. And so you're referencing the case law, basically? Yes, that we base our rule on ABC Liquors versus Gags Albertsons, right. which is an Orange County case. Understood. Thank you. Jennifer, can you come forward, please? Can you sur uh, surmise, like, uh, so this has been denied uh, several instances before. Um, can you uh, nuances, just articulate in, in, in maybe greater detail than you've done before, how is it that this has been denied several times? Like what changes? Because usually when you come back, there has to be some kind of change, as I understand it. And so how are they able to continue to come back if it's been denied three times? I mean... So um, every time, when you request a distance measurement from the county, there's a fee. We'll measure it as many times as you want as long as you pay the fee. Um, generally, you would expect that the, 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 the measurement would be the same, right? Almost identical, maybe a couple feet off. In this case, because the... Um, the building had not been constructed when we did the first measurement. I think there might have been some site improvements and a general location of where, where we, you know, expected it to be or, you know, we take a site plan out with us and then we, you know, based on what's on site, we can usually figure it out. And if we don't, I think we even have something that says that they have to flag it. But we had enough information to generally understand where it was. But all of the site improvements hadn't been made necessarily in terms of the crosswalks and the sidewalks that connect internally on the, the commercial site. So we walked it you know, based on, on the knowledge and the information that we had at the time. I, I'm to believe that the, um, I believe it was a different applicant that submitted it the second time off the top of my head, but I believe that that applicant, uh, you know, made some reference to the fact that they thought it would be different because now the building was built. So, and it was slightly different. It was, you know, maybe 10 feet off of, uh, I can't remember and, the exact difference. But. And so while there have been slight deviant variances in, in the route um, from origin to destination and vice versa, those deviations are not greater than, say, 10, 15, or 20 feet. It w it, the deviations aren't so great that it will result in a... Correct. Uh, understood. Okay. Um, I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. All right. Uh, Thank you, Jennifer. Commissioner Moore, uh, Commissioner... It's a quick uh, question. Uh, just, uh, let me just check something. Uh, Mr. Weiss, did you have I, I, I did, Mayor. Thank you. I apologize for, for trying to jump in. Um, I know Mr. Ardeman, uh made some references to a, a statement or a letter by an engineer. Um, obviously, we've got Mr. Konkul and Usich um, that are both professional engineers as well. They've also got experience working with the county code. They may have some insights into um, how uh, those definitions may be or pedestrian accommodations may be specifically referenced there. <laughs> Also, Mr. Ardman made a reference uh, regarding the field or the, the, the um, about ditches and swales and it not being um, easily traversed. Uh, I know um, uh, Ms. Moreau 
has uh, walked that path and may have some comments or observations uh, regarding that as well. And then um, finally, uh, to County Attorney uh, Math Matthew Pretchard, um, the Brentwood case was specifically referenced um, as sort of one of those examples where sort of cro cutting across uh, the, the property was not supported by the courts. Um, however, in the, that particular case, uh, there was some reference to that being a third-party private property, not one of the two distance uh, your properties where the distance measurement was actually occurring um, in terms of a public thoroughfare. So I don't know if there may be some benefit of clarification of that particular uh, scenario okay. as well. So I think there's probably a few points as the board gets into their discussion that may benefit from some clarifications from staff. All right. So we'll give staff the opportunity to uh, clarify any of those issues. And then we'll go to the district commissioner for a potential uh, motion or additional questions or comments. All right, Ms. Murrow, anything else to offer to, for clarification? Oh, th thank you, yes. Um, I did forget to mention earlier, uh, the applicant had noted, I think in his appeal somewhere, um, or pro maybe at the BZA hearing, but earlier today, he also mentioned a swale. I can say that having walked that area, there is an incline, but I, if there is a swale, it's not a noticeable swale by any stretch of the imagination. It's a fairly stable, you know, solid surface that goes across. So there's not like a divot or there's not ditches. And, you know, <coughs> the way that it was described is maybe a little bit misleading. Um, and then in regards to the driveway itself, I would just reinforce what, what um, Matt Pritchett said, which is we don't really consider that to be an improved surface maybe semi-improved at best, but it's certainly not a stable surface in any stretch of the imagination. Um, I know I had a photograph in my staff report, but um, I have another photograph here. Okay. Um, which may, you know, it's a larger photograph. It may, you know, highlight a little bit more uh, the, the semi-improved unstable nature of the, the driveway itself. Um, so I think that using, you know, I think even Mr. Artiman said that the, the one case, you know, you could only use the grassy strips where there, there weren't improvements to the site. I don't know that I would call these improvements to the site. So um, I don't think we're comparing apples to apples here. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Wilson has hit her button. Hi, I'm going to take uh, Mr. Weiss's offer and ask the county engineer about the pedestrian access issue. And uh, yeah, if I could get some uh, just clarification. On Sir, the Commissioner. Um, well, firstly, uh, generally sidewalks and pedestrian paths are, are a five foot wide dedicated area. Uh, they're typically made out of concrete, stamped concrete, uh, or asphalt. Um, so part of the, um, as well as if they are uh, co-located, and, and correct me if I'm getting off of the code a little bit, Susan, uh, if they're co-located in the driveway or in a parking lot, they're usually a separate designated area for the pedestrian path. Um, we don't consider, necessarily consider a uh, driveway, a pedestrian path. When you look on a lot of commercial properties that come in, you'll see the driveway, and then you'll see a separate pedestrian path that comes from the sidewalk and is, goes to the, either the front entrance or to another sidewalk that takes you to the front entrance. So there's usually a separation between um, the pedestrian movement and the vehicular movement. So if you're looking at a driveway, uh, the driveway is not uh, um, it partially asphalt as, as – uh, Ms. Moreau mentioned, uh, or millings or, or gravel of some sort, so it's not a, a solid, necessarily unyielding surface. Uh, it's certainly not concrete, certainly not asphalt, certainly not stamped concrete, certainly doesn't have a separated designated place for the pedestrians to be separate from the vehicles, and those are the things that we look for inside code for a, a pedestrian path. All right, Commissioner Moore. I, I have a question for Ms. Moreau. Um, when you were talking about uh, the shortest route, your policies and procedures determine the shortest route. What definitions or what language do we have that would have told you that it was okay to go over a grassy knoll or, um, you know, I know this from being on the school board, those kids are going to walk the shortest distance, but I'm assuming you had some language to go on that would have directed your, your type of measurement that was taken. So we go off of the code language, and it this is the code language that you have in front of you here, which is shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel. So 
to Mr. Arderman's credit, we don't define that in our code. Um, but, you know, the shortest, it's ordinary pedestrian. It doesn't cover every pedestrian. It says the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel. I think someone, one of the speakers earlier mentioned a pedestrian takes the shortest, most direct route, right? Um, unless there's some type of an impediment or other thing that would otherwise prohibit them from doing that. In this case, the logical ordinary pedestrian, in my opinion, would walk across that crosswalk and walk up the incline and go across the, the front yard of the church. They would not walk down out of their way, go down the sidewalk, make a hard left, and then go up an unstable, unimproved you know, driveway surface to get to the same location. And, and we could have, when we define this, uh, said some sort of definition that would have indicated a public sidewalk or an improved five-foot sidewalk. We could have had language that indicated that type of a walkway. Certainly. And we did it. All right. I'm prepared to make a motion. Your motion? Okay. Based on the testimony. There, there's a, put, oh. Go back to the slide that oh. you had up for okay. the potential recommended Thank actions. You. Okay. Um, based on all the testimony evidence that I've heard and seen today, I would agree with the zoning manager that when a pedestrian reaches the location on the north side of Claire Conakoy Road, after crossing the crosswalk at the traffic light there, the ordinary pedestrian would have chosen to walk the shortest distance to the church building by walking across the grass yard on the front of the church property in a straight line directly to the church building. So therefore, I move that we uphold the zoning manager's determination about how to properly measure the shortest route of ordinary pedestrian travel under the facts in this case. Second, Wilson. All right. Uh, we do have a motion and a second. And all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. All right. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right. Uh, thank you all for your presence this afternoon. Um, that is a decision made by the board. Uh, just recall that we are still in session here, and so if you can quietly leave, uh, we're going to go to the next item on our agenda, and this item is D5 uh, this afternoon. And uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item, and we're going to ask Ms. Moreau uh, to frame this item as well. And uh, with that, Ms. Moreau, you are recognized. And again, to those who may be leaving, we ask that you quietly, quietly leave. We ask that you quietly leave. There's still, there's still noise in the back. Thank you. All right, Ms. Moreau. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a public hearing for uh, SE 2310079. Uh, the applicant is Christopher Mills for uh, Windermere High School. Uh, the property is zoned RCE. It's in the Rural Country Estate District, Zoning District. Um, it's a uh, rural settlement one-to-one, -one, and it's also located in the West Windermere Rural Settlement. Uh, the request before you today is an amendment to the special exception, to an existing special exception, uh, to allow for the construction of an off-site, I'm sorry, an on-site stadium for an existing public school. Here's a location map of the subject site. You can see it's just on the east side of Winter Garden uh, Road, uh, it's south, south of Lake Butler Boulevard, and it's just to the west of Lake Butler. Here's a zoning map showing the zoning districts and the surrounding areas. You can see most of it single family uh, zoning and um, there's several planned developments which are also single family housing. Here's an aerial showing the existing high school campus. Uh, you can see in the red on the bottom left of the, the yellow outline, if you will, um, is an existing practice field for the, the high school. And that's the subject of the request today. So here's the overall site plan of the high school. This is turned now uh, to the north is on the right. Um, the subject location where they're proposing to add the on-site stadium um, is in the, in the red here. 
Here's a zoomed in site plan just showing that specific area. Once again, Winter Garden um, is, Winter Garden Vineland Road is to the, on the, the top of the slide here. North is to the right. Uh, so this um, yellow highlighting here shows uh, existing high jump and one existing basketball court, which are proposed to remain. And then the, the areas identified in the red highlighting are um, proposed improvements, and they include uh, new visitor bleachers, uh, relocated home bleachers for a total of uh, 1,852 seats, uh, new 1,800-square-foot um, building, which would be to the right of the plan there. Um, that would house ticket booths, restrooms, and concessions, uh, new second basketball court, and then um, also the relocation of the long jump and then several storage containers on site. Here's some site photographs of the property. This is from Winter Garden Vineland Road facing east. And then this is facing northeast at the south property line towards the stadium. You can see the existing long jump there. Um, you can also see six uh, large light poles, stadium lighting poles there um, for the practice fields currently. So just to give you a little history on this property, um, in November of 2013, um, the board actually denied a request for a, a special exception to, for a, to allow for a new uh, high school campus to be located at this location. Um, that denial was primarily based on neighborhood concerns about incompatibility with the West Windermere Rural Settlement, traffic, noise, and other concerns. Um, cut to about two years later, uh, the special exception was recommended for approval, but that was also based on a, um, a, com a companion settlement agreement um, that outlined that the uh, stadium uh, was to be located off-site at Scott Pine Park. Had a few other conditions that are noted here as well, but that's the primary one that we're talking about today. Uh, just to give you an overview of where the Windermere High School property is located and then Scott Pine Park, you can see they're both along the same road. Scott Pine Park is to the southwest of the current high school. So since that time, you can see that the, the stadium was built off-site. Um, uh, in June of this year, the board um, actually approved an amendment to the settlement agreement, and that amendment modified one of the terms pertaining to the stadium, and it specifically allowed for the stadium to be relocated from the existing location at, uh, um, at uh, Scott Pine Park um, to be located here at Windermere High School, subject to a special exception. Um, this is primarily the, the reason behind the request was to um, address concerns regarding the existing off-site stadium. That included uh, pedestrian and weather safety, uh, logistical issues that occurred before and after, uh, before and during events, and availability of parking spaces at the off-site location. Um, and then as a part of that settlement agreement, a separate public hearing was required for the special exception before the board, which is what's happening today. This was not an, a board called hearing, and this was not a, a appeal hearing, which are the two types that you normally see. This is specifically required as part of the settlement agreement. So the existing high school site is accessed off of Winter Garden Violent Road to the west. Um, the proposal is to amend the existing special exception, as I mentioned previously, to install a stadium with a total of eight, 1,852 seats. Uh, it would be in the same location as the existing football practice field. Uh, this, this includes the, the restroom concession and ticket booth building, a new basketball court, new storage containers, uh, relocation of the existing long jump, and then um, four new ex uh, LED light poles. I, I noted the six existing poles. Those would be removed and four new LED light poles would be installed around the field. Uh, they're not proposing uh, to modify any of the parking on site, but currently at the high school there are 860 parking spaces. That's compared to uh, 205 parking spaces that are actually at the Scott Pine Park location. Uh, the hours of operation for the school itself will not change. Um, the football games are proposed to be Fridays at 7 p.m. to end no later than 11 p.m. Uh, staff did recommend approval of the special exception as we felt it was compatible with the surrounding area and the improvements would not be a detrimental intrusion. Uh, there was a community meeting held on Wednesday, October 23rd. There were about 300 attendees at that community meeting. The majority of attendees spoke overwhelmingly in support. Um, specifically in regards to their concerns regarding the off-site stadium and, and their concerns for that off-site stadium. 
Um, and there were some people who noted concerns about the proposal, including noise impacts of the new stadium and then the times proposed for Friday night football games. Staff mailed a total of 822 notices to adjacent property owners within a 2,000 foot radius. We received 80 correspondence in favor of the request. Those are all unmapped. And we received 22 correspondence in opposition to the request. Eight of those correspondence are mapped within that, that area. By now, you're familiar with the special exception criteria. Uh, the use is required to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. It's required to be similar and compatible with the surrounding area. It shall not act as a detrimental intrusion. Uh, it shall meet the performance standards of the district. Sh shall be similar in noise, vibration, dust, odor, or glare, and heat producing, and other characteristics. And um, it shall meet the landscape buffer yards of code. So the Board of Zoning Adjustment concluded that the existing use of the site is consistent with the comprehensive plan and that the proposed improvements would be located in a manner to minimize impacts to adjacent properties and would not be a detrimental intrusion, and they recommended approval of this special exception. Um, their motion was unique in that um, we received several condition, proposed conditions of approval from the applicant, I think either the night before or the morning of the Board of Zoning Adjustment that staff had not had a chance to vet. They had been worked out between the applicant and uh, another attorney that was representing some of the residents in the area. So the uh, BZA made a, a motion to approve it subject to the conditions um, as amended, but um, with recognition that county staff would need to review the conditions and make any needed changes prior to the Board of County Commissioners. So I'll note those here as we go through. Uh, so the first two conditions are the standard conditions of approval that tie the special exception to the site plan and the elevations provided and require the applicant obtain all other applicable state or federal permits. Uh, the third is the, another standard um, that requires any deviation from the code not specifically addressed by the BZA to uh, be resubmitted or revised or to comply with the standard. Uh, condition number four requires the improvements to be made within five years of final action. Uh, condition number five limits the total number of seats in the bleachers. Condition number six essentially caps the height of the stadium lighting at 80 feet and requires automatic timers or shutoff timing for the lighting related to the specific event. It also caps the height of the parking lot lighting, although new, new lighting is proposed for the parking lot at this time. Uh, we are proposing one minor change, which is noted in orange here. It's just a grammatical change here. Uh, Condition number seven um, is regarding stadium lighting and it caps the fixture color temperature and it requires glare visors to be installed and field adjusted. I will note that since the BZA hearing, staff is proposing the additional changes that you see on the screen here, um, primarily because the initial condition conflicted with condition of approval number eight, which I'll show you here. Um, Condition of approval number eight requires a minimum standard of fixture, um, and as I understand it, the Musco light uh, is at 5,700 Kelvin, which is why we're changing condition number seven so that they don't conflict with each other. So our proposed change, and then we have another just grammatical change here for condition number eight. Condition number nine prohibits lighting in the basketball courts. Condition number 10 prohibits artificial noisemakers and requires signage to be posted as such. Uh, condition number 11 limits the size, number, and orientation of the speakers allowed. Condition number 12 requires a limiter and volume control on the PA system and limitations on when it can be used. Condition number 13 provides for hours of operation for the general stadium use and for football games, and it allows for extended hours in case of game delays. Condition number 14 limits the start time for the use of the PA system on the weekends to 8 a.m. Condition number 15 limits the use of the stadium for outside non-school related functions to the terms of the special exception approval and it requires all non-school related events to end by 8 p.m. Condition number 16 is a really long condition that's essentially three conditions in one. Um, it requires the installation of understory trees along the eastern property line as well as the pruning of existing live oak trees along the eastern property line. It also requires an annual inspection of the trees thereafter. Uh, and lastly, it requires any existing dead trees or future dead trees to be replaced with the minimum gallon-sized trees. 
so since the Board of Zoning Adjustment hearing, um, it's my understanding that additional condition of approval was requested um, by a member of the public, and Orange County Public Schools has agreed to that condition as well. We're proposing to add it as a new condition 17 so that it will be grouped with the other landscaping condition. So that condition um, is reflected here. Uh, new 17 requires the planting of understory trees on the west side of the stadium. Uh, condition number 18 states that if these conditions are not met, the special exception can be revoked. And then condition number 19 requires all previous conditions to be met um, from the, the two previous special exception approvals, with the exception of condition number 12, 18, and 20, which are deleted. These previous conditions have either been replaced or are no longer applicable. We're also proposing to just clarify where those conditions 12, 18, and 20 are coming from, which special exception approval those are coming from. So we're proposing that amendment there as well. And our requested action is to uh, deny the applicant's request or approve the applicant's request with the conditions. Um, I would note that if the, the request is approved, um, you ha had a consent agenda item that I believe was pulled this morning that you would need to follow up with a separate motion um, regarding the stadium agreement um, once again after or if the special exception request is approved. And I am available for questions if you have any. Okay, um, with that, is the applicant or representative of the applicant present? And if so, would you like to come forward to the microphone? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jad Brewer. I represent uh, Orange County Public Schools as in house counsel. Addressed is a uh, 6501 Magic Wave. Boulevard here in Orange County, 32809. And if we could just a nice presentation here. Oh, no, they changed the clicker. Green button? All right, green means go. <clears throat> okay, so as you've heard from staff, um, the BZA has recommended approval, finding that our request is consistent with a comprehensive plan. Uh, pursuant to the staff report, uh, which is expert testimony, competent substantial evidence that this uh, request complies with the requirements for a special exception. I just wanted to kind of bring up some other points that shows how we're mitigating those effects, which further lends to the uh, meeting the criteria. So won't belabor the history, but you can see it's approximately a mile down the road from the school site, and that's kind of where all the problems start, uh, besides the too small site that uh, the, the park is on. Okay, so current situation of the Windermere High School campus. <clears throat> there is a track, in, uh, an actual track there. We're proposing we will rubberize that track for the safety of the athletes. It has limited field lighting and no seating. The big key here is 860 marked on-site paved parking spaces versus the 200 down the street. Um, there are two signals at the main vehicular entry points. Uh, this, you know, of course, is up to the school to run the event, but. The dot to the north was most likely that parking lot where the uh, spectators would park. That alone is well over 600 parking spots with extremely long driveways, two left-hand turn lanes in, and as well as a diesel lane. So the big key is that this parking lot is designed to get people off of that road and into the parking spot, and it's in, in a, a snaking manner, a Congo line, so that you don't block traffic. Everybody moves, you find a spot, and you pull in. <clears throat> that is not what happens at Scott Pine Park. It's, it's not designed that way. It didn't have the room for it. Also, the, the lot to the south is where you'd probably have your visitor, visiting football team come in, law enforcement, uh, you know, staff, maybe boosters. As again, you can see a really long um, driveway in, <clears throat> and it is a, a flowing pattern so that those cars aren't blocking the intersection. We also have dedicated left-hand turn lanes and dedicated deceleration lanes. Okay, at Scott Pine Park, there's currently a, a full uh, artificial turf field, 80 foot poles, 1,552 seats, announcer's booth, field house, locker rooms, concession, and 200 uh, on site parking spots. <clears throat> and the parking lot entrance is not signalized, and actually, Fiquette Road that fronts it tapers down right in that area to a two lane road. And having been out there at rush hour, I can tell you people are absolutely flying through there. Uh, you don't have to be a certified law enforcement officer to know they're going way over the speed limit. So the challenges with the current situation, uh, based on the way this was designed, there is absolutely nowhere for the public to shelter in the event of an emergency or a storm. Um, it's literally a mad dash to buses and cars, which of course is not safe. 
There is a locker room, but it only holds the athletes because there's athletes in there, there are students, we can't have the general public just milling about in those locker rooms, if, even if there was enough room, but there's not. Um, and of course, going under the bleachers would be highly dangerous because they are metal bleachers. Um, traffic congestion, the game, the, the big Florida night lights completely shuts down this road for I think at least an hour or two. Um, I, you know, if any emergency people had to get through there, I don't think they could get through there. Uh, the typical parking demand for the average event far exceeds what's available. There is overflow parking on the soccer field, uh, but I can tell you from having been out there with the parks director and seen it with my own eyes, it destroys that soccer field. So it, it essentially renders that community asset uh, worthless to those who may need it because the staff has to spend such amount of time repairing the field. Um, so what ends up happening, the out area outlined in yellow, is the spectators end up using that area. Unfortunately, it's, uh, we don't have jurisdiction as law enforcement or anything to go out there and stop them, so that's what they do. It creates a much more dangerous situation. There's a lot of uh, drop-off, uh, people just stop in the middle of the road and drop off uh, children and spectators. And also parking in surrounding neighborhoods. So if you can see this is zoomed out, um, Independence is the closest neighborhood, and I mean, as talked earlier, pedestrians and high school kids are going to find the path of least resistance. And the least resistance, if there's no parking, is to go park in a neighborhood and go down an unlit, dark, uh, two-lane highway where people are speeding. And there's no uh, traffic signal to stop the traffic for them to cross. Uh, besides impeding emergency vehicles in that local area, local neighborhood, and as well as endangering those residents. <clears throat> so the proposed plan focuses on this area of the campus, as staff discussed. Uh, just an architectural uh, site plan here. So what we propose is to replace the field lighting with a full athletic uh, field lights, which I'll talk about in a second. Construct a new building and so initially install 1,552 seats with a potential area of expansion for 300. So we went ahead and built that in based on uh, if there's a, a the demand. <clears throat> so the improvements, the adjacent campus buildings for example, the, the gymnasium holds, I think, 1,000 people. The Performing Arts Center can hold close to the same amount. So if there is an emergency or sheltering is needed, that capability is present. Um, 860 on-site parking lots, we can handle the event. So this, state, this school, two times a day during school, handles uh, roughly 3,000 people coming and going when you add staff, students, and everything. So the 1,500 people that go to the game is a walk in the park for this uh, this facility to handle. So that's going to be the big advantage is this was designed to handle traffic where the park is not designed to handle traffic. You won't have anybody darting across the road and we have signalized uh, entrances to get everybody in safely. So proposed landscaping was talked about. Just outline the areas we're talking about planting additional understory trees. This is by far the most landscape school I've seen in this county. It will become the most landscape school in this county. <clears throat> and, and why we Agreed to do that is mitigation, mitigating the noise, mitigating the light, mitigating those things to, to make it more compatible with the surrounding neighborhood um, to increase that compatibility, which is, of course, a requirement for the special exception. So if you note here, from where the lights are proposed to be placed, it's 800 feet to the residential property lines on the east, uh, 220 feet to the west property lines. What that allows is it completely eliminates light spill and visible glare to the adjacent properties. It will um, not only comply with the Orange County Lighting Ordinance, it's going to far exceed that, which I will show you now. So we brought in Musco Lighting, the uh, premier sports lighting experts in the area. They do a lot of county facilities as well. <clears throat> this is a great uh, graphic they put together. They brought all the decades of lights in and put them up and took a picture of them. So far left, we started in the 70s and we end up today in the far right. I mean, the one on the left hurts my eyes just standing here and I'm not even near it. Um, what, you'll, what we're proposing to install is what you'll see on the right, where you can tell it's lit, but you can't see where the light's coming from. There is no glare to distract drivers and, and local residents. Uh, so most importantly, the proposed lighting plan <clears throat> will meet the International Dark Sky Community-Friendly Sports Lighting Program, which is a really long way of saying that the International Dark Sky is an association that advocates for dark skies, that we should not have light pollution. They've created very stringent standards for sports lighting because in the mo model lighting ordinance doesn't really address sports lighting. It just says do your best. So they've created what the best is. And what that requires is less than 1,000 candela, 150 feet from the edge of the field. 
just for reference, the average low beam headlight is 15 to 20,000 candela. So in the median, we're down to 700 candela. <clears throat> when you, by the time you get across the street, we're zero. So what that means is it's, it's way less light than any of the cars going by. Um, and by the time we get to the neighbors, it's, it's non-existent. So compatibility. So on the left here is the old school technology. You see the blotchy field, the glare on the right. Now this is a this is a higher level of play than a high school, so it, it does have extra poles. But you, what you see is you you can't see the glare of the light source. It's very well evenly lit, and it immediately cuts off past the field, uh, you know, past the gates where you want it to. <clears throat> All that leads to to compatibility and mitigation. So the days of you know, speakers all around. This is not uh, the swamp. This is not Dope Campbell. Uh, we've got it down to a science. It's four speakers. Um, to, and the NCAA rules require that you have a PA system so that the participants can hear in case of emergencies or other direction needed when you have a large gathering. Um, so four speaker pods, <clears throat> two of them pointed down towards the field and across, and two pointed towards the home stands. As discussed, the system will include both a limiter and a digital signal processor. Really hard for me to understand what that means, but the best I can I could I could explain it um, as it explained to me was it just if somebody can scream in that microphone and turn it up as loud as they want, but it cuts off the decibels and the volume at a certain point, so the screaming just doesn't have any effect. So uh, once again, mitigation to the effects. So I think Jennifer did a great job, of course, going through the conditions, but um, I did have them up here in case there were any questions, and I tried to do them in a bullet point <clears throat> so it's a little bit easier to read. I think the big thing is um, the lighting and the sound, as is now, everything will stop at 8 p.m. for your normal daily practices, band practice, high school football practice, soccer practice. <clears throat> so that remains the same as it currently is now. Non-school related events, although they are rare, they are very restricted by these conditions. Uh, and let's see, no lights on the back. We don't light outside basketball course anyway, so that was an easy one. Uh, so here, the, the big thing besides the limiter and the PA, the PA system is, as discussed, uh, non-football events will conclude by 10 p.m. Actual events, not practice. Actual events by 10 p.m. absent exigent circumstances. Of course, we can't predict. Uh, somebody gets hurt, God forbid, they have to bring in an ambulance or something that delays the game. The game's under FHSAA control. It has to be continued. And uh, Friday Night Lights football will be uh, concluding by 11 p.m., absent exigent circumstances. Uh, for further compatibility, we've restricted the use of the PA on the weekend where you may have a cross-country meet or a track and field event. Uh, the PA system cannot be used till 8 a.m., so they could set up the event earlier. They just can't start announcing and start the event till 8 a.m., and of course, once again, uh, non-school related events are very restricted. Um, as we discussed, we um, agreed to install additional landscape above and beyond what's normal for any school and what is above and beyond this school to try to uh, help with that compatibility with the neighborhood. So special exception criteria, like I said, you've already seen that from staff. Um, <clears throat> the site is similar and compatible. It's already developed with a high school. There's already an existing stadium a mile away. There's a significant separation from the residential and their surrounding commercial. Um, the proposed improvements uh, are developed in such a way to minimize those impacts between the lighting, the, the, the advanced speaker system, and the landscaping. Um, meet is going to not only meet but exceed the performance uh, standards for lighting. Um, as discussed, the site's already developed with a high school. It's just similar to the stadium to the south, so it's no additional noise or anything else that's not in the area. And uh, not only do we meet the landscape buffer requirements, we're proposing additional landscaping to increase that. So requested action, we're requesting that you approve the application with the agreed upon condition. It meets all special exception criteria. Uh, OCPS has agreed to provide extensive mitigation measures. There's overwhelming community support and the safety of the students in the community is paramount. We'd also ask you to approve the amendment to the stadium agreement, which lays out the terms further. Um, I do have today with me, uh, Christopher Mills was the lucky one that got to sign the applicant. He's a AICP professional land planner for over 20 years now in numerous jurisdictions and states, available to answer questions. We have uh, Dave Torbert from Schinkel Schultz Architecture, who's been designing schools and other buildings for 
decades as well. And we have uh, Jay Klima from Klima Weeks Engineering, who's been not only working on our schools, but other projects for decades, <coughs> both uh, subject matter experts. If you have any questions with that, I'll conclude for questions. All right, so, uh, stand by. Um, do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? Um, yes, Mayor, I have 16 speaker cards. Okay, so well, let's try something. I think many of you have been in here <laughs> for a while now. Uh, so let's see if uh, we have a group that's supportive of, of the applicant, application at this point. Uh, those of you who are in support of the application, raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Now, thank you very much. Those who are in opposition to this application, raise your hand. Okay. So, those of you who are in support of the application, the way we're going to do this is uh, we'll give you the opportunity, the same as before. Uh, it's not necessary that we hear uh, 18 different people or whatever that number is. Uh, say the same essential thing. You can come to this. We can come to the same conclusion. We know that multiple ones of you who who are supportive. And so, is there a, perhaps a person who is uh, can be the spokesperson, and you all can some of you can yield your time to that person? Okay. You are so designated, even though I see school board member Gould over there, but but you are so designated. But, uh, let me just kind of work through this first. All right. So how many people are willing to give him uh, your time? Raise your hands. Who's giving him time? Okay. One person. Just so you know, Mary, we do have some SGA students who would like to speak. Say that one more I was going to try to say if we could get our student government leaders also, I think I know that they would be willing to probably because they're generous to donate time, but I think if they're missing an afternoon of school, I want to hear from them. I think the public should hear from them. Okay. I still want us to manage the time as best as we can. Um, and I, we, we do appreciate the student government members who are present. They certainly can all speak, but same conditions if uh, there's one of you or two of you who would like to speak, try to manage the time today for the, in the best interest of, of all. Um, uh, you know, we, we, it's been a lengthy day, but I want to hear from you. Okay. All right. So, um, so what we'll do while you all can try to work that out, there was a person who was in opposition, right? Okay. So, ma'am, why don't we have you come first? Give them a little time to kind of work amongst themselves. And as you're coming, we just would appreciate if you would provide your name and your address for the record. All right, thank you very much. Dion Hughes, 5039 Tilden's Grove Boulevard, Windermere, Florida. I live in Tilden's Grove, which backs up to the Windermere High School. We are here today to determine if OCPS has met the special exception criteria to move the Windermere High School football stadium from Scott Pines Park to Windermere. Okay, it sounds like is that uh, this is the sound from a high school football okay. game okay okay this is the sound that you will hear from a high school football game this is the sound that you hear in my backyard on a Friday evening approximately 7.30 p.m. Are these two sounds compatible? Are they like the same noise? No, they're not. You may hear people say they need to move the high school stadium back to the high school. I'm opposed to it. 
here I am again 10 years later. If we can just work with the current site, there's a lot of property there. If we can work with the current site to make it work, great. You might hear from some of the high school students. The high school students will use that high school for four years maximum. I have been living in Tilden's Grove for over 20 years. I plan to be there another 20 years, good Lord willing. So again, please vote no. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, do we have others in the audience who may be in opposition? Okay, I don't see any. Okay, would you like to come forward? Sure. And uh, if you haven't filled out a card, you can you can do so later. Okay. All right. Just name and address for the record, please. Sure. My name's Louis Tavares. I'm at 13527 Lake Kaywood Drive, uh, right across the street, about 200 feet away from the proposed site. Um, my neighborhood has people who go to the school. Um, there's some who are very opposed to this because, like that lady said, it is going to be a big change to our, our nightly routines. Um, from my conversations with the principal, we're not only talking about a football game from 7 to 11 p.m. We're also talking about track meets, soccer meets, lacrosse meets, girls, boys, JV, varsity. And our big concern, we, we're sympathetic to the students and wanting them to have a stadium. I'm concerned about non-school events. If this is all about student safety, why are we allowing OCPS to be able to rent out the stadium to other people over the summer when it's not being used? That doesn't seem like it's compatible with our area. Um, we're also very concerned about the, the times of the games. Again, this was originally pitched to us as five nights a year. You guys can suck it up till 11. Now it's multiple nights a week until 10 p.m. for all those other sports. I recognize the band's not going to be there every night. We already deal with band practice. Metronome is extremely loud. Uh, the band goes until 8. My kids can't go to sleep because it's so loud. Um, we expect more noise. I also have the unfortunate thing that there's another exception uh, to the north of me, uh, 200 feet away, that we're going to be hearing later, and I'll save my comments about traffic and safety until then, but it's, it's a nightmare, and we are very worried about safety vehicles being able to get in and out of our neighborhood, uh, both because of this stadium and because of that development. Um, best we've been told is that we can hire off-duty policemen to try to help facilitate that, which I don't think is fair to a neighborhood that has about 20 people. Um, so not here to oppose it, but really wish that the commission could impose some realistic uh, restrictions on it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, the way this is going to work, um, we're going to finish hearing from the public, but after I close the public comment, uh, the applicant will have the opportunity to make rebuttal comments, and those comments should be based upon some of what they may hear from uh, those who may be in opposition or otherwise uh, to kind of respond to, you know, question, lingering questions or what have you that may uh, be coming from the community, et cetera. All right, so... Uh, Again, do we have anyone else who uh, may stand neutral or in opposition? And if not, then I'm going to go to those who are apparently uh, in support of this. Okay, so uh, to our friends from the, the school, the students, um, we will begin with you. Okay. Uh, did anyone yield time to anyone? Okay. Does not appear so. So you only have two minutes. Uh, please state your name and address for the record. And uh, the. Pardon me? To the students. Okay. Can I get your. Okay. 
Okay, we don't have one speaker for the students, is what I'm hearing. We have multiple speakers. So you have to choose which one you're yielding your time to. Okay. Student number one. That's you're gonna yield your time to student number one. Student number one. Okay, student number one. Okay, who else wanted to yield some time? Oh, is there only one person yielding time to the students? No. Two. Okay. You, so who, the second person, who are you yielding your time to? Which one? Number two. Okay, so you yielded your, a minute of your time to student number two. All right. So, Joe, you got it? I think so, right. Mayor. So, uh, student number one, remember name, address, and you have three minutes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Could we be... Um, can, it would be okay that minors, presumably, if they can use the school address for their address, I think it would be appropriate. That's, that's fine. Is that... Are we, you, the, if, if you want to use your school address, uh, if you want to use your school address, that's fine. I'll just say Windermere High School. We got it. Okay? All right. So, okay. Joe, you ready? Yes, sir. All right. Student number one. I'm Karina Roman Zavala, a senior at Windermere High School and the Student Government Association President. It brings me great pride to be here standing speaking about the opportunity of having an on-campus stadium for Windermere and emphasizing its obvious benefits. Our executive board has attended every step of allowing an on-campus stadium speaking of, on four great points, safety, participation, practicality, and tradition. But truly, I'm here for my brother, a seventh grader who dreams of playing football for the Windermere Wolverines on an on-campus stadium. The legacy I hope to leave by being here today is for the classes that come after me. I personally won't be able to enjoy the stadium as a student, but hopefully, and with your help, they will. As we have discussed before, this is much more than just a stadium. It is about keeping our students and community safe. We are one of the only schools that don't have an on-campus campus field. This has been a great inconvenience for our athletes, spectators, and staff, but also a great risk to our safety. You can't have tradition without safety. And the first of many points we make here tonight, this afternoon, is the lack of safety for students our current situation presents. We have discussed students running in and out of poorly lit traffic, the lack of storm shelter to adequately house students and spectators, the poor driving decisions made by parents and students alike, as well as the major inconvenience our current stadium arrangements have made to local neighborhoods. While almost anyone could argue that attending games is part of attending high school, I can testify that while my own experiences of attending games and events at the Scott Pine Stadium over the past four years are memories that I'll always treasure, it has also been nothing short of chaotically dangerous. While many more reasons abound for why letting our stadium come home, I do hope that safety remains your top priority and simplest justification. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, please. Hello. My name is Maggie Caprice, a senior student body vice president and sports team student section chair at Windermere High School. Senior year is a sentimental period of time full of traditions and memories. And although we are only one quarter into the year, I've begun reflecting on all the memories I've gathered throughout my time at Windermere, including the memories of community. The community that Windermere has given me is one that I will forever be grateful to be a part of. And even if my time as an enrolled student is coming to an end, I feel very strongly about leaving behind a stronger community for, generation, for future generations to experience. This Windermere community is strong, uplifting, and supportive. I have personally experienced this as a student section president where I lead Windermere students in cheering on and encouraging their peers when they need it most, even though most of the time the support is shown in a field that is not even our own. We deserve this stadium. Future generations deserve this stadium, and Windermere deserves these memories and traditions. As a senior, through my various roles and responsibilities, and not to mention an older sister of a younger generation of Wolverines, I would like to thank the community that has come together to fight for something greater than ourselves and work so hard to leave an impact. Now it is time to drive that legacy into the ground by starting to move forward on a project that this community needs. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next student, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Paulo Moreira, and I am a senior at Winnie High School uh, and currently serve as a student government parliamentarian. 
For many of us here today, this stadium will not only serve as a venue for athletic events, but it will also serve as a beacon of hope to repair a culture that has long been impaired. Since its opening in 2017, students at Windermere High School have been deprived of the high school experience that almost all OCPS high schools have. If, if, as, if as students, we are expected to earn good grades and achieve um, high um, academic um, achievements, we, we deserve the right to walk out and embrace a stadium that we, that we call home and serve as a symbol of our community. We want to be able to, to come back and show our siblings where we sat, laugh about the outfits we wore in the stands, and show our decorations and murals our class contributed to our stadium. The prior, sadly, the prior five graduating classes and myself uh, will not share the same feeling when remembering their Friday night lights. But I hope you take um, the chance today that be to begin a new chapter for Windermere High. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker. Good afternoon, everybody. You can pull it up. You can pull it up. No. My name is Donnie Carey, and I'm a junior here at Windermere High School, <clears throat> along with having the honor of being our Student Government Association treasurer. I've spoken twice now about the disparity between so many of our neighbor schools, rich in tradition, and our own rented space to try and forge feelings of home and legacy. I'll start off with some history and statistics. In our six years of existence, we have seen two schools join OCPS, them being Horizon High School and Lake Buena Vista High School, both schools having an on-campus stadium and both schools taking some of our students and a good amount of football players. Since 2021, we have not beat Horizon in football and Lake Buena Vista beat us for the first time this year, two years after they were established. The reasons to go to a school like LBV and Horizon differ from Windermere for one reason. Students and players want a place to call home, a place to make memories that last a lifetime. Everything these kids don't want, a bus to the home stadium, small attendance, and a lack of culture is the position we have been put into. To anyone standing against this cause, I instead urge you to consider making yourself a part of this community instead of standing in the way of its progress and growth. Enrich yourself in the community that we at this school have no choice but to. Realize that the greatness this school has already achieved needs a spark. This school is in need of a legacy, and this stadium could be its birthplace. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments. We'll move to the next speaker, please. Hello, I'm Patricia Barra, 8845 Ladrido Lane, Orlando, Florida, and I'm the dance director at Windermere High School. I'm an original Wolverine who opened Windermere in 2017 and witnessed firsthand the inequalities and disadvantages our students, faculty, and community endured without an on-campus stadium. Windermere High School was intended as a relief school to West Orange High School. Relief because this young community was growing at such rates that our relief school, Horizon High School, was planned before our first full graduating class. If a community needs a school, then a community needs a stadium. Not only a place for its football, lacrosse, flag football, track, field, soccer, marching band, color guard, dance team, cheerleaders, physical education classes, and ROTC to practice, rehearse, perform, and compete, but a place for the community to create memories, memories that become traditions passed through generations. I can take my children to the stadium where I experienced Friday Night Lights over 20 years ago. While there, I can hear the drum line I marched in all four years, taste the hot dogs of third quarter break, and see my drum majors conducting our band. We play stand cheers that make the cheerleaders dance, the crowd roar, and the home team feel supported and encouraged. The away team is impressed with our presence and hospitality. We feel pride, pride for our school, pride for our community, and it all starts with our shared home, the stadium. When West Orange needed a relief school, it was implied that it needed a stadium. The city of Windermere has suffered enough by delaying this build, but especially every graduating class that goes by. Our alumni endured an underwhelming high school experience, busing to their home games without tailgates and traditions. As educators, of course, we've made lemonade out of this sour start. Our current seniors, the class of 2024, started their freshman year online after losing the end of their middle school experience. Allow them a glimpse of the full high school experience. Don't delay. Approve today. All right. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Andy Lovetakis. 
1030 Shadow Moss Drive, Winter Garden, Florida, 34787. I am the proud principal of Windermere High School. But the reason I gave my home address and not the school address is because I live across the street from West Orange High School. And I love hearing the band. And I love hearing kids be kids. Because when kids are being kids, we know they're not out doing things they shouldn't be doing. So I was not present during the initial building of the school and not involved in the initial conversations. What I have been present for is the struggle that Windermere High School faces on a daily basis with the off-campus stadium. I've never experienced anxiety as I have during my first football game. I looked around wondering what we'd do in the event of an actual emergency. With over 1,500 spectators, athletes, musicians, and staff, I would never be able to safely evacuate the stadium. I watched as Faquette Road was virtually shut down with traffic as we ran out of parking and spectators were forced to turn around, park illegally, or block neighborhoods. There was no way emergency vehicles would make it to us in time. So speaking of the road, it's dark with minimal lighting. You've already heard people talk about it. Uh, my band is forced to shuttle thousands of dollars worth of equipment in rented trucks using a small army of volunteers. Even at the end of the event, it takes us 45 minutes to clear the stadium if we're lucky. So next week, I will attend my 16th home game uh, for varsity, and that anxiety has only grown with each game. It's not a matter of when there will be a crisis. Or it's not a matter of if, it's when. So I understand the concerns of the community. However, please know that the school building is designed to handle these events in a safe manner. Yes, my kids deserve to have a stadium on campus. It builds culture and tradition. It's equitable compared to the surrounding community. But at the end of this discussion, it's about safety. All right. Thank you, Mr. Principal. All right. Next speaker, please. Good afternoon, my name is Keith Johnston, 5345 Lemon Twist Lane, Windermere 34786. I come to you today wearing multiple hats. As a member of community, I live close enough to listen to the band practice every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. sitting on my back patio. I come to you as a parent of a football player, sophomore playing JV and varsity, who I hope can have the same experience as I did playing in their own stadium. I also come to you as the president of Horizon West Youth Sports and Cheer, and I know what it takes to put on programs and sporting events. As the football coaches, it's not really fair to them to provide, and they're not providing the same atmosphere they are for their other teams. Windermere High School opened in August of 2017. Unfortunately, we have had more football coaches than we've had graduating classes. And that's not because of a lack of quality candidates, it's because of a lack of game day experience. Home teams, you can get your, lock, your team in the locker room around 5, 5.30, and you can get themselves ready. They walk out the door, and they're on the field by 6 o'clock warming up. For Windermere, we need to start loading up at 4 o'clock because we have to get dressed. Then we have to load the buses. Got to make sure everybody's accounted for. The coaches have to stop what they're doing and load their personal vehicles to make sure that the footballs and the headsets and the video equipment and all the equipment that it takes to run the sidelines gets loaded into their vehicles. We've heard it's a mile up the street. Five o'clock traffic in Windermere on a two-lane road, it's a 15 to 20 minute ride to get from the high school to the stadium, adding more traffic to that two-lane road. To get to the stadium, to unload again, to get everything set up, and then start your pregame. Our other opponents, it's a competitive advantage for them because they can walk out and have that all ready for them. <clears throat> it's time to make these adjustments. Like I said, I live in the community. I live close enough to listen to these bands, and I know, looking at the 12 to 15 agreements that were made, the school and the school board have gone above and beyond to address the community's concerns. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you for your comment. Next speaker. Distinguished members of the chamber, my fellow Orange County residents, one question before my two minutes start. I embrace the passion that the previous group had. Your two minutes but my, started. Well, I'm just wanting to make sure if my, I'm not going to get a parking ticket because it's three-hour limit. 
I can't guarantee you that. This parking enforcement is Dude, help me here. Land, though. <laughs> Ray Zoll, 6941 Nobleton Drive. Uh, we moved from Illinois just three years ago this past Columbus Day, and uh, we sought out a home in, that was served by Windermere High School. The school we left behind in District 214 is very much like Windermere High School. It was served by two roads on either side, had two entrances, and had a community all around it. Our mayor lived right across Salt Creek. He actually paid for fireworks to be shot off at the school on homecoming evening. School residents didn't complain. That's, that stadium embraced not only the school activities, but the community activities. It, ho it housed our 24 hours of Relay for Life for those that were survivors of breast cancer. It served as a place for two concerts for a little known group called REO Speedwagon, once before they became famous and once at our 50th anniversary for our village when they were famous. It was a, it was a place of in, involvement and enjoyment and it was because the stadium was there. Throughout all of Illinois, at, at least our district in, in particular, every school had its, camp, had its football stadium on campus. The first thing we, my youngest daughter and I did when we moved to, uh, got located is we went to the school for the first home football bell game, about this time three years ago, only to find out we were pointed down a stark little curvy street with no lights and no parking. I didn't want to pull out and park on that side of the street and put my daughter in danger. S safety reasons for the inclement weather down in here in Florida, I, I was a Lions Club member, I ran a circus event for our town and I had to have some place to offload people. With my 28 seconds left, little audience participation. Everybody here, I'm assuming, went to high school. Everybody here, if your high school had a stadium on your campus, please raise your hand. Where's our neighbor? She either didn't go to high school or she's lying. I think those that are denying the people uh, the opportunity to cringe at the sound of a baseball bat, to cringe at the sound of a band playing, to cringe at the sound of children and doing what children do are hypocrites if they don't allow them to do the same thing they did. Build the stadium. All right. Um, thank you. All right. For a moment to be civil, we treat each other with dignity and respect here. All right. Good afternoon, Mayor, fellow commissioners. For the record, Brent, Spain, Dariac in Spain, 1809 Edgewater Drive, Orlando, Florida. And I'm here this afternoon on behalf of the Oxford Moore Homeowners Association, and I just wanted to go on record on behalf of the association. We're located immediately to the east of the project uh, in support of the stadium. Uh, Mr. Brewer and I negotiated over a course of probably three, three and a half weeks, 12 of the conditions that are in the staff report. So we certainly appreciate OCPS's uh, willingness to work with the adjoining neighborhood. Uh, you know, we wish them, wish them luck on that. We also appreciate the staff support of those conditions. I know Commissioner Wilson was at the PZA meeting and Mr. Brewer and I were negotiating pretty much up until the last uh, evening beforehand. So we got those in a few the uh, night before the PZA hearing. So we appreciate staff support of those conditions with only uh, a few minor typos. So I'm glad uh, Mr. Brewer and I didn't have uh, more glaring mistakes in those. But again, uh, on behalf of Oxford Moore Homeowners Association, we support the proposed stadium move. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Spain. Uh, next speaker, please. Mayor, commissioners, um, Pam Gould, Pamela Gould, 2931 Sunbittern Court. I'm the school board member that represented this when we had to figure out where to put this high school and um, continue to be that school board member. I live in the Windermere Rural Settlement. I live not that far from this school. Um, I do hear fireworks every night. I don't hear the band. I actually hear Olympia's band before I hear. <laughs> I don't know if it's the way the wind blows or what. Um, but the bottom line is from the very beginning, we wanted to do what was right for the entire community. We came up with an agreement we thought would work. But the fact is, it does not. And I'm sure you will remember a year ago when we had a terrible storm come through here, a hurricane, that flooded those fields and canceled play and made it even more unsafe. The other challenge is where that stadium is located is not only bad for our students and our school, but it's bad for the community. It increases the traffic on an already very overburdened road. It creates terrible traffic issues bumps 
all the time on that very road, that extension of Fiquette. Um, and it will be much more organized, much safer, and much better for community building to have the stadium on site. I think that we have, and, and um, Lewis would attest to this, we have continued to stay in conversation to try to mitigate as much sound as we possibly can with our neighbors. Um, but it really is a community asset, and we need to treat our schools like community assets. They are the heartbeat of our community. They are preparing the future people who will be sitting right here, and I think you heard a few of them in our students today. I'm so proud of them. Um, and certainly, they are the keepers of the treasure, our, our students, our teachers, and our educational staff. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, do we have any other speakers present? There was one other speaker card, Mayor. I don't know if they were willing to speak or not. Uh, Jillian Sutton. Okay. Miss Sutton. She had to. They're saying okay. she had to leave. She had to leave. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, with that, if we have no other members of the public who wish to be heard at this time. I want to close the public hearing, but we will give the applicant uh, the opportunity for rebuttal comments. And not sure how much time he had left. I won't need much. How about that? <clears throat> All right. All right. So, Mayor Deming, you got three minutes. Uh, thank you for your time today. It's, yes, it's really been a pleasure presenting this to you and presenting it to the community as well. Uh, just some quick words um, from one of the commissioners at the BZA, and I thought this was very um, a very good summary, so I went back and actually watched it and wrote it down. So that an off-site stadium would work if the facility was adequate to meet the demands. Um, skipping over some stuff, but that's not the model here. That's the, <coughs> the crux of the issue. This would work potentially if that stadium was adequate. It is not for all the reasons you've heard here. <clears throat> and what else was noted is that the BZA is um, that OCPS has sincerely articulated the opposing point of view and addressed their concerns. So just briefly, um, the, our, our uh, request here today is an approved use that's consistent with a future land use plan. Uh, a stadium is a typical impact on a high school camp campus. We've gone above, above and beyond with the conditions to mitigate for sound, noise, um, or sound and light, and that we agree with staff's conclusion this is consistent with the uh, special exception criteria and ask that you uh, approve the application with agreed upon conditions and approve the amendment to the stadium agreement, and we're available for any questions you may have. All right. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, stand by. And now that we have concluded the public comment portion, um, we'll open it up for any questions or comments by members of the board. We'll go to Commissioner Moore first, and then Commissioner Wilson, as the district commissioner, will come to you last. All right, Commissioner Moore. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess this question is probably for the school board for your attorney. So uh, under speakers or noise, uh, you said that... Um, that with the PA system, because the, the, the gal who was here against it was concerned about those bullhorns which she played for. So maybe, or perhaps Mr. Leftakis could answer it. Um, how would the school board be able to ensure that nobody is in the stadium with the, the bullhorns? So artificial noise makers are prohibited by FHSAA guidelines. We're not allowed to have them. Um, it has been a problem with county, other counties apparently don't follow those rules, but we follow them here. So besides signs posted, we, you guys hire how many off-duty officers? Dozen for each, 10 off-duty officers for each home game, as well as I mean, dozens of staff there. So it would be up to the staff, of course, to police that and ad address that. Because I, I, I still go to football games every Friday night with my granddaughters, and I don't hear bullhorns. I, yeah, my, I, my daughter goes to another high school in this county on the other side of the county, and I, don't, and I live close to the high school, and I don't hear that either. So. Um, it's it's not the same as 
like I said, Doak Campbell or the Swamp. This is a much smaller venue. Um, we, we don't have that kind of technology. Okay, and then happy to see the, the, the sports box. And I was around in 2010 when there was a lightning strike. We had no sports boxes, and I advocated to get those. So I'm happy to see you are going to have an announcer box because that's really there for safety. Um, so you're up to 1,800 seats, but how many will you start with? 1,500. 1,552. Okay, and so how many is on home and away side? Oh, you're doing a pretty good away. You're doing a pretty good away side. Well, I was just recently at an Okoe game, and it was it was challenging. There wasn't enough seating, so I'm glad there's a, for the neighbor's sake a cap in there, because there are some stadiums who probably still need some additional seating. Okoe being one. That of happens them. in some of the rivalry games. They have to sit on the home side and just deal with the heck. Yeah, and then I guess maybe this is that, that's all I had for you, Jennifer. Um, well, actually, I'll come back to you a second, Jennifer. Um, how do, does our standards in terms of the parking spaces, the 800 sum, was there a formula so we're, we're making sure that that's adequate for the football game? So the, our parking calculations for a school are based off, I'm going off of memory here, but I'm pretty sure it's off of the assembly. Um, actually, hang on just a second. Okay, he's answering a question. Uh, I think he's answering a question about the guidelines for something else, but I, we don't essentially ask, require additional parking for a stadium use if it's already part of a school. So if that, I think, answers your question. So, um, but if we applied the parking requirements just for the stadium use alone, it would be um, one space for every three seats, which would require 618 parking spaces. And there's 860 provided. Okay, well that's, well that's good, because I know with that road it would be very difficult if somebody, if they exceeded capacity, there would be anywhere to park. So I, I think that that's a good thing to hear about. All right, then the last question I have, um, is probably back for the school board again with landscaping. And so I'm, I'm glad. I, by the way, it's so nice to hear Oxford Moore agreeing with the school board. That, that, that's a happy day. <laughs> Ten years ago, that was not the case. Um, okay, and so really happy to see this additional landscaping. Um, but how are we going to ensure that it's uh, taken care of? Because the landscaping at Apopka High School right now is a disaster. <laughs> write that down. Um, <laughs> Please do. I'd be real happy if you went and trimmed it. <laughs> so yeah, we're, um, we're doing a, uh, we're asking Schinkel Schultz to hire a landscape architect to design a full plan. There's already irrigation out there. The, um, I mean, unfortunately, as we, the more we build the schools, the state doesn't give us a lot of money for landscaping. So some of the times the trees do look a little scraggly. We're always open to commissioners calling, and I believe we've got a nice pipeline set up to take care of that. Well, I, I hear you, but and I'm a former school board member, but it'd um, be nice if we budgeted a little more for these high school. I don't see tree work. Miss Pam does a wonderful job over there. In fact, she responds to my complaints now as a county commissioner, and she's wonderful. But I, I don't think the community should have to call the school board to ask for those trees to be trimmed. And so, I, you know, Pam, I hope you're going to work and work on this so that those trees get trimmed because that's just not fair to the community. And they expect quality on, in this area, and so, so do all the schools. So I appreciate that. I'm glad you're adding to it, but let's just make sure they're maintained. And with that, it's been 10 years coming. I was on the other side of this 10 years ago. This is, I know I sounded tough right now, but this is a happy day for me this to see this. Day. Thank you. So, Mr. Brewer, um, Mr. Brewer, you referenced... Uh, Doak Camel Stadium and the Swamp twice. Yeah. I'm not sure what the point was there. Was it? I'm trying to be the, friendly to all sides. Of they're they're yeah. noisy. Are you trying to say they're noisy? They're, they're louder? Is that what you're uh, trying yes. to say? Yes. Having they're, been to both louder. of them uh, plenty of times, much louder. Which one is the loudest? This. Oh, boy. I, don't, I didn't memorize your resume well, like, before. I'm a graduate of Florida State <laughs> University. <laughs> I got a degree from both, but the swamp oh, is loud. Okay. <laughs> All right, he's walking down the middle. You should be a politician there. 
All right, so uh, I can tell you uh, I went to a few games uh, there at the Scott Pines uh, Stadium of Field uh, from the very beginning. Uh, as a former sheriff, um, Scott Pine was someone I knew intimately, um, deputy sheriff who was shot and killed in the line of duty, and that stadium was named after him. And so we were there for the very first events uh, there at the stadium with his um, uh, wife and uh, three surviving children. Uh, so it is a special place uh, to me. And uh, uh, irrespective of that, I can tell you that the parking, uh, the traffic was a nightmare. But uh, thank God I had blue lights on my car at the time. Uh, and when I go to the stadium now, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare to get through there. So uh, this probably is a better solution overall. So, all right, uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted you to uh, recap again uh, the uh, efforts that you uh, made to those uh, members of the community who were in opposition of it and kind of what changes you made, if you don't mind. Okay. So, yeah, so... Um, I think one of the big key is the lighting. The lighting is the most advanced lighting available in the market for this type of venue. Um, the <clears throat> addition of the sound equipment that limits the volume, both a limiter and a digital signal processor. The additional landscaping that goes well above and beyond the county code and well above and beyond what we like to do at any school um, due to the upkeep, uh, as well as the restrictions on conditions. I mean, we're saying uh, we're using cutoff times, uh, you know, we're not subject to the county noise ordinance, and most of our high schools can go till 4 a.m. if they wanted to. They don't, as uh, Principal Lefteges will tell you. He wants to go home, too. He's been there since 6 in the morning. Um, but all those factors together mitigate the impacts. So it would be safe to say, based on your statement, that um, while um, you can't resolve everyone's concern in opposition, you certainly endeavor to do so. Right? Correct, absolutely. Cool. Uh, Mayor, I have no further comments. All right. Uh, now we will go to the District 1 Commissioner, Commissioner Nicole Wilson. Um, thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you to my colleagues for um, the questions. I thought it was really good. I want to really thank, boy, let me, where do I start? The residents, the students, the parents. Um, OCPS, who have their dedicated team, our zoning department, their dedicated team. It's weird that Ted's not here for this. Um, my uh, colleague on the board, who has been just such a great partner in trying to get this done, um, I sat on that side in 2014 as the mother of an incoming ninth grader at West Orange. She was eating lunch on the floor and had to schlep a, we, we put a, you know, a tracker to see how many miles she was putting in. She had a cello with her and she had to walk back with our cello and if there was lightning there they were like well I guess we're not playing cello today and because we were so desperate to get your school open and we knew it was going to be beautiful and it was in a great location I think that everyone made the decisions they had to make at that time that being said like principal of Texas, last year when the ground was soaking wet and people quit being able to park at Scott Pine even so your experience there was when they were able to park and overflow you can imagine what it was like when they closed the overflow parking. And all of a sudden, the students and families were told that if they were doing home games again, they were going to be shuttling back and forth from West Orange. And I was speaking to my sheriff uh, captain in the area, and I said, well, what happens if they have to evacuate? And he said, exactly. In my heart, I was like, well, this is this Friday. What do we do? And so, you know, immediately called together um, school board member, team from, from OCPS and started working on this. And it was this time last year. So, you know, I know it feels like a really long slog from the time that I stood there in 2014 begging for the school to now being over here and saying, oh my gosh, we can make this right and whole. Um, I wanna thank the residents who were not happy about this update for working with me, reaching out really early on and working with me to connect with OCPS because you can see that really the technology has gotten so much better now than it was when this was first negotiated for how to fit a stadium 
um, in its capacity into a, a more residential area. But um, I loved it. Our teacher that was here said, uh, if you have a school, you need a stadium. What I had said all along is, and I, I, I will go to bat about potentially not developing in areas that need to not have the density. But once we have the density, we've moved the families in, we have to have the schools. And if we're going to have the schools, we have to have the things that come with the schools. And that's only fair and equitable to our community. So um, I want to thank you all again. And with that, I'd like to make a motion for approval. Second. Okay, so wait just a moment. Uh, oh, wait, I have to get my sentence right. We, As we pulled uh, D, I D1 from this morning, okay? And uh, D1 uh, yes. is the agreement. And then this afternoon, we have the special section, special exception, D5. Uh, do we need to take up? The consent item from this morning first. Mayor, we should take up uh, the request for the special exception first, and okay. then if that is approved, and this could be part of the same motion, if the, the motion is to approve the request okay. for the special exception, yes. okay. and then approve the consent agenda item from this morning, which is the amendment to the stadium okay. agreement. So that could be. So I just want to make sure you style the motion okay. uh, saying, appropriately. Keep me on track here, Joel. So I'm going to make a motion to approve the special exception uh, with, with the conditions as, as presented, because um, those were the additional con conditions that came through right before BZA, and a motion to approve the um, amended the consent agenda, consent item, agenda item, uh, which is D1, the amendment to the stadium agreement. D1, amendment okay. to the stadium agreement. All right. Uh, Mr. Clerk, you got it? Okay. All right. So we have a proper motion at this point. Is there a second? Second. A second by Commissioner Scott. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right. Thank you all for your presence this afternoon. Uh, we'll see you at a football game. All right. We're going to move to the next item on our agenda. Uh, as you are leaving, remember that we are still in session, so we ask you to please uh, keep that in mind. Keep uh, the noise down. We're going to go to... Uh, E6 for this afternoon. We'll open the public hearing on this item, and we're going to ask Mr. Jason Sorison if he will come forward and uh, frame this item. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, the next case is a, an appeal to the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation for approval for a rezoning. The request is to go from R1A to R1 in order to split the lot and to build two homes, the proposed use is two detached single-family dwelling units. And this is located in District 2. The future land use is currently low-density residential. The zoning is R1A, and the proposed zoning is R1. This is an aerial of the subject property showing on the south side of Venetian Avenue, west of Edgewater Drive. 130 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received one response in favor and no responses in opposition. A community meeting was not required for this request. At the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there were two speakers in opposition. The Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending that the board make a finding of consistency with the conference of plan and approve the requested R1 zoning. Staff is available for any questions. All right. Uh, any questions or comments? At this point, if not, we're going to ask the appellant in this case to come forward if you'd like to make any comments. And by the way, it's an applicant here also. Okay. All right. How do I look? What do I do? <clears throat> okay, gotcha. Okay. Good afternoon, Good Mayor. Good afternoon. County Commissioners, thank you. Um, my name is Gail Vandewood. I live at 1014 Venetian Avenue, Orlando, Florida, 32804. Been a resident there 
for 34 years. I understand the board's most important purpose is to ensure and protect the health, to ensure and protect the health, safety, and welfare of everyone in this county. I respect and thank you for your efforts and improvements that have been made in our community. In this case, a rezoning to split property to its original plat in 1926 and construct new homes to today's standards you will be making a decision that has the potential to cause harm to other citizens and it's this board's responsibility to address. I'm here to voice my concerns with this rezoning. This area is located in District 2, Precinct 202, the furthest south, southeast part of the district tucked behind the southeast corner of Lake Fairview. Land use compatibility states R1 zoning would allow for development that is compatible with the character of the surrounding area and would not adversely impact adjacent properties. The Florida Land Use 142 states Orange County shall ensure that land uses uh, changes are compatible and serve the existing neighborhoods. Based on the county's planning and zoning R1, Development standards minimum lot area of 5,000 square feet and minimum living area of 1,000 square feet. My property, which is adjacent to, to Brian's, is uh, the lot area is 7,000 square feet and my home is under 900 square feet. It's an older home, obviously. I've lived there a long time, but it's a, an older home. The rezoning would most likely be two homes over 3,000 square feet, and this is clearly not the character of the surrounding pop property. I've put two examples of new construction in this block between Hunter and Venetian. This is one uh, at the end of my street. This is uh, 1011 <coughs> Venetian, and the existing home to the left of that is 1013. This is a new construction on Hunter, which is the, the street behind <coughs> my uh, property. Um, this is the one that caught my uh, attention at first because they brought like 50 or so truckloads of fill dirt in there, and they've raised that up. And then you can see uh, next to it the existing home at 1021. This is looking back from, from Hunter back into Venetian Avenue um, to uh, 10. Uh, 006, and the, the, the one picture on the right is 10008, and you can see where it's the elevation of this new home is, is higher. There is a raised septic tank at 10008 in the back of that property. <clears throat> this community in University Heights already struggles with uh, serious flooding issues and runoff problems. Here's some uh, photos of flooding that's on Hunter at the new construction. Um, this is the homes adjacent to that. Um, uh, 1021 and 1025 Hunter um, where they've had flooding. Uh, the one picture you can see there's water intrusion at the, at the foundation of that home. Uh, the other one is a temporary trench they made just to help uh, you know, move some of the water, divert some of the water away from their homes. This is on Grant, which is the perpendicular road at the west side, uh, west end of both of these uh, streets. This is in, uh, my neighbor's garage. Usually, this is, picture was taken from 2016. She has a pretty bad problem with her garage getting flooded. This is her yard in the backyard, 2016. Uh, her neighbor beside her has a raised septic tank in the backyard. This is uh, Venetian, uh, the a house at the corner of Venetian and Grant. Um, this uh, resident has an Airbnb in her backyard. You can see her backyard's got water in it. The Airbnb has water intrusion, and she actually got water damage in water into her home there. This is my backyard. Um, this picture's from 2017. This is where the water runs into my backyard, which comes down from the, um, the, the, the east side of the, of the road and works its way down. 
These pictures here, also from 2017, the, the one on the left is um, my backyard and 20, uh, my property's 20, uh, 10, 14, excuse me, uh, 10, 12 is the other property. Uh, he's got a raised septic tank in his backyard. And those two pictures show where the water just comes directly and floods my yard. Uh, the last picture is at my front yard where it, it drains out to the, uh, the drainage ditch out there. This is my front yard uh, looking, um, looking west. Uh, uh, 1016 is next to me. Uh, they have a raised septic tank in their front yard. <clears throat> H138 states in order to stabilize and improve existing neighborhoods, Orange County shall continue to support compatible infill development in existing neighborhoods where infrastructure already exists. I see many of my surrounding neighborhoods that have typical contemporary two-story, zero lot line, no green area, hardly any trees, but they have a real stormwater uh, runoff system and city sewer. The infrastructure and drainage system in place in our neighborhood is a big ditch with a big crusty old concrete pipe under the driveway and septic tanks, some of which are elevated two to three <coughs> feet higher than adjoining properties. The, it's, uh, this, uh, the, our drainage system is inadequate to handle the runoff we currently have in this area from south side of Hunter Ave to the north side of Venetian Avenue and the west side of Grant. And here's what our, this is what our drainage system looks like. It's just, um, this is on Hunter. It's kind of dilapidated. That resident is afraid the telephone pole is gonna fall over. Um, the, the middle picture has got, you know, erosion around where the culvert is. And the last picture, which I'm not a very good photographer, but that just shows the drainage going from Grant um, towards towards Edgewater Drive, looking looking east. This is uh, just some more pictures of what the drainage system looks like there. It's just an old, outdated ditch with different size concrete pipes, um, some under the driveway, some in the middle. Uh, it's just very antiquated. This map here, I kind of drew on there. Um, all the homes within this block are on septic, which is Edgewater, Venetian, Grant, Hunter, that block there. Um, I've marked a solid, the rectangle there is all the areas where there is a raised septic tank. And the X indicates the homes that are subjected to flooding. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with there. We're, it's, the water to me is just getting pushed down and around. If the county continues to allow people to build larger structures, which naturally come with larger roof surfaces and increased impervious spaces, <coughs> runoff issues will be drastically exacerbated. That clearly is not protecting the health, safety, and welfare of all community members. My neighbor is rezoning his property into two lots to maximize the profit that can be made through its sale, and that is his right. But if a developer buys it to construct two homes, he doesn't care about me, and he's going to want to maximize his profits too. But it cannot be done at the expense or detriment of mine or other people's property. I'm here to protect what I have the only way I know how. This particular case of rezoning is not an isolated issue. Our community is increasingly being targeted by developers, and every request that comes before this board needs to be looked at in a community way because it is a community problem. The residents that have resided within this area of rezoning and new development must not have to bear the burden of flooding from new construction. These are people in this area that are, have resided there, some for 13 years, 14 years, 20 years, 24, 34, even a few people that have been there over 50 years in this area. Are my words enough to make this board not approve the rezoning for lot, sl lot split? Probably not, but I hope I can at least convince you to have some mercy on the surrounding residents here and make some stipulations to any new construction surrounding us so we don't drown. 
We desperately need conversion from septic to sewer, and I'm aware of Commissioner Moore's work and where she's, uh, the money that she secured for help and where she's starting and plans on District 2, but I've, I have a feeling it's going to be a long time before we get to our area, District 2. This board has the authority to place conditions on this rezoning approval that govern the future development of this lot, including square footage, building height, setbacks, impervious space, and roof lines. And those conditions should be addressed this afternoon or this evening at this rate. This board can require that a storm management plan be submitted. You can require that plans contain measures to control drainage and runoff problems at the site of the problem, which means on that property. For example, new construction must have a French drain on one or both sides of the property to divert water somewhere else besides mine or my neighbor's property. You can require control measures like rain gardens or other stormwater detention system to be required. I understand that ordinances are sub subject to interpretation by the board members and I respectfully request that this board be mindful of the impact its decisions have and take seriously your responsibility for the health, safety, and well-being well of all homeowners and taxpayers in this region of the county. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, how close do you live to the property in question? I'm, ad I'm adjacent to it. Just adjacent. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. I'm just uh, just west of his property. Okay. All right. Thank you for your yes, presence this afternoon. Um, now we'll move to the applicant or representative of the applicant if you want to come forward. My name is Brian Davidson. I reside at 1012 Venetian Avenue, Orlando, Florida, 32801. And yes, I'm here now to uh, ask for the board's recommendation to make the, continue to make the approval for the rezoning of my lot. Here we go. Uh, just a quick picture of my house. You can see um, it's a it's big size lot, oversized lot um, with an older style home on it. Quick aerial shot shows that the home is basically located in the middle of the lot. Um, <clears throat> the request I'm here to make is that uh, that it does be rezoned from an R1A to an R1. Uh, it needs to be split, yes, so that I uh, be rezoned so that I can allow for it uh, to be sold and marketed as a potential double lot in the highly desired College Park area. Uh, the house was originally built in 1950. It's a 3-2. It's a 1,600 square foot home. Um, but it's a bit outdated. It only has two closets in it. It's got seven foot nine ceilings. I'm six foot four. It's livable, but I'm ready to upgrade. Um, a little bit about me myself. I'm 38 years old. I've lived at the property for almost 10 years. Uh, this was my first home that I purchased as well. Um, but I've called Orlando my home my entire life. Um, I was born in Winter Park, raised in Maitland. I'm an Orange County Public School graduate. Winter Park High School does have a separate stadium. <laughs> um, but I'm also a regional sales manager for Tracky USA, uh, which is also based here in Orlando. And I've been with them for over 13 years. I'm an avid traveler. Um, I love wake surfing, wakeboarding, outdoor activities. Um, and ultimately, I want to be able to move to the water. And I'm helping to be able to use this um, as part of the, the uh, catalyst to get me on to uh, the next phase of my life, as I've just recently been engaged. Um, ultimately, to match the, the round surrounding homes, we see the, a familiar home that's uh, right across the street from me. This lot is on, uh, this house was built on half the size of my lot. Um, and it gave me the idea and the confidence to know that this is what the market wants. So this house was built uh, and it's consistent with other homes on Hunter Avenue uh, that have been previously shown. Um, so yeah, 18 to, in 2018, I did do a full interior redesign, including a new roof, new windows. So my house is up to date. The house is, is it's not a shack that I'm trying to get out of and maximize the profit 
I just want more space to grow as my family continues to grow. Some facts that are about, about the neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, it was 140 recipients that received it. I just focused on Hunter and Venetian. Um, there were 49 total homes. Uh, 17 of those homes had width, lot width of 50 feet. 16 of those homes had lots of 75 feet. And 12 homes had lots of over 100 feet, with the remaining 8% falling between that 60 and 80%. So my request to split my 100-foot wide lot to 250 lots is not inconsistent with the neighboring homes. My lot also touches six individual lots. Four of those lots are 50-width homes. Uh, the fifth lot is a 60-width home, and then the sixth lot itself has actually been rezoned as an R1. So everything that basically touches my lot is consistent with the rezoning request. Um, <clears throat> there's also three properties in the immediate area that have separate buildings, separate structures on their existing property. One of them was at Airbnb, which is actually on a smaller lot than mine. So it has two homes on a small area. So again, splitting my lot to put up two homes consistent with the overall neighborhood. Um, and as, as it was mentioned, it was originally designed as a 1010 and 1012, and then combined in 1926. FEMA defines flooded zone areas that are inundated uh, by a flood event, having 1% chance of being equal or exceeded in any given year. That was Gail's main focus, is that she was asking for the denial of the rezoning, not because it's inconsistent with the plan, but because she's concerned about potential flooding. There was no factual information that there's true flooding. There was standing water, pictures of standing water, but this was not uh, extreme, excessive damage flooding that I saw. Um, I, I have recalled seeing standing water um, in the 10 years I've been there. Um, I can recall Hurricane Irma having standing water in the backyard, Hurricane Ian, Ian last year, and then a stall, uh, stalled out front that hit in October because it hit on a Wednesday and I had a Halloween party on Saturday. And <clears throat> the standing water was not going to be great from a backyard party. But it was gone by Saturday, and that's one of the focuses that wasn't mentioned about this standing water, is that it does remit, it does disperse quickly. And there are not, we're not wading through waist high water for weeks on end. It's ankle high water that's lasting one or two days. Um, and then last year too, we had uh, the wettest record on fall for Orlando at 28.23 inches, um, which is the only reason we're here today. There's been a rezoning request for uh, the lot that touches mine to R1. There was no opposition to that. There was a rezoning request for the um, office building at the end of our uh, street. There was no op opposition to that. Both of those were prior to last year. Um, as she mentioned, part of the, her Gail's uh, part of the reason Gail wanted to come in and appeal this is that she saw that neighboring home on Hunter had that filled it dirt added in. Um, she called in a complaint to the commission, uh, had county inspectors come out, everything complied with the standards that were in place. And the suggestion was made to her to actually consider regrading her property. <clears throat> so reasons to approve, while I do not personally have any plans to develop this property, I'm certain whatever is approved or whatever is done, it'll be done within the rules and regulations already set in place by this board and other and others. Um, a single story home could be built in my place without the input of the community. If my house was to be torn down, there could be no input. And then I could cover the same surface area as two homes. <clears throat> and while I can appreciate the desire to want to move to a county managed sewer system, I should not be adversely impacted for making the best financial decision for my property that's not only for me, but for the county to allow for it to go back and have an, uh, more tax revenue with an additional house. And with that, I'll yield re re my remaining time. All right. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Davidson. If you will stand by for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? There are no speakers for this item, Mayor. All right. Um, with that... Um, I'll go back to the uh, appellant. Any, now that you've heard uh, the applicant, any re additional rebuttal comments that you might have? You would need to go to the mic.
I, um, my, my main thing is, is the flooding. I've been there a lot longer than Brian. I know maybe he doesn't have water standing in his yard for a long time, but I do because it all drains down. It comes through my backyard and through my front yard. We're all on septic over there. There's, there's times that it, it makes it difficult to use your plumbing when it's flooded like that. And it may only be, you know, it's not like there's a foot of water there, but it, it, the, the ground is saturated and it takes it a while for it to go somewhere. So that's not a quality of a life that you really want. And I think a lot of the problem is our, 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 our drainage system there is not adequate. <coughs> it's, it's out of date and it's, it's faulty and we're just not getting, you know, we're, they're gonna start building all these larger homes there. All they're doing is just making mine more and more susceptible to water intrusion. From, from putting new places. I don't even know where they would put the septic tanks if they split that lot. Half of his lot is a raised septic tank in the back. If they do another house beside that, is it gonna be two? And then I got three in a row. That's, you know, it's just, they're, they're you know, this much higher than everybody else's property line. So, and then I've got my neighbor on the other side of me, they've got a raised septic tank in the front yard. So I'm kind of like locked in between here. And that's what my concern is. I mean, I really, my house is a really old house. The only thing that saved me from any water intrusion in my house is that it's a raised foundation with a crawl space underneath. And that's the only thing that's protected my home from any kind of significant water damage. But I just think, and then there's other people in that community that are affected by this water runoff. So it's, it, I don't feel like it's, it's, there, we've got to try to do something to improve the new construction and then just instead of just slamming something in there on the entire piece of property that takes up the whole property where there's nowhere for that water to go except for my for my yard or somebody else's so that's what I what I feel about that all right uh, thank you for your comments um, any rebuttal comments by the applicant Um, I, I just did want to reinforce that her main focus is the flooding, not the rezoning for my property. My property shouldn't be held up to a potential flooding incident. Uh, she wants the, the county to come in and spend the money <laughs> to put a sewer system in. I'm ultimately trying to save the or add more revenue into the county following the, the current policies and processes that are already in place. Okay, is it your desire, did I understand you to say that your goal is to sell the property? That's correct, yes. Okay. All right, thank so, you. So if, if somebody could completely buy the property and save the house for itself <laughs> as it is, or they could put two small homes, it's up to them. It's their free, it'll be their free will. But, yes, inherently to maximize the property, it'll probably be larger homes, but there's no saying what, what could happen with it. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to close the public hearing at this time, and um, the district commission is Commissioner Moore. Uh, Commissioner Wilson has indicated a desire to speak, so Commissioner Moore, I will come to you after that. This may be more for staff. It looked like it was a tight vote at, um, at the zoning commission hearing. What was the, it looked like there was a motion for denial, and what was the sort of the debate there on how that was evaluated? So it, as is common at the Planning and Zoning Commission level, um, the, the majority of the debate was regarding the septic tanks. Um, but we do have um, a representative from EPD here. Um, so there is a new map, uh, a B map, that indicates that this property, despite what it says in the staff report stating that this would not be required to do advanced septic, there is a new B map um, that was approved in July, and this property would uh, have to do advanced septic. Okay. And then my second part of my question is for, I think, maybe in staff engineering staff again sorry but the uh, understanding a little better about we a lot of times in my district i don't see these smaller lot splits we see the bigger evaluations that do have to go through um you know the formula for where they're going to retain their water so there's not water coming off site what happens in smaller um obviously this is going to be a large potentially there's a potential for there being something larger on this lot if it's split and there's two things 
but it's not a PD, right? So it's not being evaluated like a development plan. And I just wondered what the evaluation was. Well, what, what would uh, happen, Commissioner, is that uh, a new plan would come in. Uh, if they were looking at uh, two separate lots with two separate structures, uh, they would have to provide a um, grading plan uh, as part of their building plan submittal. Uh, that grading plan would have to show that they are collecting their water internally, and then uh, as they showed that one larger um, house down the street, you could sort of see that there was um, grading that goes down to the property line, and then that property line would have to grade to the street to go into the roadside swales. Uh, one of the challenges with roadside swales is that you know they require additional maintenance. Uh, sometimes they hold water for a while, um, a day or two, uh, and then they usually draw down uh, as part of a, a natural course of, of events. Um, so they would need to do a uh, include in their site plan a lot grading plan that shows how they're taking care of their stormwater. Uh, along with that, then they would need to identify on that same uh, grading plan where they would put their uh, septic system, and then they would have to meet separation criteria. If there happened to be drinking water, uh, I don't believe there is. It looks like this is on, on city water or county water. So um, there's um, uh, still the, the, the challenge with uh, older lots and regrading and having existing septic raised septic tanks in the back that you have challenges bringing water to the front. Likewise, if you're putting your septic system in the back, um, then you still have to bring your water to the front. Um, and some of the older lots uh, weren't necessarily graded. Uh, in the best of fashion, so then you have challenges trying to trying to get those waters to come to the front. But the water should come to the side, and then grade to the front of the lot. Okay, so in just you know, in an effort to understand what would be next steps, um, should should this go through, and there's two lots there, there would be a plan submitted as part of whatever comes next, and that would be scrutinized for those types of gradations. And what, if anything, and I know this doesn't have to do with the rezoning, so I apologize, but what, if anything, can a resident do now in a circumstance like this where the permeable surface does change when mm -hmm. you get these you know, larger homes and larger home sites and clearly they've been graded up right. as a requirement as our county has realized the need to to potentially have that slope a little bit more um, so some of the challenges that you have with the newer development or, or replacement of uh, older homes on uh, with newer homes again is uh, was the original lot graded properly uh, in many instances some of these lots grade to the back and then there's no place for that water to go. Uh, cur currently, um, it seems like that is part of the scenario that has come up here. I saw some, you know, hand cut ditches, if you will, down yeah. down someone's side lot, and that tells me that that lot was not graded properly when it was done. It's an older lot, uh, unfortunately, and and that's a, a way to resolve that issue is you come in and cut yourself a, a little a little ditch to have your rear lot drain. Um, likewise, elevated septic tank or elevated drain fields. Um, that's an indicator of high groundwater. That's that's you know also a challenge with stormwater as well. Okay, thank you. So pursuant to that, uh, Ms. Vanderwood was. Um, I am a little concerned about you know if the lot is sold and it is uh, divided, uh, the potential impact on Ms. Vanderwood if that happens or the other surrounding neighbors. So I know Ms. Vanderwood uh, kind of made some suggestions about something that some conditions maybe that would uh, perhaps protect her if uh, the applicant in this case, Mr. Davidson, has indicated his intent is to sell the lot. He's not going to be there. Uh, so in terms of being a good neighbor, how do we protect Ms. Vanderwood and her neighbors going forward if, if we allow the lot split to, to occur now. And so um, I'm hearing you say that uh, if there was some type of requirement for a lot grading plan, uh, I know Ms. Vanderwood uh, indicated um, uh, her words, you know, maybe require some type of stormwater management plan, rain gardens, or uh, restrictions on the number of stories uh, restricted to one story. Um, you know, redevelopment plan, I think, for whatever will be built re if this house is torn down. I, I'm paraphrasing some of what she said, but she's nodding yes. Uh, so are there things that we could say, contingent upon our approval today, uh, those things that could uh, be required if uh, someone purchased a lot and they 
decide to rebuild a single family home or they decide if it's a, a multiple lots to, to build two, uh, how do we protect the people who are there now? What are, what are those things that we can make as a requirement of the going forward? John, well, uh, Mayor, if I could just um, remind the board, this is a, a traditional rezoning, um, so we do have the ability to put restrictions on it. Um, those are a little bit different. The county Attorney's Office might be able to clarify the difference between restrictions and conditions um, that would be more, co you would more commonly think of those associated with the planned development or something that's more of a negotiated uh, zoning. This is, again, straight zoning with um, the ability to place reasonable restrictions on a property. So that may not answer your question exactly, but it does uh, a little bit somewhat constrain or restrict the abil board's ability to consider um, two, two, two significant, uh, you know, changes. But yeah, just to uh, follow up on uh, John's comments uh, with respect to a rezoning, the board does have the authority to place restrictions on a rezoning request, uh, and, and those restrictions can take a number of different forms. But um, <clears throat> So there is that ability of the board to place restrictions, and uh, you know, perhaps if the, if the board is thinking that way, that's something that may be uh, necessitated, maybe a postponement or continuance. So okay. that they should uh, be discussed. I, I, I think uh, that that may be in order because clearly there's already some level of flooding occurring there, and uh, with a lot split potentially without some kind of restrictions, that's going to get worse for somebody in that neighborhood uh, if it's not done right. And so I, I, I hear Ms. Vanderwood's appeal as she's saying, I'm not opposed to him doing what he needs to do if he wants to sell or something else comes in, but I want you all, <clears throat> county commissioners, to, to, to protect me <laughs> and my neighbors because... Mr. Davidson's going to be gone. It won't become. It won't be his his problem at that point. And so, uh, if uh, Commissioner Moore will go back to you, perhaps if we can, you know, come up with some reasonable restrictions that gives her some comfort, or uh, them, those in the neighborhood, some some comfort. And you know, I, I would be more comfortable knowing kind of that we. Did I do diligence there, and it may require this to be continued to uh, some date in the future? Uh, Mayor, actually, I was thinking that earlier because I didn't have a, a, a meeting with either one of them, and they were so they presented themselves so well. But I did have a couple of questions um, for for Gail before I'll make a motion, just so it'll help us with our research. If you could come up, I just have a couple of questions. Where you're coming up, the first one is. Um, I'm curious who provides your water service. Are you in Orange County Utilities or Orange or, or City of Orlando? Uh, it's, uh, or, um, the, it's Orange uh, OUC. Orange uh, says Orlando. So yeah. So you mentioned septic to sewer. That puts us in a really difficult position that we can't convert you to, to sewer because you're in that their service area. Okay. So that being an option for us is difficult, okay. just so you know off the, the back, because we're dealing with this up and up towards Wakaiba. All right, then when you talked about the standing water, how many days, I want to hear that again, how, how long do you see this water in well, general rains, heavy rains, summer rains? Yeah, this, this past year was, uh, was a hard, that we didn't get any rain for the most part, but there's been years that if it rains every day we get a torrential downpour and it just pours for <coughs> you know five or ten minutes and then we get an inch of rain every day I mean it's it's gonna stand there it'll drain out but the next day you've got the same thing okay so, and then what happened during the the hurricanes as I'm thinking about this money that we have for some mitigation potentially um, from Ian what happened during Ian Ian which one was, that? This was uh, about a that, year ago about a year about ago a year November ago. Yeah, yeah, year ago November. Yeah, they, it's it's all it's gonna it's gonna be that way. I mean, the one but what happened? Anybody houses flood? Did the road flood? Yes. Or is it just standing water? So a lot of it's standing water, and and it, a lot of it is in the um, in the ditch. I call it my moat when it's full of water because it's it's just it'll be constantly full of water. I mean, you'll see tadpoles and all kinds of stuff in there. I mean, it stays for a while when you have a lot of rain. 
Okay. Well, I'd like to make a motion to continue so we can um, have Public Works research this to see if there's a, a potential for you getting any grant money from some of those federal dollars. But we need a little more time. I wish you'd come to see me. Maybe I could have had that all answered before today. But with that, um, yeah. Board, I'd like to make okay. a motion we, to continue. We do have to continue to a date certain. A time, a date certain. Uh, uh, surely. Commission, what commission. does it look like? Give us at least a month no. because we've got to well, do some uh, research. A month from now approximately will be November the November 28th board meeting, and then after that I think it's a December 12th. Those are the two. Can we take December 12th? I just want to have enough time to do all this research. <laughs> and I appreciate it. This is the first time I've ever had to do this, and I appreciate everybody working with me and understanding what we're, what we're dealing with over you, there. You did an awesome job presenting. And, and um, I didn't know this is where we'd end up, but that's why we have public hearings. I, thank you so much. Second I appreciate Wilson. it. All right. So the motion is to continue to December 12th in the afternoon. Uh, is there a second? Second. Wilson. Second. Uh, Commissioner Wilson. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes, and it is unanimous. All right, it's my understanding with E7, uh, that item has been withdrawn, so there's no action that we need to take today on E7. Uh, so we'll move to E8, uh, and we'll open the public hearing on, on this item, uh, correction F8. Uh, here, Mr. Sorison, we're going to ask you to uh, frame this item for us. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this next request is a rezoning to go from A2 to R2 restricted. This is a property located in District 3. It's a property that measures 8.89 .89 gross acres. The original request was to do 80 townhome units, which would be age restricted. Uh, the applicant has since reduced that to 50 dwelling units, and instead of townhomes, they would be uh, duplexes, triplexes, and or quadruplexes, and they would still be age restricted. Again, we're in District 3. The future land use is currently low medium density residential, which does allow consideration of up to 10 units per acre. The zoning is currently A2. The proposed zoning would be R2 restricted. This is an aerial of the subject property showing it on the north side of 4th Street, west of Boggy Creek Road. 412 public hearing notices were sent to an area extending beyond 500 feet from the subject parcel. To date, we have received 20 responses in opposition and one response in support of the request. Two community meetings were held for this request. At the first community meeting, the request was presented as 80 townhome units and 28 residents were in attendance expressing concern for incompatibility, traffic, flooding, and crime. At the second community meeting, the request was presented as a reduced development program of 50 units consisting of duplexes, triplexes, and or quadruplexes. 16 residents were in attendance expressing concern for access, traffic, and incompatibility. As a result of the second community meeting, there are four new proposed restrictions which would limit development to 50 units, no more than two stories in height, consisting of single-family detached units, duplexes, triplexes, and or quadruplexes and requiring a community meeting at the time of preliminary subdivision plan review in order to review the proposed site development standards, including landscape buffers along Hohenstein Avenue and 4th Street. At the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there were two speakers who spoke in support of the request and five speakers who spoke in opposition. The action requested is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the requested R2 restricted zoning subject to five restrictions, and staff is available for any questions. All right, uh, with that, um, do we have the applicant on this item present? And if so, would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Good evening, uh, Asif Khan. I'm a resident of Kissimmee, 2943 Connor Lane. Well, we had a community meeting and we had a BCC last time also, and it was held by the Commissioner Reeve. Uh, we had a detailed uh, community meeting, and we are uh, at an understanding that we'd be uh, complying to these uh, four restrictions. And uh, if anybody has any questions or objections, I'm, I'm willing to answer. All right, then stand by. Uh, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? The uh, only speaker card I have, I believe, is from Mr. Khan. That's me. Yeah, so okay. that's the only card I have. Okay, so we don't have any 
uh, members of the public present on that item. So then we'll close the public hearing and we'll go to the district commissioner, Commissioner Uribe, for a potential motion. Yeah, um, I do want to state for the record for my colleagues, um, the first meeting I couldn't attend because I was double booked at two community meetings and there was clearly a lot of um, constituents who were against this project. Um, I worked with the applicant. We went back and went in front of the community this time I went. And we were able to explain a lot more details. And we were able to get concerns because this is an area surrounded by single-family homes and they were concerned about the compatibility and traffic. I do have, um, Joe, I do have a concern. Um, if you could pull up the, the map with the lots. Okay, so one concern, and um, I, Mr. Khan, I did go and really review this. Hohenstein Avenue is not set up to county standard. So when you drive that road, you can't get two cars in at the same time. Actually, I, I rode it with the county um, to, to see this because currently this, this, uh, this wooded area, and I know that you guys have cleaned it up tremendously. We can look through it now, so great job on that. But there's a lot of residentials on the east side of Hohenstein. And Mr. Sorensen did confirm at the community meeting we haven't gotten the transportation study part of it. But I see a, a significant issue if we have to get access to Hohenstein entry and access. And so what we're doing is we're hoping that access will be able to come through 4th Street. Is there any way we can set that in the record? Because... Hohen's sign is not wide enough for two vehicles. Correct. And it, it is a county road, but it's one of those old Taft mm -hmm. roads where every house is very different. So I just want that set on the record because it'll be a nightmare. And I think you agree even for the people who will live there yes. if we have to come in from Hohen's sign. Is there an opportunity to come in from Pine at the north end? Oh, Pine dead ends. It's county owned some of that right away. Um, it's an interesting back area because I don't want to delay this case, okay? So I, no, I, do, I understand. But, I we do have, want to, but we have some significant transportation issues here because the roads aren't up to the standard that we use now. And so you're literally, you know, with the exception of Sage Creek, that is a pre-developed area done. But when you look at everything surrounding mm -hmm. this lot, Right. It is very outdated. Like, it would never set to the standard now if we developed. And so I can see, I actually, like I said, rode with the county. We had a pool to the side when there was a car coming towards us mm -hmm. so we could be on it. And the, the folks who live on Hohenstein, their concern is, are we now going to become a traffic thoroughway because it's already tough? Right. And so, and I don't know how much, I know it ends up being a traffic study and all that. But we almost got there. That was the only thing because you guys complied. We were able to get the duplexes to look compatible to homes. I mean, we really worked on this a lot, and and I'm very very worried. It'll it'll be very. It won't be good for this no, community. I, I, certainly, if the uh, the applicant is coming in off of Fourth Street, uh, you know. Yeah, that's the main thoroughfare. That, that's that's more of a um, yes, a and, thoroughfare. And I don't know if there's an option of having um, an entryway of maybe, you know, a lane, a lane in or something, because the bad thing about 4th Street, it's a cut through from Boggy Creek in the airport, so it's tons of semi-trucks. I mean, this is not the, you know, the safest road in Orange County right now. And, you know, people are coming in from the airport and going to Central Florida Parkway. So just, I, I just have concerns about that and, and how the access and, and his is yours going to be gated with security. Yes. So man gate. Okay, <clears throat> I'm for the project and all that. I really want to, you know, go further into those details of access and and how we'll do that because we can end up potentially having some concerns. So, at Joe, are you prepared to make that decision today about the access point? Well, there's mayor. There's really two places, right? <laughs> it's Fourth yeah. Street or Pine. Um, so I, I am comfortable with uh, with uh, having a commitment from the applicant that they would utilize an access off of 4th Street and then as they come in with their development plan uh, or their next steps and if they are looking at having uh, 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 gates then of course they would have to have uh, spacing off of 4th Street to allow for um, access and people to turn around and, and all of that. 
Um, so that would have to be part of the plan as it comes forward. Um, I couldn't actually, you know, and, do, much, and, do much more than say that, you know, access off of 4th Street seems to be appropriate. Um, you know, and, not utilizing Hohenstein Avenue, if that's inadequate, uh, there would have to be either some Pine additional could be an e option. either additional right of way or uh, some other improvements to Hohenstein as, if that was going to be utilized as the main access point. Um, I think Pine could be a, an equitable yes. option if you came from the west. Yes, that's be what we uh, right. uh, that's what we suggested, and that's what we presented over there. Uh, we wanted to we intend to use Fourth and Pine both and Holstein. Uh, once we get to the traffic study and sit down with the county engineers and our, our own uh, civil engineers, uh, there's, uh, there's I, I believe, uh, the houses which we would be building, they'd be, their backside would be towards Holstein. So the setbacks, I believe, are around 25 feet. So if we uh, give away another 5 feet, that would make it 30 feet. So if we be able to get something on the other side also, so I think there should be enough. Uh, uh, but we don't intend to use Holstein as main entry and exit way, but uh, when it comes to that, you know, already there'd the be a setback scene. of around 25 feet. Yeah, just um, Hohenstein um, also is would need a whole lot more work than, you know, so I don't want to get the county to commit to that, but I would be open to Pine and Forth right. as, as those options because Hohenstein, I don't think you want to be responsible. He doesn't want to be responsible for, for what Hohenstein would be if we had to get it up to the standard. Well, yeah, it sounds like there'd be a significant right of dedication as well, yes. which would be a, a large impact to the applicant. Correct, because there's no sidewalk, there's, right. there's nothing yet. Okay, um, but great working on getting this, and Jason and the team who got us there um, that community night. So I, I do want to set for the record that the preference is the access through Pine and fourth street and with the conditions that are set and i would uh, like to file a motion for approval with the conditions set forth second more all right so we have a motion and a second um and uh, just to be clear we're not talking about access from hornstein at all it's just fourth and pine fourth and pine yes fourth and pine yeah all right and i'm sorry do we need to add that do, do we well, need that's to, what you said. Yeah. I just no, want I just him to for understand. Joel. Okay. Yeah. Well, we just talked about placing a restriction on a zoning, rezoning, so we could add that as a, a condition. There, there were already, there were already um, five conditions up there? Yeah, we'd, it, Four, and that wasn't five. on there. Yeah, so that was not we, on there. No, so so if we could add? A sixth condition. Would, of no access from Hohenstein, but Hohenstein. from Pine and Fourth. Yeah, access to and from would be? Uh, from Pine and Fourth Street. Pine, Pine and Fourth Street. Street. Yes. Pine and Fourth Street. We have. We are in. Okay. We agree to that, okay. sir. Perfect. Okay. Okay. All right. So, sure so that, that, that is the understanding. Yes. Yes. So file for a motion for approval with the set five conditions, adding the sixth condition that access to the property or to the development would be from Pine Street and Fourth Street, restricted from Hohenstein. Yes, okay. agreed. Okay. All right, so that's clear. Uh, is there a second? Second, uh, Commissioner Wilson. No, uh, more. Uh, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, Commissioner Moore is the seconder on the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion passes and it is unanimous. All right, we'll move Thank to the next item on our agenda, and this is item G. Nine for this afternoon. I'm going to open the public hearing, and um, our public works director, Mr. Conkle, is going to frame that item. With that, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Public hearing uh, G9 is the Selnick PD Selnick Preliminary Subdivision Plan. The subject property is located in Horizon West Bridgewater Village on the west side of Winter Garden Vineland Road, across from the Windermere High School. The request is to subdivide 13.95 developable acres for 110 single-family residential lots consisting of 93 townhome units and 17 single-family detached units. The request also includes a Chapter 34 waiver to allow for Utility Track U1 to have a six-foot wide access to a paved dedicated street in lieu of 20 feet and to allow lots 18 through 47 and 73 through 90 to front green spaces and have access through an alley track. 
The property is designated townhome district on the Horizon West land use map with the village of, within the village of Bridgewater and is zoned PD consistent with the Horizon West regulations. The aerial shows uh, the area developed with single family subdivisions to the south and uh, north and west as well as the Windermere High School uh, across the street to the east. Here we have the uh, PSP showing the proposed lots and track. You can see the site layout was worked around the large existing tree towards the center of the property and it's circled in green uh, and uh, the uh, existing tree to remain was a condition on the PD land use plan. The recommended action is to make a finding of consistency with the comprehensive plan and approve the Selnick PD, Selnick PSP, subject to the conditions listed under the DRC recommendation in the staff report. Mayor and commissioners have been briefed on this request. This case is in District 1 and staff is available for questions. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Uh, with that, is the applicant on this item present? Would you like to come forward and offer any comments? Uh, good evening, Mayor, commissioners. Mm -hmm. uh, John Prowl with BHB uh, 225 East Robinson Suite uh, 300 Orlando, Florida. Um, we're just here, uh, obviously, uh, in support of the, the recommendation for approval. Um, I want to thank staff, thank DRC staff, thank the commissioner Wilson and the community. We worked closely with them to, to really retool the, uh, the site plan during the community meeting process um, through the rezoning process where we kind of established the densities and the standards. Um, but, but to save the tree, to save, uh, to really work on the, the perimeter buffers, the, the things that all kind of got baked into the plan. So here we are with the PSP for site plan approval. Um, you know, that is. Uh, consistent with that zoning that we got approved and so we're here to answer any questions that you might have All right, uh, stand by for a moment uh, Do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on the side? Yes, mayor. I have two speakers uh, Luis uh, Tavaltz and Chris Adams And just for those who are uh, remain in the audience as our speakers get ready to come forward uh, I 11 this afternoon in G6 we are going to continue so I'll open it up but we will not be taking any specific action on that that is the uh, the dangerous dog proceedings uh, there's a issue with one of the items so uh, if anyone was waiting around for that that is going to be continued uh, so okay so with that uh, Okay, uh, I just, uh, when are we going to continue November, that? November 28th. Man. November 28th. November 28th. So, uh, sorry, I was supposed to mention that earlier. Uh, okay, but so I just didn't want you to kind of keep waiting around for that item. Sorry. sorry. All right, all right, sorry. Okay, all right, so going back to this item um, with... Uh, that uh, members of the public, we had two people who wanted to be heard on this item. Please uh, uh, come forward and state your name and address for the record, please. You'll have two minutes. Hello again. It's uh, Lou Tavares again, 13527 Lake Kaywood Drive, uh, where the community that's 200 feet away from the now approved stadium, and now we are talking about over 100 new houses going 300 feet behind us. Um, Again, not here necessarily to oppose that, but would, would love the mayor and the commission's help in terms of traffic and safety. Um, been trying to meet with zoning on this for two months unsuccessfully. Um, we have on a daily basis cars doing U-turns uh, in our entryway during drop-offs during school. Uh, now we're going to have that on game nights. We're adding 200, probably 200, 250 new cars to the road to this situation. Um, we're, we're looking for details of Orange County sheriffs to potentially on random days or random nights monitor the situation, help emergency vehicles get through both to the games and to our neighborhood if we ever needed it, uh, help us get in and out of our neighborhood. Um, also exploring, which is, is been discussed now for 10 years, potentially a back exit from our neighborhood since all of these exemptions have developed around us. Um, and there's Orange County Park behind there, and we're, we're meeting with them. I'm working with somebody in parks on that and whether there's a potential there. But just want to stress to the, the commission that there's there's been a ton of development around our neighborhood. When I moved there, it was cows and orange groves, and now it's you know four-lane highway, school, stadium, shopping plaza. 
and now 110 new townhomes behind us and really hope that maybe you can instruct staff to take us seriously and please listen to our concerns. Thank you. All right. Uh, uh, thank you for your, your comments. And um, there is a problem there around the school, even with the GPS. It'll take you and have you do the, the U-turn. Uh, so I don't know how we fix that, but I know that um, what he's saying is, is, is a reality. It does happen uh, there, so we just need to kind of take a look at the whole traffic pattern. But there's something going on with, uh, with the technology there that uh, if you put that address into your GPS, it, it, it has everybody doing that U-turn. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Chris Adams. Uh, my address is 5615 Westlake Butler Road in Windermere, Florida. Um, I'm not, uh, my objection to this is that the, the, the land really can't support the amount of developments that's happened on it. And they're asking for a six foot distance between houses. That's this far. And so when it rains um, in that area, I've lived there for 25 years, and as the development has increased, we have regular flooding on the roads out there in, in that district, in that part of the town. And this location here is in a valley. So right in front of the school is a valley, and there is drainage there, but uh, I, I imagine it would be overwhelmed pretty regularly because you're going to basically pave over a lot of what's already there. Uh, and what's happened in our area, I mean, when I moved here in 1997, uh, it was all rural sediment, so it was all supposed to be one house per acre. And that has just, and then just bit by bit, we keep using previous exceptions to allow new things. It's like, oh, well, we have a school. Well, now we need to have townhouses to fill the school. And then now our school's overburdened, so now we need another school to fill the townhouses. It's like, oh, of course, we have to do that. But because of the, the way the land is, it's, you're stuck because if you zoom the map out a little bit, there's a big lakes. So if you're going to the east from that location, you, there's only one way to go, through Chase Road or through downtown Windermere. And so you're adding more traffic to get from that side of water to the other side of water with no bridge and no you know, next level transportation or anything. So it just increases the whole traffic pattern there. And it, that's 535 is bounded that road there is bounded on both sides by water or neighborhoods. And so when, when there is a traffic accident and there are occasionally traffic accidents, you can be stuck on that road for two hours, nothing, nowhere to go, and emergency vehicles as well. And they, there's no safe travel on the median, and there's no safe travel on the sides either because it's all away. And we have, I, I don't live directly across, I live you know a mile-ish away by the crow flies. Uh, there's other development near me. and. For most of the summer, there's standing water on the road. And there will be here, too, because there's just not enough space uh, with, the, with the amount of density that they want to build. There's just not enough space for the water to perk down. And the water, like today, it was, it's like a field, open field. So it's like a big sponge, and the water comes down. It just goes straight down into the ground. When you concentrate everything, and if you stand, you know, anybody that's lived here any amount of time in the summer, you know that if you stand between two roofs, six feet, you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water pouring on you every second. And so it's just the water is going to, and by the time you build it and the developers move on, it's too late and it's damaged like kind of forever. So I wish you'd uh, reconsider. I'm not sure how much of this is just a done deal because it's already been zoned, but at least the part that they're asking for to build the houses six feet apart instead of 20 feet apart, at least not do that. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you for your comments. Do we have any other members of the public who wish to be heard on this item? I have no other speaker cards, Mayor. All right, we'll close the public hearing on this item. Well, unless the applicant has any rebuttal comments. Uh, yes, sir, Mayor. Uh, just real quick, um, some of those items sound like, you know, maybe working with the county on, on some of the, the different emergency vehicle things. But um, regarding the project, obviously, we're in the, the village of Bridgewater. It's been uh, master plan for the townhome district for, for village uses. All of our standards are the same as the other townhome districts in, in Horizon West next door. 
um, setbacks, standards like that all got established with the zoning. So I don't think we're really proposing anything different um, than those. And um, obviously the, the site will go through an engineering review with the, with the county as far as the drainage and, and the, the stormwater design, utility design, things like that. So um, if there's any questions on that, we can, can try to help answer those. Yeah, um, I, I hear you. I, I do understand what uh, the uh, the speaker was saying, uh, Mr. Adams. <laughs> it does seem like a lot of units on 13.95 acres, uh, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, we're going to close the public hearing. Then uh, Commissioner Wilson uh, will go to you for a potential motion. Yeah, so I want to thank my residents for being here this late. I know it's it, it is it's tough, and I will tell you that when I first got here, um, I had a meeting. This is back when we were still in um, COVID time, so we were having virtual meetings, and I had residents that reached out, actually like Kaywood Estates residents that reached out because this was um, potentially a developer was, was trying to file an application for an apartment complex here, and at the time it looked like it was going to be, I don't know, potentially five floors, several hundred units, just a multi-unit apartment complex. And so we immediately tried to meet with the, we met with the developer. We did, what, two or three community meetings. And we were at Hamilton Elementary, and we were at Windermere High School, and we had the HOA at Summer Port sit down with them. So we really did, knowing that that's right across the street, and I didn't come up with this plan. This is a Horizon West plan. But we, they do have entitlements. So the, um, where the side where Windermere High School is, is considered Windermere Rural Settlement or, or West Windermere Rural Settlement. You cross the street and that's Horizon West, which is a sector plan, which means that those sector plans have a certain amount of density, maximums and minimums. So my first negotiation with them, they literally said, we, we can't, based on your own code, go below this minimum amount of density. And so we tried really hard to figure out how to come up with something that was a reasonable transition and match the surrounding neighborhood. So facing Lake Haywood Estate, we were you know, pretty set on trying to make sure that those were single family homes. And that's what that ended up being. There is a conservation area buffer around Lake Haywood that, um, and I wanna make sure that we are able to articulate. And here I know that as part of a standard condition of approval, um, that there's no dock permits given out, but can we articulate that, that, that the idea of of um, keeping that conservation easement dock free so that Lake Haywood will have that buffer, um, bake that into a condition of approval today for the PSP? Okay. Um, so that we definitely, there's a condition for no public docks on the, the public spaces that are coming out, but there's, we weren't proposing any restriction on individual lot owners if they want to uh, apply for a dock like all the other lots on the lake, they would be able to do that. That, that was, we haven't restricted that in in the PSV. So like each individual lot owner can go apply for their private dock. It's not a, a public dock. And how many, how many I think homes? we have 13 or 17, sorry, uh, along the lake. Okay, and that's a small lake. So I'm, yeah. I, I'm concerned that knowing yeah. that that's a lot of homes close together on a small lake, that that will create, I think, some pretty damaging impacts to the shoreline. And we were talking today about that loss of shoreline. Um, would the, would you be, open to negotiating a permanent easement, conservation easement there where you've already placed a conservation easement. Yeah, they'll, so there'll be a conservation easement over the water and, and the wetland and the buffer. I, I think it's just- they A can, prohibition on building a dock is what I think I'm gonna ask you. Yeah, I, I, that's something we hadn't contemplated. We, we obviously have restricted the public spaces. There's three public spaces that, that abut the lake that we said no, no public docks, no ramps, Can we add like a, a prohibition of private docks? Yeah. No, I don't think, I think that was part of, we actually talked about it during the community meetings and you've seen that the other lakefront. I, I was there, I don't think yeah. we actually talked about that. I know we did talk about wanting to make sure there was conservation yeah. allotment there, buffer. But I'm, my fear is with a number of single family homes as close together as they are, knowing that under our code, the platforms can be a certain size that you really aren't gonna have any conservation easement if every one of those homes has the ability to build a dock. Well, they have the ability to apply for a dock for a permit to do that, right? Well, understandably, that's what I'm asking for now yeah. in this PSP, and this yeah. is where this is supposed to happen, right? We're talking about the actual plan, and I, and I so appreciate the things that we've yeah. been able to work through on this, but the, the idea of being able to preserve that shoreline, I think is really important, and right now, I, I, I'm frustrated for them too, right? Because I believe that we all have lost so much of our ability 
to recharge that water in that groundwater. And I know I can't take away the entitlements and prevent you from building something there, but I think we have an opportunity to do some really good things and be an example for how we can put new development into existing areas and still preserve shoreline. So I'm asking if we can put a condition of approval for no private docks on that conservation easement. Yeah, I, you know, Dan, maybe you can. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Commissioners. Dan O'Keefe with Shuts and Bowen, 300 South Orange Avenue, Orlando, Florida. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the applicant, and this has been a, a really long process. But what's interesting about this property, this was called the Sharp property, and there was, there was a number of properties owned by the Sharp family throughout Horizon West. This one, even before uh, any development happened in any of Horizon West, the, the SAPs were adopted, and this property was um, identified as a townhome track, and it had to have a minimum density, as the commissioner pointed out, and, and, a, and a maximum density. And the, the first application, you're right, commissioner, it was envisioned to do the, to transition from sort of the high school across the street to multifamily with 350 apartments to then the single family in Summerport uh, surrounding and Lake, Lake Haywood. Um, so, you know, we've gone through with the negotiations. We got the support for from I, the. I was the, with you for every step of that. I just was asking you yes or no question on whether or not you'd be able, to, willing to put that into and, some kind and, of a conservation I'm answering, for future. I'm, I'm answering the question, but but I also for the benefit of, of everybody else that wasn't in all the the community meetings, I wanted to sort of explain the 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 rationale for the answer. So, the 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 uh, plan that you have before you is the reduced plan that that. Uh, we got the community support for and that meets all of the minimum requirements for the, the county code for, for Horizon West and for, for the village of Bridgewater. And because of that, if, if we were to take all those lakefront lots and say, hey, you guys can't build a dock and enjoy the, the access to the lake like everybody else in Orange County can that has riparian rights and lives on, on, a, and, you know, on, a, on a lake that's big enough to run a ski boat on um, that would that would impair the financial ability to have this be a financially feasible project and for for our client and so we've really tried to bend over backwards and and meet the needs and get the the HOA on board and get the community on board and we've had these three things and we've had very very positive public hearings for all the the density and we we're doing the bare minimum density no more and so with that I think we meet all of the criteria for the, the, the code and the consistency as evidenced by the staff recommendation for approval to find it consistent and to approve the PSP. For that, we, we would like to have consideration of the application before it without an additional con, uh, condition. I, I understand that there's, I've been with you for all those meetings, right? And I really appreciate that you've worked with the residents and you've heard them. I, I, and I fundamentally believe that right now, knowing that there, there is a conservation area determination there, that we will have the opportunity to potentially negotiate this down the road. But we have examples all over the county that people do pay for waterfront property where they have a beautiful view and they can go out in their backyard and look over their, their water without impairing or impacting their shoreline because the conservation area starts before they get to it. Oakland Park is a great example. You cannot build on Lake Apopka anymore the, a dock out from Oakland Park. But that, they're having no problem selling their, their houses over there. Right? I'm you not know, sure they want to go in Lake Apopka. No, right but, I'm, but my point, well, so, what do you think got us there, Mr. O'Keefe? <laughs> Uh, what so, do you think got us to Lake Apaka's uh, uh, position right now? Where uh, people so can't be like, you want to go down that road? It's from farming? The <laughs> Commissioner Wilson, I, 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 I want to try to <laughs> keep us moving forward. Uh, Commissioner Uribe, you can, at a moment here, if you want to offer a motion that includes not granted access, you can do that. But let, let me just get all the commissioners in so you can hear everybody's comments. So, uh, Commissioner Uribe. Um, yes, I wanted to ask the applicant. So I, I'm hearing the term conservation area, right? And I'm hearing the term of docks. Now I have the same issue going on Lake Holden where we've these docks, which it's not built yet, would have to be so far out so that they don't impede on the area. I'm trying to understand, can you kind of explain to me the conservation area in relation to your homeowners wanting to, re may want to request a private dock for their private home? Can you? Because I, I hear conservation area and I hear dock, 
Can you? And I only know one example from my lake, my lake Holden. Yeah. But if you could please articulate a little bit more for me. Yeah. John, you want to take that? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think I, if I heard your question right, um, kind of describing what the dock, what the, the end condition would be, right? Yeah. Now. So let's yeah. just say I I move on the lake, mm -hmm. and there and Commissioner Wilson has said there's a conservation area, and then if I want to apply, I guess it would yep. almost be. What are the conditions when there's a conservation area? Because I know it, on Lake Holden, it requires it to go so far out, you know, yeah. things like that. So just curious if well, you could explain that. I think the county has strict, actually, guidelines on what you can do for the dock. So you, you establish the conservation easement over the buffer and over the wetland and over the lake. And that easement lives. You can't disturb. You can't do the, you know, you can't dig and, and fill and, and do, you know, impair or Sorry. impact or anything to the conservation easement. There's signage that we put at the end of the buffer, like you can't go past this point, no disturbance, you know, no land disturbance. Um, the dock permit then allows, you know, a, a, a dock that has a, a specified width limit. You can't, you know, you can't go build a 20 foot dock, you know, wide. I think it's like five or six feet, like walkway that can traverse over top of the, over top of the conservation easement. And I think there's even um, so there's restrictions, basically. There's yeah, I mean, it's part of the permitting process with EPD. How big is a lake? Sorry. I'm not sure how many acres the lake is. I don't know if, there, oh, if we have a picture where it's zoomed out. It's yeah, it's it's a good sized lake. It's 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 really big. Yeah, the dock. It's not a big um, lake. <laughs> okay, and so we're talking how many total homes and how many on lakefront? There's 17, se 17 uh, single family lakefront homes and then 93 townhomes. Okay. Which meets the minimum with the, the and. The, and, and then I see there, um, I guess to the north of the property, those are docks from other single-family homes. Yeah, that's all part of some report also, and they, they, most of them have docks. Um, hey, Commissioner, this is John. Uh, just to hey, your John. point, um, uh, there are sixteen. John, your mic didn't come on okay. quite yet. Uh, Commissioner, to your question, there, there's sixteen lots that are lakefront, and about seven of them have docks yeah. on that area. So the property immediately next door. Okay. Lakefront lots with docks. And those are on a conservation area too. Do I don't we know. know if do we not know? Staff would have that information or not. Okay. But. Okay. All right, uh, Commissioner Moore. Um, I think I just got my answer, but I want to hear it one more time, John. Please. Sure. So, on this lake, there are already docks, or are there not docks, and how many? Uh, Commissioner, there are docks. Um, you can see on the aerial um, off of. Uh, Nagami uh, Drive. Um, there are 16 uh, lots that are platted that all have lake lake, lake access. Um, seven of those have docks, and I think there's even a community dock um, on, on one of the uh, HOA tracks. All uh, right, so then the applicant gave up a community dock, correct? Uh, they have uh, agreed to that you restriction. Gave, and then this this uh, looks like a, a conservation easement or, or wetland on which would be, well, if that's north, I guess that would be the west side. Can you tell me about, is that some area that's being left passive? On the, on the conservation easement? No, no, no. I mean, across from Ancilla Boulevard, there's that green area. I'm wondering what could potentially be there. Is that land for sale or is it conservation? So uh, that is conservation Wetlands. on the northwestern. Yes, the northwestern. The, the, the western area. Yeah, that's all, that's all conservation. And then there's a... Um, a water treatment plant that you see there, the kind of odd shaped building, and then the school board owns a piece next to that. So then will there be the a... potential for any more development on this lake? Maybe that's for staff. I don't think there's that. any potential additional residential development capable on this lake. You do not think so? Correct. All right, thank you. My, um, Commissioner Rubies <clears throat> would like me to ask that again. So the question I have after analyzing and asking you about the western portion, is there poten potential sorry, for any additional development on this lake? No. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, all right, Commissioner Wilson, do you okay, have I'm a sorry, potential? I'm sorry, but can we also circle back just based on some of the conversations that the residents brought forward um, from the last time we spoke, which was a little over a year ago or right around a year ago. Um, what has transpired with traffic engineering, it has gotten worse throughout there in the accidents and just wanting to know sort of what the plan is based on your meetings with our traffic engineering. So as far as uh, uh, traffic, Commissioner Wilson, um, 
we've obviously submitted our, our traffic study. We've actually uh, worked out our traffic agreement for prop share with the county the, the, that's been executed, actually has been negotiated and, and taken through uh, RAC and, and to the board, um, I think either two weeks or four weeks ago. And so um, there will be a $1.2 million prop share payment that, that the applicant will be paying to the county for the, the traffic impacts um, associated with the project. And what does that mean for my residents? <laughs> well, the road agreements that come forward, Commissioner, uh, there's a, a deficiency that's identified and, and as allowed under um, state <coughs> law, they, they can pay into a prop share fund uh, based on the traffic analysis that's done and approved by the county. Uh, that creates uh, a funding source for multiple different types of, of um, enhancements. It doesn't necessarily have to be additional lanes. It can be other capacity improvements or other, other improvements along the roadway. Um, and uh, uh, that means that there's some funding that's dedicated for those segments of roadway that they're impacting. Um, and, and I do recall that there was, I think the Summerport HOA president brought forward some concerns about people cutting through and using kind of a, you know, making a speed cut through there. Yeah. And I know that it looks like from the PSP, from the plan, that there's going to be a couple roundabouts, level roundabout, yes. thank you. But what, um, what does that access point look like now going into Summerport? Yeah, so from, as you, you kind of go north, you have to come in, make it left, and you have a traffic circle, another traffic circle, and then it the road connects into the existing road roadway in Summerport. Um, I think it's like Nectarine Avenue. Um, and it's just going to be a residential that it's going to match the same section that's already out there, a 24 foot road, curb and gutter, you know, landscaped. So it'll just, it'll look, it'll just be a neighborhood kind of local road. Okay. Connection. So hopefully alleviate some of that pressure from the front too, which I know for Lake Haywood is, is that pressure point. Definitely. Um, so I, I am ready to make a motion for approval with the condition of the um, restriction on individual boat docks so we can keep that conservation. I think it speaks to the flooding. I think we need those conservation tracks in order to mitigate flooding. And, you know, knowing that you're not going to negotiate on density, we've already done that, right? We already did our density negotiation. The best I can do at this point is to ask you to do the right thing and keep that conservation easement intact through a prohibition of, of any future development on the, on the conservation easement. Mayor, may I comment um, on, a on a legal issue? Yes. <laughs> so I just, I, I think we, we if, if we object to a condition, I think we're entitled to have our application voted on. And um, we'd like to have the application with the recommendation for staff support, with the HOA support that we've got. We'd like to have the application with the existing conditions voted on without having our application changed to add additional conditions. Uh, Joel, uh, I think Commissioner uh, Wilson is within the rights of the board to, to, when it comes here, to actually change it, add to it. You know, it may not. But we'll ask you from uh, the legal perspective to opine. Well, Mayor, I'm... A little bit unclear myself in terms of this conservation easement, in terms of where all that fits into the picture. Um, and I guess nobody from EPD is here at the present time, but on our dock, boat dock ordinance. But so the, basically, what the commissioner is is making a motion for is to approve it with an additional restriction that the applicant does not not favor or is opposed to. Correct. So if he doesn't want to have that project with that condition, restricting boat docks, then I suppose that the commissioner could consider making a motion to deny the, the, the project. Because you're saying you don't, you, wanna, you don't want to live with that condition? The applicant can't live with that condition? Uh, yeah, I'm saying the applicant cannot live with that condition. And we, we would like a vote. So they're, they're opposed to project with that restriction so uh, I guess your motion would be to, I, okay. to deny the request I mean there's he said he doesn't want to live with that restriction um, I make a motion for denial all right there's a motion to deny is there a second okay 
The motion fails for the lack of a second. I'm going to try another motion. I mean, the only other option is to, if you wanted to continue to have the opportunity to meet with them to have some kind of negotiation, can we, can you can, can do we that. continue? Because I do think the problem also, when we at the PSP stage, we still don't have even a concert. We don't have a, a completed CAI. So I, I agree with you that we don't have a, a full picture here, which means that a continuation would probably be best, if that's okay. You do have an impact from it. And we've been in this process for literally years. I, we, okay, uh, we heard motion. I mean, and, we, and for we, the record, EPD staff is in attendance. Oh, I didn't and, and I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, for the record, EP, EPD staff is in attendance if there are questions regarding the conservation easement. Okay. 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 So, so it, it's okay. All right. So uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and file a motion for approval. Second, Laura. All right. Uh, there's a motion and a second for approval. Any further questions or comments? Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. All right. The motion passes. Four to one. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right. So with with that, uh, we're going to move forward uh, at this time to H10. Uh, we'll open the public hearing on this item. We're going to ask Ms. Lisa uh, Henriquez to come forward, the assistant project director or manager uh, from uh, Housing and Community Development to come forward and frame this item. Uh, this is an administrative item, so uh, with that, we'll, we'll move forward. Good afternoon or good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Alyssa Henriquez. I'm with the Housing and Community Development Division. Um, so today I'll be presenting the resolution for the disposition. Oh, that is. Um, I'll be presenting the resolution for the disposition of county properties that are appropriate for use as affordable housing. So I'll start by giving you some background on the resolution, um, and then I'll provide you information about the resolution itself and the properties being added to that list, and then I'll finally provide you with information on the application process for um, acquiring those properties. So since 2006, the Florida statute has required each county to prepare an inventory list of um, every three years of property in the county that's uh, appropriate for use as affordable housing. So the statute um, requires a number of things. It requires the board to review the list of suitable properties at a public hearing. It allows the board to revise the inventory list at the conclusion of the public hearing. And it requires the board to adopt a resolution like we're doing today with the inventory list of real property in identified as appropriate for use as affordable housing. Um, so most recently, the board adopted resolution 2022M61 in December of last year. Um, and this identified 20 lots identified as appropriate for use as affordable housing. Um, so this resolution, the resolution states that the county's intent is to donate the properties to nonprofit housing organizations um, for the development of permanent affordable housing. It directs the housing division to inform nonprofits of properties and solicit interests, and it also directs staff to negotiate agreements and not with nonprofit developers for board approval. Um, so as the board is uh, probably well aware, in March of 2023, the governor approved state or Senate Bill 102, known as the Live Local Act, um, which amends the statute to require counties to include properties owned by dependent special districts on these inventory lists. So that includes things like the CRAs, Community Redevelopment Agencies, and also Neighborhood Improvement Districts. Um, it also requires counties to post the inventory list on the county's website. It encourages the county to adopt best practices for surplus lots, um, and it also authorizes counties to use properties on the list for affordable housing through long-term land leases. Um, so once the properties are identified on that list, um, the statute gives us different ways of um, disposing of those properties. So uh, the first is using the properties for affordable housing through long-term land leases. It also offers the, um, we could also offer the properties for sale and use those proceeds to purchase land for the development of affordable housing. Um, we could also sell the properties with the restriction, with the requirement of developing affordable housing. We could donate it to a nonprofit housing organization for the development of affordable housing, which is what we do currently. Um, and then we can otherwise make the property available for use as uh, affordable housing for either production or preservation of existing housing. 
So next I'll go over what's um, included in the resolution that we're bringing forth today. So the resolution we're presenting today is very similar to the resolution that you um, heard back in last December of 2022. So this resolution, again, reaffirms the county's commitment to affordable housing. Um, it states the county's intent to donate the properties to nonprofit housing organizations for the construction of housing. It directs the housing division to inform nonprofits of the properties and solicit interest through an RFP, RFA process. Um, and it directs staff to negotiate those agreements with nonprofit developers. And finally, it also includes an inventory list of properties that are appropriate for use as affordable housing. Um, so to prepare this resolution that we're bringing forth today and the associated inventory list of properties, um, we coordinated with each of the county's 20 dependent special districts identified by the state. So again, that's things including the CRAs and the neighborhood improvement districts to identify any real properties appropriate for use as affordable housing. So today we're bringing forth 25 properties on an inventory list, 20 of which are owned by Orange County, um, the Board of County Commissioners, and five are owned by the Orange Blossom Trail CRA. So upon adoption of this resolution and inventory list, local nonprofit housing organizations will be notified of these properties and the county's application process to acquire them. Um, so just a reiteration of the county's commitment to affordable housing. Uh, the housing trust fund that was established by this board in 2020 supports three land banking strategies. So um, that includes active acquisition of properties for housing development, proposals for development of um, county-owned properties, and development of county-owned properties by nonprofit organizations. So this board um, also approved conveyance of 27 county-owned properties um, to six nonprofits back in 2021. So just kind of a status update on those 27 properties. Eight of them have been completed. Um, they're already built with houses on them. One is currently under construction. 14 are in various stages of the development process, and four are pending with um, some other issues that need to be worked out. So just kind of a happy success story here. We have some photos of the completed homes at a recent home buyer, home buyer closing at um, in District 2, completed by the Habitat for Humanity, Seminole County, and Greater Apopka organization. So happy story there. Um, but coming back to the inventory list of properties that we're presenting as part of this resolution, um, I'll give you an overview of the properties being included, including the five properties that are being added um, since the last time you saw this list. So nine of these properties are in District 2, five of them being in South Apopka. Three are in the Lockhart area, and one is in the Rosemont area. There's two properties in District 3, um, both of them being in the Valencia East area. One property in District 5, which is in the University UCF area. There's 13 properties in District 6, including the five that we're adding to the list today, which are owned by the Orange Blossom Trail CRA. Um, there's two of them in Pine Hills, one in Orla Vista, and 10 are in Holden Heights. Um, so next I'll go through the application process of how nonprofit housing organizations can um, acquire these properties for the development of affordable housing. Um, so we'll issue a CRA with the criteria of the, um, the applicants being a certified nonprofit agency, having experience in building affordable housing, um, and we are tentatively expecting the notice of the RFA to be issued in December of this year. Um, so we're looking for nonprofit organizations that will build affordable housing that's owner-occupied. Um, we're looking for a variety of um, different homes, so single family or missing middle. Um, within the price range of 180,000 to 275,000, targeting those low to moderate income home buyers, um, and then we'll also um, they'll also have access to the county's already existing down payment assistance program. So with that, that brings us to the requested action today, which is to adopt and execute the resolution of the Orange County Board of County Commissioners regarding the disposition of county properties that are appropriate for use as affordable housing. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any members of the public present who wish to be heard on this item? No speakers for this item, Mayor. All right, then we'll close the public hearing. We have a question, Commissioner Uribe. Uribe. Um, I couldn't read it on this because it's so tiny, and then you went through it very quickly. Can you let me know the two properties in District 3, please, if you don't mind going back?
Wow, are so you over there? Oh, there he is. All right, so. <laughs> Miles is needed. She had the power the whole time, huh? That's there what you're go. saying, Miles? <laughs> <laughs> I can't see it in here. It's too tiny. Oh. Okay. Well, now I got it. Yeah, District 3. Oh, District 3. Oh. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, hold on. Oh. I think it's 19. Slide 19. All right. I didn't recognize the, I didn't recognize the street, though, so I was trying to see the vicinity. Okay. The so okay. with that, no further questions. I'm going to move the action on this, the requested action. So moved, Uribe. Second, Wilson. No, I'm, oh, second, I moved Uribe. The requested second, action. Uribe. Then. Third, Wilson. Second, 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 second. Commissioner <laughs> Uribe. Yeah. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, motion passes, and it is unanimous. Uh, so on the next item, I-11, uh, we, we pulled uh, G-6 from this morning. Um, it was on the consent uh, agenda item. It was to go with I-11 this afternoon. Uh, I am going to open it up, but there's a problem with, with this item. Uh, so let me just open it up and uh, very quickly, uh, Ms. Summers, uh, if you'll just come forward and just uh, frame the, the item in general. Hi, good afternoon. good afternoon. I do apologize. Um, our topic is still engaged in continued discussion with the county attorney's office, and so we don't feel ready to present it at this point, so we'd like to propose a rescheduling. Okay. Are there any members of the public present who uh, wanted to be heard on this item? There was uh, Michelle DeFloramonte, but I think she left. She, she left, okay. So we don't have any other members of the public present who wish to be heard, so I'm going to close the public hearing at this time. And um, uh, motion, what's the date? The 28th? Mayor, earlier we had talked about November 28th at 2 p.m. for the continuous. November 28th. All right, so the motion is to continue this until November the 28th second. at 2 p.m. We have a second by Commissioner Gomez Cadero. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion passes, and it is unanimous. And, uh, Mayor, this is John again. Uh, just yes. to be clear, uh, the consent agenda item G6 um, that's been pulled, um, we'll just defer that and bring that back at the appropriate time on November okay. 28th. Yes. That is the understanding. Yes. Um, all right. Thank you all. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Ms. Summers. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Pino. Uh, well, <laughs> he waited around patiently. Uh, so with that, um, we don't have any other um, agenda items for this afternoon. And so if there's nothing else, then we stand adjourned.